You know us, we tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. We are legion, we do not forgive, we do not forget, expect us, we are anonymous. Brain in gear, enjoy the day, and look after yourself, have some water, you may end up with a headache. <laughs> Thanks Steve. Thank you Dave. By the way, Stephen is my lead out here when I'm not here. He can syntax and write as good as I can. And the seminar doesn't stop when you leave here. You guys all know how to operate computers. You get home, you can Skype me, you can uh, send me emails, ask me anything you want for as long as you study this stuff. I mean, I've got students that have been with me 15 years. And uh, we talk on a regular basis. And uh, I answer everybody's questions. And I don't care how long, many questions you want to ask me. So the, the we go through three stages in life. Your first stage is you do not know what you do not know. No one was aware of syntax until you saw this program. Once you saw it, you were aware of what you did not know, which it means you didn't know about the math interface on language. For that fact, for 8,500 years, the entire population of the planet Earth in 5,000 languages did not know about the math interface on syntax until 1988 when I broke the code. And then when you know what you know, you become a teacher and stand up here like I do and educate people. And Stephen is in that location now where he can stand up here for 20 hours and put on a 20-hour seminar also. And then there's a lot of things that he, he knows the right things to say, but he hasn't had the 74,000 hours of knowing what the wrong things are to avoid. And it's like uh, you've got 100 landmines on the floor here, and you've got to go from that wall to that wall. How many of them do you get to step on before you get to that wall? In other words, how many mistakes do you get to make? Zero, right. So like he said, I got 73,000 hours of mistakes from, from walking around stepping on landmines and going through the hardships of life but I got a thousand hours of how to do it right. And through process of elimination, like Sherlock Holmes says, when you remove all the things that cannot be, regardless how ridiculous the end result is, that is the fact. And so the, the math is syntax now creates the facts on a mathematical level where when you write a sentence frontwards, it says the same thing when you write it backwards. And we're going we're to start off using the, the math interface to show you how this works and how we broke the code. This one here is. Uh, if you take your math problem, 2 plus 3 equals 5, and you want to check it, well, it's 5 minus 3 equals 2. If you want to multiply, 2 times 3 equals 6, and 6 divided by 3 equals 2. Now this all came about, uh, let's see, well, I'll just use this. Spiral notebooks. Remember, some of you got some with the red line down the side here? Well, the way this code got broke was on April 6th in 1988. Now for three years I worked out math problems and nothing seemed to work. Now one morning, I got up half asleep and I wrote 1 plus 2 equals 3, 3 minus 2 equals 1. On the red line, when I got my coffee, some toast, came back and I said, and I, but when I sat down, it was, it was faced this way and I'm going, oh, that's a graft. So I grafted it. And when I grafted it, I broke the code. So deductive reasoning says that a fact, whether it's frontwards or backwards, is still a fact. Like in a math problem, if we have a 2 here and we've got a 2 here, nothing's changed. 5 here, 5 here, 6, 6, those are whole objects, therefore they become the facts. We gave those the Fs. Then the one thing that appears in front of a fact was an equal sign in a math problem. In a math problem, the equal sign has no value, it does not modify anything. So if it can't modify, and and or are the conjunctions. So we gave that a C. Then you've got, when you took, uh, when you went to school and you studied math, you had the negative, the positive, the negative, the positive, when you did grafting. So any motion from one side to the other resulted in 
in motion. Well, here you've got a plus 3 and a negative 3, so therefore you're going from one side to the other. Same thing in multiplying and dividing. Because the motion constituted the verb. So we, we factored out this, the operation and we gave this a verb. Because the verb does not modify the condition of a fact. It's like this pen here. It's in motion, but it's still a fact. So, and this, the only verb that exists, you have two verbs, is a singular, are is plural, and the verb is thinking. But thinking is a condition of state as a fact. Therefore, the thinking condition of state when in motion is the only word that it both maintains two conditions, a verb and a fact at the same time. Because everything that happens in, uh, in the world is the result of something thinking before it can actually happen. Running is not a verb. Jumping is not a verb. That's a condition of your thinking. Those are conditions of state as an end result called order of operations. So the only thing that was left was plus and minus, multiply and divide. And those we assign to the prepositions because when you write this ends, for the bridge is over the river, and for the river, is under the bridge, The over and the under are opposite prepositions. Both pictures are identical. Now we can take, we can take, and I've been doing this for uh, almost 15 years now. People come to me with Bible passages because every once in, everyone wants to know who God is. Or wants to know what the Bible really says. One third of all the words are missing from the Bible. And the Quran, and Buddhism, and Hinduism. And all the great religions in the world, one third of all the words are missing. And so you can take the whatever is written and then go out and put the correct prepositional phrases in in now time. Remove the negative because you can't perform negative. Remove the illusion and create a fact. Now, a lawyer would write this. Like that. The bridge is over the river. And you were all taught when you were in fifth grade in school, never start a sentence with a prepositional phrase and never end a sentence with a prepositional phrase. Well, if you don't end a sentence with a prepositional phrase, you've got a dangling participle verb as an answer, which means your sentence is incomplete. If you start the sentence without a prepositional phrase, your first two words, bridge is going to become a verb. In this case, it's an adjective. Because you've got, one is an adverb, modifies the adjective, bridge, which modifies the pronoun, is, which now is, uh, no, this one here is a one, two, one, two. No, this one here is one, two, one, two, one, two. Show me a verb bridge and a river bridge. I uh, mean a river verb and a bridge verb. Now, when the government writes their instructions on most of their forms, they don't use adjectives. They only use adverb, verb, adverb, verb, adverb, verb throughout the entire sentence structure. Now, we did an exercise. My daughter was in high school. She was a senior. And uh, they, had a, a, uh, they had to write an essay, 300 words on one sheet of paper. And I told my daughter, I says, would you like to win first place? And she says, well, yeah, it's a $100 savings bond. And 300 children entered the competition. I says, well, because we know the operations of syntax, we're going to write two letters. The first one is going to be an adverb verb, 100, 150 adverbs, 150 verbs. No adjectives, no pronouns, just adverb verb. The second one, we're going to use prepositional phrases, and we're going to write the letter correct in syntax. And then we're going to assign a fictitious name. And when you hand in your paper, you will slip this syntax copy into the pile. 
So at the end of the week, the announcement was made that my daughter Katie had won first place in the competition. Anybody that had even put one adjective in had created a coloring effect rather than a modifying effect. So she got the $100 savings bond. The one that was written with the correct sentence structure communication syntax, the principal got on and said, we have a mental student that got escaped from a mental institution is in the, is in the school and used the name on the quantumized document <laughs> to look for this person. If anybody knew, and only my daughter was the only one that knew what the name meant assigned to the papers. A few weeks later in school, my daughter says to the teacher, when are you going to teach the correct sentence structure communication syntax? The teacher stands up and says, you're suspended. Get out of my class. You get an F for the course. So she goes down to the, the dean and says, I just got kicked out of English class. You know who my dad is? He goes, yeah. Go back to English class and send the teacher down here. So the teacher comes down and gets an ear, uh, earful of the fact that I disqualified all the books from the school when I signed up my daughter to go to that school in the first place. And I paid her tuition in gold, uh, gold eagles, American gold eagles. So it kind of stood out when, when it comes to registration that somebody would pay in gold eagles. <laughs> so uh, she was reinstated in the class and she got an A for English. And the teacher never bothered her again because she knew how to syntax. When she was 12 years old, she took the 38-page insurance forms for Florida for public employees, and she syntaxed the 38 pages and sent it to the Congress of, of the state of Florida. And the insurance company got fired, and the people who wrote it got fired. And that insurance policy was never initiated. In January of 2008, I syntax the mortgage documents and AIG's insurance forms. And I send it back to them, syntax. That's what caused the Great Depression we've got today. Under mail fraud, Title 18, Section 1341, they couldn't issue new mortgages because they were fraudulently conveyed. They knew they'd have a, a storm of, of uh, once this got out to the people, yelling fraud and mail fraud. And the insurance companies couldn't write policies because they didn't have to pay on it. And that's what's created the disruption in the, in the whole world system. This technology, when it was created, uh, disqualified every treaty, trust, and contract worldwide. On March 1st, 1997, we syntaxed the, uh, the trust industry in the Internal Revenue Service through the post office, went out, and they, there was $40 trillion held in trust worldwide. The Postal Service has today seized $33 trillion of that $40 trillion that was held in trust of the 25 million trusts that existed worldwide. Seized. And then the other thing that took place just in August of 2009 was that well, this happened over in uh, Auckland. I did a um, seminar for 90 Maori uh, chiefs. And I explained to them since 1800, the post office has never had the correct sentence structure, communication syntax for any treaty, trust, or contracts anywhere on planet Earth. Well, we had people in the audience that were undercover CIA. Word got back to the post office to this effect. And in September, the United States Postal Service ordered Bern, Switzerland to turn over 47,000 numbered accounts worth $4 trillion, which the United States Postal Service was able to capture and put in the hopper. So this technology has put the, has made the post office about $38 trillion profit. The United States government only correct, collects $500 billion a year in taxes from the 186 million people that pay taxes in the United States. We have a population of 300 million. Can you explain about the post office being able to do that, not the banks or the government? Okay, the post office, who's on a $100 bill? American, Benjamin Franklin. Who's the first postmaster general of the United States? 1775, Benjamin Franklin. What's the decimal point for one? 1.00, 100. During the Civil War, Grant was postmaster general of our, of our country. Lincoln was killed, so therefore he got put on a $50 bill. What's the decimal point for a country divided in one half? 0.50, $50 bill, Grant. Lincoln, or George Washington, 
was a letter carrier. He went on the $1 bill because he was the first president of the international bankruptcy with England. Because he became president as a letter carrier, he was put on the $1 bill. Lincoln, 70 years later, after the first international bankruptcy of 70 years ended in 1859, was the president. He went on the $5 bill because he was postmaster general of Springfield, Illinois. He was also placed on the penny because he was the first of the second international bankruptcy. Add 70 years to that, and you get 1929. Now, in the United States, November 2nd is our presidential elections. So this was the end of our, of our second international bankruptcy. Now, an interbank our first bankruptcy was established on September 17th, uh, 1789. My birthday is September 17th, so it's easy to remember. <laughs> Plus, when you have a, a trust, a trust expires at the end of 45 days if the trustee is no longer part of the trust. So you got a 45-day grace period. If you had 45 days to September 17th, you get November 2nd, which is our presidential election day. Now, in 1929, United States Congress, Senate, Legislature, and Supreme Court voted to end our second bankruptcy and become sovereign, go on the gold standard. So they told England, we're not going to renew. So England, under the five-day rule, had to tell the American pub public that they were going to close all the banks and credit unions because they were operated under the Bankruptcy Act. Subtract five days from November 2nd, you got October 29th, 1929, which throws the entire planet Earth into the 10-year Great Depression because commerce now is disrupted. Add 70 years to that, and you get November 2nd, 1999. United States of America did not elect a president on that day because they had to, they voted to end the bankruptcy and MasterCard controlled 98 cents on a dollar. And MasterCard was established back in uh, 1964. So the private corporations of the, of the convenience of MasterCard captured all the money, but we did it domestically. We can now end the bankruptcy. Now as a result of the March 1st, 1997 code breaking of how to seize the trust. The United States government was able to harvest enough money from the trust industry, which was held in safety deposit boxes and numbered accounts worldwide to pay off our international debt. And by November 2nd, 1999, we had $6 trillion surplus in the United States of America, which made us sovereign and our third bankruptcy ended. We did not elect a president on November 2nd, 1999. The United States government re, uh, said that two thirds of all the states, 38 of the 50, had to recount all their ballots. Now this was just an illusion to keep people watching the ballot counts while the 90 days runs. No law under the Treaty of Versailles, 1906, becomes legal in any federal government and anywhere on planet Earth for 90 days. Add 90 days to November 2nd, and you get February 2nd, 2000, at which time President Bush was appointed the next president of the United States of America Corporation. The democracy of America is dead. It no longer exists. We are a corporation. New Zealand is a corporation. You guys are still in bankruptcy here. You're one of the few countries that are still in bankruptcy. Now, we... Last time I was out here in Australia, we did a little check. Does anyone in this room know when your first money was issued in Australia? 19, uh, 1812. So if you take 1812, I think we know. <laughs> well, the post office. Everybody here has Queen Elizabeth and Queen Victoria on your money, correct? Throughout your history. And your different denominations on your money are the Postmaster Generals of Australia. Your coins have Queen Elizabeth on them. And she is the Postmaster General of Australia. Through the, your international banking treaty, which you're in bankruptcy with the International Monetary Fund through London. Now, London 
you're looking at England, you are not under English rule. You are controlled by the post office. And the post office is the ones that set up camp out here in 1918. So if you do the, if you do the math and you got, uh, excuse me, 18, 1812 and 70, you got 1882 and 70, 1952 and 70. 2022. That's when your bankruptcy ends. Is there any International bankruptcy has been around for 6,500 years. That's 70, 70 years as an international bankruptcy. It was established in, by the pharaohs in 4700 BC by the Masons. I mean, can we find the information about the oh, yeah. bankruptcy for Australia? International bankruptcy, yeah. Where? At the library. Pull up your postal codes. You've got to, you've got to research your post office, your history of money. Talk to coin dealers, people that are professional coin dealers that trade in the currencies, the history of your country. So there are documents in existence. Oh yeah, available. that's how I found it. So what's going to happen in 2022? You guys are going to come out of bankruptcy and you're going to become sovereign. However, you guys can end your bankruptcy. Now I don't know if you were aware of this, but on uh, September, September 2009, your dollar was 73 cents of the U.S. currency. I just paid a dollar three for an Australian dollar at the at the at the airport. You guys are worth more than U.S. currency right now. Wow. So... No, it's a dollar three. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're taking a commission out of it. But the exchange rates, you guys are dead even with the U.S. right now. Our money's going down, your money's going up. Look at how many mines you guys got. Your gold, your silver, your, your molybdenum, your uh, lithium. You're, uh, you guys control 20% of the world's lithium out in the mines out west. Isn't lithium used to benumb the brain? Lithium's for making batteries, lithium diodes. <coughs> and, using, and it's also used, rare earth material is used for uh, uh, the glass on computer screens. I thought it was also used as a depressive so we Well, I'm sure there's... Alternate. I'm talking about a mineral. Use it for making lithium diode batteries for your cell phones, computers, and now 600 million electric cars is what they got targeted. 30 million a year. Can I ask you to go back and explain what you mean by captured, that they captured all this money from the trust? What do you mean by captured? Physical, oh. Physically they took the money out in gold bars or they just changed a few numbers on the screen? No, no. When on March 1st, 1997, I sent text uh, the Boston Trust. There were two million copies of it. Then I did the Panama Trust. There were two million copies of that. When you use the mathematical syntax, the definition of the words are wrong. If the, de if the trust has the words are incorrectly used, then that means that the definition doesn't say what the trust was engineered for in the first place. It means that everyone was illiterate that created the trust, bought the trust, and used the trust. The Internal Revenue Service, going all the way back to when it was created, also couldn't read and write because there wasn't a math interface to prove what the value of every word is. Now, because of this program, you have 68 prepositions and 38 articles. That's 1,800 divided by 2 means every word in the English language has 900 definitions. Yeah. Pen. Pen by itself is a pronoun. If I say the pen, the is an adverb which modifies the verb pen. Modification is change. Change is motion. Motion is action. Action is, pen, is verb. Okay, now if I say of pen, of is normally the preposition and the is the article. Separated, they both become adverbs. So now you have an adverb of pen, or by pen, or with pen, or over pen, under pen, doesn't matter how you do it. If you separate all the prepositions and all the articles, this is going to become a verb. 
Now, if you use a prepositional phrase, for this pen, for my pen, for your pen, for his pen, for her pen, with her pen, with his pen. See, every time I change the preposition or change the article, I change the ownership and I change the operation of the pen. If I change the operation of pen, I can do it 900 times. So if I put two nouns together, now I've got 81,000 variables. If I put three words together in a sentence, now I've got uh, 7.2 7, 7 million variables. I put the third or fourth word in, I got 640 million variables. I put five words in a sentence, I got 5.4 billion variables. And it goes on and on. So the government comes back and says, we can't do that. We don't have a com computer that can break the code because the amount of terabytes of information just to write a single, a single document with 300 words, so you'd have 900 to the 300 power. I mean, that's a, there's, there's no computer in the world that has enough terabyte capacity to do that. My brain does it as fast as I can speak. I can syntax and write and do the conversions. So the human mind is really unique in its ability to to use deductive reasoning and logic to create the correct sentence structure communication syntax. And with this level of accuracy, the government said that's impossible. Well, I've got a website of 100 pages. I have my books that I wrote, 107 pages. I've got 2,200 lawsuits that are all syntax correctly. It says they're all over the theater. Every judge, attorney, barrister has to study this information and be proficient at it, so when we walk into the courtroom, they know exactly what we're talking about. And then they play the dummy up game. Well, what's the first rule of law? It's called knowledge. If you don't have knowledge, you can't play in the sandbox. <laughs> you can't participate. So you gotta have the knowledge to understand what is being said. When I went into your courts here, in Masseuse's case, the, I started attacking. Now, Dr. Masseuse has had 200 trials over the last 13 years. The case is currently running up a bill of $80 million. And I went in there and in 10 minutes I syntaxed day number one lawsuit, two pages, 186 mistakes on it in syntax. Disqualifies day one. What happens when you build a, uh, a foundation on sand? <laughs> it's gonna collapse. Well, if you commit a fraud on day number one, the other 199 hearings are also fraud because they were predicated on day number one. And the judge stands up and says, I don't have a pay scale high enough to deal with this, he goes. He says, you're not a barrister. You can't represent him. I says, yes, I am. When I came through your customs and immigrations, you put a stamp on my passport. And I signed my name across your stamp. As postmaster, that makes me a postmaster, banker, and judge, and a immigrations and custom officer of your country. So therefore, my passport, my American passport, gives me permission to enter into the foreign vessels. All courthouses on planet Earth are the same jurisdiction. I don't care if I'm in Wisconsin or I'm in Sydney, Australia, all courthouses are foreign vessels in dry dock. They are controlled by the port authorities, which are controlled by the Department of Transportation, which is controlled by the post office. That's the chain of command. The post office is responsible for script, which is money, pays everyone, moves the commerce, and pushes the vessels around through the Department of Transportation, and then docks them in the ports. Every one of us are vessels in dry dock. This chain of command, if we were to walk in a court and mention this chain of command, the judges here would know? Yes, they do. All the judges are required to, to view my videotapes, read my book, and study this program on my internet. And believe me, they have copies of over 2,200 of my lawsuits. And Matter of fact, last week when I got seized over in Australia, they completely downloaded my computer and, all, and five of my chips. They got over 500 lawsuits off of that, and including 135 lawsuits here in, in New South Wales, all the amicus curiae, the quo complaints, and all the people that were involved in each one of these that are suing the government for fraudulent conveyance of language to extort rights and privileges. So they're going to have a lot of work to do when they go through all the programs, but they're going to see that it's...
They call it boilerplate. It means it can't be defeated. And we can get in hard copy about this uh, chain of command? Hard copy? What do you, what do you mean you need a hard copy? Uh, as in... Um, you Who runs what government agency? Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're the president of your country pre-simulation denture. He's a, sim, he's a puppet. All presidents worldwide are puppets. The postmaster general is who runs your government. Who's on your money? Your president or your postmaster, Queen Elizabeth? Well, where did you get this from? That's the same in all countries worldwide. And where I'm a postmaster through studying how to be a postmaster. I have my C, C pass, my C treaty, my drogue law, my, my port authority, my judgeship, my kingship, I was elected king of Hawaii when the 52 families of the Hawaiian kingdom voted to uh, elect me their king because I was the, I only did work in syntax, mathematics, and nobody can argue that three plus three equals six, even though they fight amongst themselves on subject matter. They couldn't argue about math. So I wrote the apology bill for Bill Clinton, and he had to, it was upheld at the World Court at The Hague, Bill Clinton had to apologize for the, to the Hawaiian people for stealing the Hawaiian Islands, and they elected me King of Hawaii, at which then I wrote the Constitution of Hawaii. I established the Constitution of New Zealand, Australia, and the United Nations. I then wrote the, uh, the Charter Trust for the Kapuna Council, so they had a legitimate council trust and constitution to operate government, got your license plates for their cars, driver's licenses for their driving, and public safety is the number one jurisdiction over all countries and all things. If you maintain the rules and regulations of public safety, that you can read, write, have knowledge of how to operate the machinery of an automobile, you, have, you understand about uh, not transporting chemicals or things that are deadly to other human beings, that you maintain good hygiene so that you don't get yourself sick and transport diseases, and you maintain a high standard of public safety, you will then be respected to be an independent people. Now, the Hawaiian people were never conquered by the United States government. And uh, I'll do a little timeline here and show you how World War II started. Are these public safety rules, where do, can we download them? Public safety? That's just your research. This comes where, from 74,000 hours of study. Where can we get a copy of that? In my books. Okay, thank you. My books go through all these different programs. Now, the reason I bring up this thing in Hawaii, because Hawaii un unlocked the secrets of both New Zealand and Australia. You guys are cousins. The, the Maori people, the Origini people, by the way, it isn't Aborigine, AB means no Origini. And Maori is an M O U, it's M O, I mean, M O O, M A. Uh, yeah, M A U R I is the correct spelling, not O. There's no O in it. Um, what I'll do is I'll put up the timeline of how this all took place and unlock the secret of who was in charge. And this just came about on January 6th of, of 2009 that we were able to break this code as a result of a little tiny newspaper article that we found in the archives at the Iolani Palace by accident. Now, we went down to the Iolani Palace and we wanted to know what happened in 1873. We wanted to look at a flag. And we, the, the librarian says, well, we don't have any flags I mean, we don't have any newspaper articles from 1869 to 1875. And I'm going, well, that's impossible. You guys had treaties out here every couple of weeks because Hawaii was the hub of the Pacific. He said, nope, that six-year block has been removed. So we went, as you said, there's a card catalog, as big as that wall over there. So we started looking, and we found one card that said, 1873, and it had a number on it. I said, what's this number mean? He says, what's well, microfish number? So we went and got the microfish film. And on this here, in 1873, they ran a newspaper, was about 11 inches wide and about 17 inches long. Now at the top had a flag, but it was the wrong flag of Hawaii. It had eight stripes instead of seven. And Hightower was the one that found that. But in the bottom, 
of the, of the newspaper was the obituaries with four Masonic symbols, the all-seeing eye and the triangle. Now what they did here is there was two for the Eastern stars in Portuguese and French and two for the English and German Masons to all come to, to the lodge number one across the street from the Elani Palace. Now that Lodge Number no. 1 afterwards in 1893 became the, the first post office in Hawaii and a year later became the Supreme Court of Hawaii, same building. So this was Masonic. So we took the date, and this was, the date was January, wrong color, they brought green, I can't win today. <laughs> January 11th was the, name, it was the date of the newspaper. And it said they were ordering all people, all Masons, to come to Lodge Number 1 on January uh, 14th. Now, it takes three days for the boats to go all the way out to the outer island, 220 miles, and three days to bring all the Masons back to Lodge Number 1. So you had six days to here, and you get the 17th. And the 17th, January 17th, uh, 1873 was the fulcrum of events to take place. Now, when all the Masons met at the lodge, they met on the 14th, and they cut a secret treaty with the post office to take over the Hawaiian Islands after all Hawaiians were declared dead 20 years later. It's called the Death Moratorium. Now, the death moratorium was established in 1849 by King Kamehameha III and said that if you are off the land or dead for 20 years, the land is free for settlement. So then we went back before that in October 22nd, 1872 was the first paper money issued in Hawaii. That meant that the post office through Bern, Switzerland, got the King Kamehameha V to file bankruptcy, ship the gold out, and bring paper money in. And that's when the paper money started in Hawaii. Exactly 45 days later, under Maritime Law of Trust, which was December 7th, King Kamehameha V dies. Yeah, dies, right. 45 days from the time he files bankruptcy, the bankruptcy trust expired. So now he is the last reigning monarch in Hawaii, and he dies, putting 1.8 million acres of land up for grabs, according to this treaty. That was better known as the Bishop's Trust, for those of you who know about it. Now this number, December 7th, is real keen. Now if you take 45 days from that, you get the 14th plus three-day grace period, better known as the Lemon Law. You have the same thing in this country, a three-day grace period when you sign a contract. So you got December 17th now, 45 days plus a three-day grace period of 1873. Add the 20-year moratorium, you get 1893. And when did they, the United States government or United States Postal Service controls all military vessels in the United States and Japan? This is a real keen thing here. 1893, you get the, you get the uh, 17th day of January, 1893, and that's when they, the United States government comes in with the warship and orders King Ilani, uh, Queen Iolani to stand down. Now, through a little research, because I'm a 92nd degree Mason, Queen Iolani is a Eastern star. Because she's an Eastern star, she takes her orders from the Postmaster General of Hawaii, who was the Chief Master Mason. He takes his orders from the Admiralty warship that pulled into port on the 14th of January, 1893, under the three-day law, ordering him to take over the palace. And Queen Iolani, on the 17th of January, goes ahead and surrenders Hawaii to the, to the Masons which are controlling the post office. And the post office, through the military, now takes over and declares the Hawaiian Islands to be a territory of, of the United States. 
because there was no shots fired, the treaty that they wrote was written in adverb verb, which means it didn't say anything. They have no contract. The Admiralty has no contract to invade the island. But because no one can read and write at this point in history, everybody goes along with it. And because the Masons are controlling the post office, the post office is telling the, the uh, a senior postmaster is telling a Eastern Star post uh, queen to stand down. In order to become a Mason, you must surrender your kingship, queenship, or political title. If you're president, you have to surrender it to the Masons and take your orders from the post office. Same thing here in Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, the United States. The United States president, Obama, is the puppet. Potter is our postmaster general. He's the one that pulls the strings and controls all branches of government. You have the same thing here, and that's why Queen Elizabeth's on your money. So it's the post office giving you orders, not the England. Now, if you subtract, if you bring this thing forward to October 22nd, 1872, plus 70 years, it comes out plus 45 days in the three-day trust. It's December 7th, 1941. Pearl Harbor gets bombed by the Japanese. The bankruptcy of, Japan, of Hawaii ends. 70 years, 45 days of trust in three-day grace period. Except the Japanese Navy jumps the gun by one hour. And they bomb all the postal vessels of the United States Post Office which are all the military warships and military warplanes, but they didn't bomb any civilian targets. But because they, uh, Hawaii was not out of bankruptcy because of the one-hour time difference, they violated the international laws of bankruptcy, which then gave Roosevelt permission to declare war against Japan. And we had to go to Tokyo to get the rest of the story on the post office. So it was the postal post office of Japan which controls the military bombing the post office of Pearl Harbor, which was the United States post office, because of trade imbalances. That's what started the war between Japan and the United States. And I have two videos where Fat Boy and Little Boy, better known as the atomic bombs, where the postmaster general of Hawaii is slapping a $1 airmail stamp on the bombs, signing his name across it as postmaster, canceling the stamp, and saying, just to make it legal, we are sending the air freight back to Japan. And that was the post office going to war against the post office. The same thing took place between uh, Poland, coming out of bankruptcy at the stroke of midnight, 1939, and Germany invading Poland because they were no longer bankruptcy protection. That's how that all happens. Same thing takes place down here. Your post office runs everything. And because the post office controls all the vessels in dry dock, which are you, the people, you're required, you, know, you, you carry money in your pocket, and the money you carry in your pocket makes you postal employees of the post office. Therefore, you are vessels in dry dock, and you have to be licensed to go between point A and point B, your corporate employees. Now, another question came up on birth certificates. What is your birth certificate? Your birth certificate is a document that allows the government, 45 days after you're born, you're a live individual under maritime law of trust because you are an issue of state, better known as a, um, let's see, you are a child, C-H-I-L-D. Child means issue of woman. At the end of 45 days, you are a child issue of state, and your birth certificate expires, and now you become your, you get your Social Security number, $1 million. Back when I was there, it was only 600000 Today, it's a million based on inflation. has to be placed into the system, and a bond is issued, and they sell these bonds on the New York Stock Exchange. The Securities and Exchange Commission... Uh, Australia is listed on the Securities and Exchange Commission. You guys are, are traded 
on the New York Stock Exchange, the country of Australia. You're a corporate entity. Okay, now, every person is born, you have to put this million dollars into the hopper, so there's money there, accumulating interest at 6% a year to offset inflation, to then supply the money necessary for you to be paid for your food, clothing, housing, transportation, all your toys you're going to buy throughout life, your gambling, those that are better have more, those that are sloppy have less. And that's where that, that's where that how do you get the money into the system. And it's a chain reaction that has to keep on going on and on and on, and that's the only way that commerce moves so that you have some way to balance who has value. Because every, nobody wants to go out there and work for nothing. Question? Who puts this money into the... the post menu? office does. Because you're a vessel and a postal employee under the post office, and they're responsible for your care. That's why you have social security and social medicine. In the event, any one of you uh, that have a driver's license or social security card were to become injured, let's say you got in a car accident and become a paraplegic, the state will come in, give you medical, food, clothing, shelter, you have a handicap sticker, and you'll get that for the rest of your life. How does the post office take um, control of the human as opposed to the um, original um, Voluntary person? compliance. <laughs> what is the, at which point, what is the voluntary compliance? Well, when you turned 18 years old, you had one thing on your mind, girls, cars, and money. And the girls had one thing on their mind, boys, cars, and money, and it's sex. And sex is the number one motivator. You didn't care about politics. How many kids we got in here today? How many people under the age of 40 are in here? Oh, just five. Okay, five out of 60 ain't bad. <laughs> I thought you said it happens 45 days after. But... Right, 45 days after you become a child, issue a state. If your mother and father neglect you, the state will come in, take you, put you in an orphanage, make sure you have food and clothing and shelter until you're 18 years old. They will educate you, send you to school, and on your 18th birthday, you have the choice to leave the orphanage and go out in the world. But the, every place you go, they're going to say, you want a license for driving? You want a license for work? You want money uh, so that you can propagate the species and go out and meet girls and and play. You didn't care about the post office when you were 18 years old. You weren't even a bit curious. And so when you're 40 years old and you wake up, you, you roll over and say, hey, we're not, not, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. So 45 days from birth, not from 18 years old. Right. They well, no, that's, that's another thing. When you turn 18 years old, you've got 45 days to make a choice. And even when you, turn, when you turn 18 years old, you also have to register for the draft at the post office because the post office has a ball on top of the flagpole because that is advertising, the, that's advertising for re, uh, recruiting for the military. Don't believe me? Go down to your post office. Look at your flag outside. They've got a ball on top. If they have a spear on top of the flagpole, that's for military court marshals. That's for inside your courthouses. Now, you guys don't have flags in your courthouses down here. You've got, you've got seals, but the seals are changing. Every time you modify the condition of the seal, you're in a different courtroom. So don't be gullible enough to think that the jurisdiction is really unique, because it's not. And they change jurisdictions every time you go into that court. If you don't know what's going on, they won't change it. But if you have knowledge, if they know you have syntax, if you're doing my paperwork, every time you walk through that door, they're going to change the rules on you. What is the purpose of changing the jurisdiction? Because under 45 days laws of trust, your old trust expires. The old cause of action expires. They'll even change judges on you every 45 days. So there's no continuance of evidence between one violation and another violation. And for you to go out and sort out where the violations took place, 99.99% of people don't have a clue that they're being harvested. Who stands at the bottom of Lady Justice here in Australia? Ever see a statue? Got a sword in one hand for enforcement, a scale in the other hand for balancing the good and the evil. And what lays at the feet of Lady Justice? Sheep. We fleece the sheep. We don't kill them. 
Does that mean that if you go into a court that has changed jurisdiction, you can walk out? No, that means if you walked in there, you acknowledge the fact that they had jurisdiction. It's called voluntary compliance. But if you've only just become aware, let's say you walk into a court and you re realize that they've changed the seal in the court and they've changed the judge, does that give you the opportunity to uh, walk request? out? Walk out? Well, let's see. If you walk into the courtroom, you don't have paperwork, you're going to be guilty of a Title 46, Chapter 781, a derelict vessel of trans, trans, um, trespassing on a foreign vessel in dry dock without a passport or your papers. Now you're an illegal vessel that's just docked yourself on somebody else's vessel. Just like if you go out here to the harbor and try and get on a Japanese or Chinese ship out here without any ship's papers or permission to go up there, you will be arrested and put in a brig for trespassing. Are they not under some sort of uh, rule that if they change your restriction that they have to notify you? You're supposed to know. Knowledge, ignorance of the law is no excuse. You have to know what all the jurisdictions are, all the seals are, all the placements. If you want to go and play in their, in their sandbox, you've got to know what the rules are. And what are the rules? It's called law of the flag advertises the contract. But they don't use flags, they use seals. But the contract means both parties. My understanding of a contract is where uh, two or more parties are aware of all the conditions of the contract. And should one party change the, any of the conditions in the contract without the knowledge of the other party, it makes the contract null and void. That's correct. Therefore, they have a duty of care to inform the other party that they're changing jurisdiction. You never had any rules and regulations. Has anyone in this room ever filed a quantum lawsuit in court? No. You only had adverb, verb, rules, regulations, codes, lawsuits. You didn't put stamps or flags on your paperwork. Everything you've done in this country since 1800, since the English showed up here, has been a violation of syntax. And, the, and that lie is not just now, it isn't just here, it's 8,500 years running in 5,000 languages. So what you're saying, since the original contract was based on no rules. No rules still apply. Therefore, they can anyone, any party can change the rules at any time without due notice. Except for one little detail. They got guns and clubs, and they're standing here with guns and clubs on both sides of you, and you're totally intimidated because you don't know where you are. You don't know what you're doing. You've wandered into some place you shouldn't be or you were doing something out in the real world you shouldn't have been doing. That's why you're in there in the first place. And so you didn't do your homework. You don't have a six-year college degree in, in, uh, to know what a barrister knows, but a barrister only knows how to read and write an adverb verb. And he's restricted to do that because they have a code. No law or fact shall be tried in court. That is their law. That is their oath. Every judge, barrister, lawyer, attorney, worldwide, all countries, all languages swear to this because for 8,500 years, language has been bastardized. It is adverb, verb, illusion. So you've got an adverb that's a negative adverb modifies the verb or is a conjunction, back becomes a, a verb, shall is a pronoun, be is an adverb, making try to be a past time uh, adverb, I mean past time verb, in is an adverb, modifies the verb court, is a dangling participle. You've got a verb law, a verb fact, and a verb court. You can only have one jurisdiction in court. It's called the least common denominator. In a math problem, you must always acquire the least common denominator in order to solve the problem. Your least common denominator is one. You got one jurisdiction under maritime law, one jurisdiction under maritime facts, and one jurisdiction under maritime court called verb, which is an illusion. In an illusion, three plus three equals all numbers in the universe except six. You can't try three plus three equals six. You know how this started? 1980, they took away my children. I went to trial 65 times, and on the 65th trial, the judge says, you can have your kids. 
I am convinced that you are a good father and that you really want your kids. I'm going, I'm going to sue you for apartheid. He says, I just gave you your kids. I said, every time I say yes, you said no. Every time I said no, you said yes. What's different today? And he says, because, he says, I have the power. I will say no every time you say yes and say yes every time you say no. I says, oh, I can't win. Is that right? He says, not a chance in hell unless I want to give it to you. I says, I says so you're telling me you're never going to agree with me? He goes, that's, that's right. He says, I'm never going to agree with you. He says, it's my privilege to give you your kids. I says, it's three plus three equals six. He goes, yeah. I says, you just agreed with me. He says, well, that's a math problem. No one ever went to war over a math problem. He says, oh, what you're saying to me then is, if I can discover the mathematical interface of all 5,000 languages, that you will give me my kids because I will bring a lawsuit to this court that has the accuracy of a math problem. He says, yeah, I'll do that. So I walked out of that courtroom. I says, all right. He says, you're a smart guy. The judge gets off the bench. He's out the door. I'm still in the courtroom picking up my papers. And he sticks his head back in. He says, you're a smart guy, Dave. You'll figure it out. Well, on April 6, 1988, I broke the code and figured it out. You know what the first thing I did was? Went back and sued Judge Wazalewski for apartheid and genocide against humanity. I had 400 state judges and 38 federal judges that recused themselves in that lawsuit. And 14 judges, including Judge Statman, who was our chief judge, after he got locked out of 47 courtrooms that day, we ran around all day long. They were slamming the doors. He's pounding on the doors. Let me in. He says, no, he ain't bringing that, that trash in here. All the judges knew about syntax by then. And they wouldn't. So Statman says, I'm chief judge. Nobody can overrule me. I'll take the case. It took him 20 minutes to recuse himself. And 400 other judges recused themselves, including the 38 federal judges. Then they brought Judge Moser in, 97 years old, off the bench, 28 years, retired, sharp as a pin at 97 years old. I beat him twice, including defeated him from awarding three attorneys $54,000 in fees. He says, I don't know who you are, he says, but your statute of limitations is running out. Because I wouldn't give my name. Wouldn't get, make contract with them. And I was right the whole time, and I won that case hands down. I've never paid an attorney in 30 years. Um, somebody's asked me to ask this question. Is what, um, what is the second degree Mason? What is what? What is the second degree Mason? 90 second. Oh, 90 second? Uh, okay, it holds the, math, it holds the math interface in all 5,000 of the languages. When I travel around, I have master masons, 33, 34 degree masons, and they want to know what the Mason, Masonic codes are. And I, I own one of five copies of Stanley Hawes' The Secret of All Ages. It's a big book. It's 15 inches wide, two feet tall, and two inches thick. Big book. Big book. thousand pages in it. The ones you can buy on the internet only have about half that information. But then I went ahead and I syntaxed it. One third of all the words are missing from that book, so it's even bigger than that. The, the things that I do when I read information. Uh, last night I pulled up the flag of Australia, the 1853 flag of the Origini people. And I syntaxed it. The Queen Elizabeth said that there is no flag that cannot be seen and we will not acknowledge the people because they don't exist. And then signed it Elizabeth. Really? Which means she says there are no people, there are no rules, there are no regulations, there are no codes, there is not a flag. If you people want to believe in your illusion, I'll just uh, italicize my name as Elizabeth, which means it's not on the paper. And it's called an act. ACT. All words that start with a vowel. Illusion. I'll just uh, italicize my name as Elizabeth, which means it's not on the paper. And it's called an act. ACT. 
All words that start with a vowel, A, E, I, O, and U, are followed by two consonants means no contract. You're going to say, where do I find that rule? Look up every word in the dictionary. Get yourself a nice 8-inch thick Webster's Unabridged Dictionary and look up every word that starts with a vowel and two consonants. And then all the synonyms that reflect that word, and you will find a no contract, a negative condition of state for every single word. So the word enact means no contract. Right. ACT means no contract. I was under the impression that the police was enacting an act, a parliament. And how do you spell enact? E N A C T. Which means no. Act, which so means it's no contract. So it's a no no contract. <laughs> <laughs> Which part of no don't we understand? The N or the O? <laughs> so what you're saying is the whole court system is based on um, dealing with no rules, no law, um, and it's set up in such a way that there's no way you can win in that, even under their own, their own system. Nope, that's not true. Not anymore. No until syntax came along, until I showed up out here with the syntax on how to do uh, quo ranto complaints and teach you guys how to do your quo ranto complaints, this is a room. This room has four corners. This is a box. In this box, this is an enclosed area. Everything that happens in here has nothing to do with the rest of the world. All the information you learn here today is in a closed area for you people only. So this is an isolated scenario. This explains why they think they have the right to change anything that happens in the court that's being taped. Uh, no. So it is written, so it shall be done. Does 2 plus 2 equal 4? Well, that's what I was taught. T-O plus T-O-O -O equals F-O-R. T-W-O and T-O equals F-O-R-E. Did you hear what I said when I meant what I said? What I said when I meant what I said? Four. You said 2 plus 2 equals 4? Right. T-O plus T-O-O -O equals F-O-R. I can do it 120 different ways. I got it. I think we need a wet rag here. Or one with alcohol on it. In 4700 BC, Pharaoh said, so it is written, so it shall be done. And re there was a reason for that. Because oral contracts cannot be seen or proven. Because of the argument, you got two. Now, uh, tilde is location. This is not a value. This is a location. The address on your home is a location. It is not a value. You write your address. My address is tilde, 5166. Tilde, north. North is not a direction. It's a location of direction. Tilde, 63rd Street. And so, thank you. Uh, the city of Milwaukee is the name, but it's also a location on a map. So therefore, it's a tilde Milwaukee, tilde Wisconsin, tilde zip code. Everybody goes, well, we've got to put a bracket around so we, we, we're not in the postal zone. You put a tilde in front of the zip code. They copyrighted just the number. You copyrighted the location with a tilde. You are correct. They are not. So if you write, if you do...
So 7 times 7 is 49 times 6. 300 divided by 2 is 150. 2 plus 2 is equal 4. Did you hear what I said, what I meant, what I said, when I said, what I meant, what I said, and only one is correct? If you don't see it written, you can't prove it. Anybody wants to, when you write a contract, you go into court, you have a syntax document. You are filing a lawsuit with an accuracy of 1 to 900 for every word. Your correct sentence structure, communication, syntax, balance of the order of operations of cause and effect, a verb of thinking, a possessive of with, and an authorization of by the, gives you an order of operations for every sentence that follows the rules of the operations of a court. So every single sentence is its own independent court as you make an argument. We're not dealing with 150 to 1 variables in an oral conversation. So your paperwork is going to speak for you. Why do you think the government or shut the government down here in Australia and in New Zealand and the United States 19 times? Because they got caught in a lie and they didn't know what to do with themselves. They had to go out and study. They have to come up to speed with this thing. Every court in the world has to do this. And when you take English through syntax through this program, and you translate it to Spanish, Spanish to French, French to German, German to Russian, Russian to uh, Indian, Indian to Chinese, Chinese to Japanese, and back to English. You don't lose any words. It's a math problem. Just because there's 5,000 different signs and symbols for things, it's a math problem. It can't change a math problem. That's the accuracy and the beauty of this technology. No, because you can take any one of these times any one of these to equal one of these. That's how you get your variables. 7 times 7 is 49 times 6 is 300 divided by 2. Otherwise, you repeat yourself. This one? That's a tilde. It's a location. This is the number. This is the written number. This is the, the hieroglyph number. F-O-R, F-O-R-E, F-O-U-R, the number four, tilde four. Those are locations when you put a tilde in front. Now, F-O-Y-E, doesn't that mean before? It's what you hear, not what's written. Did you hear what I said? What I meant, what I said. What I said, what I meant, what I said. I'm communicating to you. It isn't what's written here. I'm writing to show you how many ways I can write it to show you the variables, but when I speak it in one terminology, which one of the 150 variables up here that I just say to you, you don't know that. And because you don't know that, you're going to make a presumption, opinion, presumption, guess, perjury, a lie. How many different mistakes can you make? And that's only one word, or that's only three words. Try doing it with a lawsuit with uh, 30,000 words on it. What do you think the, uh, your, your variables are here? You're talking about quadruple uh, terabyte to the terabyte power of variables. You, you can't get to a fact. If you can't have a fact, what are we doing? We're lying to each other. My technology brings us to a position of accuracy that cannot be argued. And the court room is a building. That is not the document on the piece of paper. When you write a lawsuit, the paper that you have. Where's my paper? When you have, when you have the lawsuit, this is the court, folks. As a judge, I swear to support the Constitution of the United States. The United States means two or more people coming together in a closed area. Doesn't this have thing four corners? Four, this is a closed area. It's called paper. It carries the cargo words. The words have terms and definitions. This book not only has a sentence, but every word in this book is defined and has a syntax, quantumized definition. Every word is accounted for in this book including a lot more words. It took Russell and I six years, 12,000 hours, 
we had a team of guys breaking up A, B, C, D, E. And of all the 2 million words in the English language, we've got 720 words that are syntax. That's it. Pretty simple. Average person has a 12,000 word vocabulary. You only need 720 to learn syntax. And in 99% of the cases, you use less than 50 different words in an entire lawsuit to win your case. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. When it's, it's so simple. Once you get it, it's, it's mathematical. But this is the court. This is the contract between you and the judge. The courtroom is irrelevant. The seals that are hanging on the walls are irrelevant. This flag is the correct sentence structure communication syntax flag, which advertises that this is correct. You place a postage stamp up on your corner. You sign across it. That makes you the postmaster transporting the vessel of the document to the clerk of the court, which is the port of the court. She puts her stamp on it. When she puts her stamp on it, you sign your name across her stamp, making you a postmaster of not only your paperwork and your vessel, but now you're in contract with the port, port authorities of the court, because it's a courthouse, which is a foreign vessel in dry dock, so you've entered a foreign vessel. Now you're the postmaster and clerk of a foreign vessel in dry dock. Now you've got a 24 karat gold bonded document that has to go into court. But if you're, going to, if you're going to sign the stamp on the front, you have to also endorse the back of the top of the cover page because that's called an endorsement. How many of you can cash a check at the bank without endorsing your check? Nobody. Because if you take the document and you roll it up, when you unroll it, the top of the back, when they seal those scrolls, they would put a seal on it. That was the endorsement. Hmm. And that, that gave the document its value. And not only that, this book is bonded together. When I went to court in 1997, I used to have three ring notebooks with my paperwork in it. I went to testify. The judge says, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm testifying to my book. He says, that's all loose paper, he says. You've got to have a bonded book in order to be an author with the authorization to talk about the authority of your authentic document. And it's a document. That's why you get a docket number when it, the vessel comes to the court and it gets docketed. It's a staple considered? No. Staples, maritime law staples, is not bonded together. However... You, use a merit, you put the staple as a mechanical device to hold the papers together and then take super glue, put a drop on it, and the capillary attraction will, will fuse the papers together. Uh, you can have three forms of bonding. You can glue it, you can stitch it, and you can rivet it. I sent Janet Reno a letter charging her with treason against the United States, and she sent me back a letter, two-page letter, with six, three-eighths of an inch brass rivets that were Six big, thick brass ribbits to hold two sheets of paper. She says, you want bonded documents? Here's a bonded document. <laughs> but that's, I don't know if you've ever seen Janet Reno. She stands six foot eight. Um, you went through that a little next fast. Where he's about this high. <laughs> yes? You went through that a little fast. I'm sure some of the people here would, would like to use a, a, a basic uh, common uh, um, practice that we have. Let's say uh, we go to a court with a affidavit. Well, let's see if I get this correct. What you're saying is that we actually put our own seal and put some sort of stamp with you. are going to use your navigator stamp. Your navigator stamp has uh, two bars through the dollar sign. Now you have your dollar signs come in two forms. This is a Federal Reserve note and that's a gold certificate. The navigator stamp of Australia is a gold certificate. In the United States since 1900, the red fox stamp was the only one that was published with two bars through the dollar sign. And that was published on the 2nd of November 1999 when the United States ended its third bankruptcy and became a sovereign. And then when we went out and bought up all the, our, my students all over the United States went out immediately and bought up all the red fox stamps. And then we started putting them on all of our documents to sue government officials. That explains why I can't find any. <laughs> The judges ordered that all the, the Red Fox stamps be canceled and, and seized wherever they were in the United States and destroyed so that they didn't have any gold standard stamps out there. 
but we've had we've got several thousand of them to use on all of our official documents that we use constantly. Good, I'll see you after. <laughs> um, okay, with the document, um, we put in a, a, a stamp if we can get one, and then we, we sign across the stamp. Then when we go to lodge it in a court, in a file, they will, the court will stamp it with their stamp. Yeah, don't put it, don't put the file stamp. See, now first you get a, what's called a receive stamp which means they're going to receive the documents and they're going to issue a summons to come to court. Right. Okay. You have to then serve the document on the people and have your return service from the, the people you're serving the document on. And those have to be attached, uh, return service, back to the court with your lawsuit. And then they will give you a file stamp. And then it goes to the judge for when you're going to have it in schedule for hearing. Um, here, the, the normal, um, my understanding of the normal procedure is that when you file it with the court, they put a stamp on it. Mm -hmm. okay. But I don't think they, they write anything on it. The clerk of the court, who is the port authority receiving a vessel at, her de at, at the desk, is supposed to initial, put her initials on that stamp upon receiving it. And it, at the same time, the, the one that they keep for their file you sign your name across that, as well as all those you're going to serve on the other people, making you a postmaster, bank banker, and judge, because you canceled the stamp. That gives you the authority as a postmaster to transport the vessel of the lawsuit between your home and the port authorities. So if there is a stamp on the documents they received, or the stamped and documents you've received being served by them and has no signature of the person. Then you sign it. it. You take jurisdiction. Capture it. As long as you got their stamp, you sign across it. You captured their jurisdiction. You become the clerk of the court. And what's the practical purpose for that? The practical purpose is that you are the individual that's going to be transporting this document. If you don't sign it, you don't become the clerk, and you don't sign your name across the stamp, You've skipped over the postmaster's position to move the vessel. How does it go from point A to point B? Is it magic? You're creating a paper trail of authority. You're the author. You have the authority and postmaster to move that. And when you hand that up to a judge, um, or the judge already has it in his file because they have filed it, how is he going to deal with that since you're the postmaster general and he works he's a postmaster also he all judges are postmasters bankers and judges look up bankers in the black's law dictionary it says see postmasters and judges look up judges it says post postmasters and bankers look up bankers he says postmasters and judges <laughs> so the purpose of this procedure is to force a judge to um, consider the document presented in truth no, truth is an opinion, to be correct. In opinion. Right. And judges only issue opinions. The word order, O-R-D, volunteer consonants, means no contract because you wrote the whole order in adverb verb. It's an illusion. You syntax any judge's orders he gives you, and if, even if he says you win, here's your win, an adverb verb, you haven't won anything. It's just an illusion. You syntax it and you say, I want to correct one. Write up your own order and syntax and have him sign it. He'll do it. Mm, thank you. <laughs> he doesn't want to think. Remember, the reason for thinking is to abolish thinking. Thinking hurts the brain. Thinking hurts the person. That's why we got ditch diggers and punch press operators. Because it's too, it hurts too much to think. And people that want to think and they become great thinkers, you don't see them doing physical labor because they've learned how not to hurt. Their brain is a curiosity machine that just can't get enough. Question. I wanted to go back to the um, uh, 2022 when we um, come out of international bankruptcy. Does that mean Australia becomes a republic? No, a republic means no people. Okay, does a it, democracy does it... means demonology. Uh, you're going to become sovereign. You become a sovereign nation on a gold standard because you, your country is only scratched a couple of feet above the surface on how much gold you've got out here. You've got a lot of gold here. I does, mean, just, does, it, does it mean that some other country can invade us? Uh, it does, but it won't happen because of the toys that the planet has now in place. 
cool. <laughs> Everybody knows what I mean by toys. <laughs> Nobody's going to interfere. You guys are traded on the New York Stock Exchange. You're about as American as you're going to get down here, you know? <laughs> Everything's about commerce. They don't want wars. You know, if you ask a military person, what is your job title? He says, I'm in the business of mind control. I control your mind or I replace it with a bullet. <laughs> what do you think of that a war going on over there? Every time you got differences between two people, they either want to kill each other, they won't sit down and talk. I'll tell you a little story about something that happened. I'm over in Hawaii, and I'm flying back to the United States from Hawaii, going into, to, it was supposed to be a nonstop flight from uh, Milwaukee to Chicago. I mean, from... Uh, Honolulu to Chicago. And they stick me way back in row uh, 70, I think it was row 75, on a 76 seat 747. And there's a lady sitting next to me. I says, what do you do? She says, oh, I'm a school teacher. So I'm going, well, this is cool. We'll sit and we'll discuss syntax. And then her daughter is sitting next to her, and she's, she's complaining about having to move all the time. He says, why don't you like it in Hawaii? Because she was going to the University of Miami. She says, no. She says, I, I got to move all the time. He says, well, why, why do you move? And she says, well, my husband's in the military. And I says, well, uh, what does he do? Well, he's in the Navy. Well, what, is, what is he? He says, he's Admiral Nimitz of the Nimitz Attack Group. Pearl Harbor, aircraft carriers, mm -hmm. about 35 ships. <laughs> I'm going, oh, I'm sitting next to the wife of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and just got promoted to Washington, D.C., who's just been transferred from the Nimitz attack group to Joint Chiefs of Staff to handle the Israeli-Palestine uprising. And I'm sitting next to her, and I'm the guy teaching her syntax language. So the guy sitting directly in front of me all of a sudden, like, collapses. And supposedly he has a heart attack, right? Well, he's Secret Service. And uh, Stuart comes over, and Captain gets on the phone a few minutes later. We need anybody that's a heart surgeon. We have a man with a heart attack. So the three heart surgeons show up, and they're all standing there. And they're not, they're not doing anything. The captain comes back and says, what's going on here? Why aren't you guys taking care of this man? He says, just had a heart attack. Well, we don't have a medical release. He says, you don't seem to understand. You're on my vessel, in my sea of space, and I'm the captain of this vessel, and I will lock you in the toilet in the brig if you don't take care of this man. So the one doctor, he goes over, and the guy grabs him, pulls him down, looking between the seats, and he whispers something in his ear, and he goes running back up to the front of the plane. The captain comes on the phone a few minutes later and says, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have to stop in L.A. The man who had a heart attack needs a medical, immediate medical assistance. So we land in LA at the end of the runway, whole plane gets surrounded by squad cars. In comes two guys with a stretcher and six guys in black uniforms. The two guys carry this guy off the plane and the six black uniforms sit down in the row behind us. Secret Service, military secret service for the Joint Chiefs of Staff to protect his wife and, her, and, the, and the daughter. And I had seven hours to teach her syntax language. I says, now, how do I talk to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and educate the Pentagon in Washington on syntax? Well, who sleeps with the Joint Chiefs of Staff? His wife, who's an English teacher and understands exactly what I'm saying. Her son just got transferred to Palestine in the, in the Navy. I says, you want to protect your son? Talk to your husband about syntax. I'll write the syntax treaty between Palestine and Israel, will stop the war. Now I have her attention. To save her son's life, she's going to learn about syntax. I give her one of my books. You haven't heard any noise from the Palestine-Israeli conflict in quite a few years, have you? It's been pretty quiet over there. You see, so sometimes God moves in mysterious ways. Puts people together what is the Joint Chiefs of Staff wife doing in row 75 on a 747? She should be on a mil flying first class up in the front of the plane. Circumstances. Circumstances because it was a sold out flight and there was only one seat of it, two seats available at the back of the plane. And so she got stuck on there because of some other appointment that happened. 
And why was I sitting next to her? Of all people in the world, the only person with syntax in the whole world would be sitting next to her. So what was the thing of how I did on 676? I missed my plane. I thought I got the times wrong, so I missed my flight. I was in, in row 30. I always fly the exit rows in row 30. So I got a lot of leg room on the 747. So because I missed my flight, I got stuck in the back with her. So there was divine intervention that I misread my tickets. She may have read her tickets, and we both wound up together in the back of the plane. So I had all this time to teach her about syntax. And shortly thereafter, I went to the Pentagon, and I became muster master for the Navy, which uh, means I will protect all Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Army personnel from any apartheid or genocide lawsuits from any foreign government. That's my duties with the, because I'm, I hold the syntax secrets. What was a question? What do you mean? It's been two hours already? It's 11 o'clock. You guys want to take a 15 minute break? I've got about a dozen of my clients here today, and you mentioned before that uh, you're a 90-second mason. A few right. of them have come to me at the break with concerns around that. Just wondering if you could qualify that so that, um, so that they're... Uh... Masonry worldwide goes up to 34 degrees. However, the, there's a... Uh, in Manly Hall's The Secret of All Ages, <clears throat> the amount of information that is in that one book is the accumulation of 8,500 years of history of all the different religions that have taken place throughout history, uh, different cults, uh, Pharisees, illusions that um, manipulated mankind, the creation of the boogeyman to keep people scared so that they could always look for protection from something. The Masonic codes, no matter what language it was written in, had one third of all the words missing. And my technology through algebra puts the missing words in and brings it all into now time. It takes all negative out of the language and only brings it into a now time positive. So it allows me all the hidden secrets that are built into all the sentence structure. And so when I get with a group of Masons, they have their agenda of what they believe. But their beliefs were based on adverb-verb illusions. So then it's my job to go ahead and syntax it and bring it into now time facts and show them what the true meaning of is, whatever they want. The amount of information is so vast that <clears throat> for me to publish it, it'd be like trying to syntax the Bible or the Quran. I mean, these are, these are huge books with thousands of pages. It would take a lifetime to do it. So based on each individual's needs on whatever their limited education is based on, I will answer questions on a one-to-one, -one, question to question basis and syntax it for you. And I'll do it for anybody at any time. We have ministers from all over the United States that contact me on email from all different faiths. And they want me to syntax a single phrase and they will, use, they will take that single phrase and make an entire one-hour presentation to their parish. And where they used to have 30 or 40 people come to church, they have standing room only now because the people are there because they want to see the syntax facts. It changes your entire perspective of what truth is or correctness. You said you're at 97. What does that mean? That means that my technology abridges all the Masons worldwide. These, the secrets that they think that they have are misinformation. And I don't practice any specific religion or faith. I believe in God. I believe in goodness. And I, I maintain my life to be a correct, in a correct position. And by being correct about things on a mathematical level, it allows me to talk to audiences that are come from thousands of different cultures, definitions, religions, and maintain peace amongst the, my students. Because I, here's a technology that has to be translated to all six billion humans without insulting any faith, uh, political belief, sex, customs, Political belief, sex, customs, 
I mean, when you take something that's going to unify an entire planet because it's correct, remember, no one ever went to war over a math problem, and all six billion humans use the same mathematical syntax. But how many different languages? You've got 5,000 different religions. You've got 5,000 different languages. And it keeps everyone divided, called Babel, where even though they have all this Babel, for 8,500 years, they still use the same math problem, and they don't fight over it. So by bringing communication skills down to a math problem, we e remove the ability of an individual to lose his temper or maintain an argument. And, and with that said, uh, you got a question? Yeah, I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> I uh, might be preempting this a little bit here now, but if um, the syntaxing is or could be considered such a threat to the status quo, the and illusion, the, the yeah, to the fiction, right? Entity, how come you're still around and it's, <laughs> and it's still around? Every every seminar that question's yeah. been asked at all 940 <laughs> seminars. Why am I still walking around? Well, that's an easy question. Now, I believe in the time-space continuum. I mean, we had a past, everyone. It's been around for 50 years, 60 years now, right? And if we said to you 50 years ago what was going to happen today, 50 years in the future, would you believe 50 years was going to be here from the past? Do you believe that, you're going to, that the Earth will be here 50 years from now? Well, we can only hope, right? Nobody knows what the future is. Nobody knows what the past is. But then, look at where we came in the last 100 years with technology. I mean, this little unit here has more memory capacity and does more gadgets than every, every household computer just five years ago. And that's a little handheld device. We watch TV on it, communicate with everything. In December of 09, the biggest computer capacity in microcircuitry was 200,000 transistors to a head of a pin. In January 10, it was two gigabyte. Two billion transistors on the head of a pin. And where's it going to be down the road? Well, a quarter inch green holographic laser in quartz crystal will create a 600 gig RAM with a 64 terabyte high drive. And that's only a quarter inch of quartz crystal. Make it bigger and you can exponentialize itself. How small is small? How much information can you fit into a tiny area? How much, can you, how much information can you write on the electron of a hydrogen atom? You know? and, then and then recover it to build technology of such things. So my thing is that people in the future through technology, if man does get to a certain point, will eventually be able to, if sex communications are responsible for the math interface stay safe and bring this program to its cushion. So if anybody tries to kill me, they're just going to come back before. And they're going to remove that individual. Mom and dad won't meet. Instead of taking, making a left-hand turn, he's going to make a right-hand turn, never meets his wife, doesn't create the seed that creates the person that commits the suicide. You get the point? In other words, the, the, the possibilities, I make the statement, the person that would harm me doesn't exist because the success given price was there, did my blow, was I killed? Did they just enough that my consciousness would be aware that there's a change? And you have that happen hundreds of times over the last 30 years. And you get to start asking questions that I'm being watched. There's events that take place. I've missed so many planes at the airports. And every time I miss a plane, I'm sitting next to somebody who I would have never met, who missed their plane, who I would have never met. But that person is relevant to the time-space continuum of bringing information out in the world. Just like I told you the story about Mrs. Helm. Any of you remember the, the Freeman standoff in Montana in 1995? There was uh, over 100 FBI agents trying to make these guys surrender and come off their land. The Freeman standoff. Right after, and then after that, Ruby Ridge took place. I was the guy that wrote the lawsuit against Peterson, Clark, and Schweitzer against 100 FBI agents. 
for breaking. And the compound that these guys were in was a hole in the United States. It wasn't the United States of America. It was an old Indian treaty that was never brought into the country and they lived in a hole and the FBI couldn't trespass into that hole. And one of the things that no one knows about, the military brought in two 108 howitzers, put them in a gravel pit 125 feet deep, evacuated everyone for an area of eight miles around the gravel pit, the military did. The gravel pit was located roughly 40 miles from the compound. The intention was that they were going to throw two shells 20 miles up in the air at midnight, dark of the moon, and they were going to fall down and blow a hole 100 feet wide and 50 feet deep on top of the compound. End of the story. I was called up when I was in Hawaii to come and get these guys out safely. So I sent in a six-hour audio tape, just a cassette, explaining syntax to these guys. And they came out dancing and surrendering to the FBI because they knew there was no rules, regulations, or codes once they saw syntax. They didn't get, my job was to keep them alive. The shells never went off. Everything got bottled up and taken away. We had enough people that witnessed the, the cannons being placed in and what the rules and regulations were, how they were going to eliminate the threat, which never took place. So there was cause and effect. And when I was supposed to do a radio broadcast in Cat Creek, Montana, all four radio stations were dynamited. <coughs> Just moments before the broadcast was to take place. So we called up a radio station 250 miles away on telephone, and we still did a two-hour broadcast explaining syntax and how the FBI had no rules, regulations, or codes to invade where they were and what the treaties were. These are all different events. These are one of just hundreds of stories I have of events where I've interfered with around the world when I travel and save people's lives. And I could, I could burn up the whole seminar telling you stories about things that I've done in lawsuits and save, saving people's lives, but that's not what we're here for today. Now, during break, we had a little discussion. I told this young lady that at all my seminars, I do this. I'm going to define the word God. Everybody goes, how can you take religion? And everyone in this room has a different faith and talk about religion in a mixed community. Okay? There's a, there's a thing that uh, we use a triangle to explain this. We all want correctness. Because this here is your truth. Now, when you believe that you are correct and you have truth, you will make contract. And as you are all taught throughout your entire life, you will always honor those contracts you make. And there you find your God. Okay, now, so what is God? Well, God is a, we all want to know who the creator is. We all want to know what the origin is of our beliefs. Every person in this room has a thousand independent definitions. You've read books. You've talked with your parents, your friends, your relatives, your church. You've uh, explored your own dreams as who God is. So everyone in this room has an independent thousand different definitions to fulfill these three terms to come to the, what this definition is, and it's unique to you and you alone. And no matter, you can go to any church, and a minister is going to tell you one definition, but then if you ask, what did this man say to me just now? What did the priest say, or the, the minister, or the rabbi uh, say, and you're going to get a hundred different definitions of what people heard because they are using their own life experience to do what's called subjective interpretation of what was just said to them. Now, it says in all the religions that God created man in his image. 
and the synonym of image is imagination, creation, art. And so all the terminologies that you absorb throughout your life are to define one thing, the difference between good, which you classify God in creation, and evil, which is destruction, and bad things. You have to learn about bad, and you have to learn about good. It's called perspective. So you know the difference between right and wrong. We choose to be good because it's a better form of life. Those that are bad and don't live in our society as bad, we put them in jail, and they get penalized. So we, we spend our entire life searching for one definition of this word. And everyone, all six billion humans on planet Earth, have a different thousand definitions than the person standing next to them. And it's unique to you and you alone. That's what your faith is. And all the stories that I am told as to what this word is defined at, has, I have never heard two stories the same and all my travels, and all the people I've talked with. So your, your ability to read, understand, subjectively translate information in your mind, and come up with a conclusion to be good, is what you have to do when you look in the mirror in the morning, and you say, I'm, you can look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm going to be good. I'm going to be an honorable person. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to love my children, take care of my family, and I'm not going to go out and do evil and hurt people. And that's basically the bottom line of where we are. Where we are. So who is God? God is the creation of your thoughts and the information you have. Hold a thought in your hand. Show me the three-dimensional object of a thought. Hold God in your hand. Show me the three-dimensional object of your God. It comes from your thought and all the information that you have absorbed. What we're doing here in syntax is we're showing you that the Bible is written in the Quran, in the Jewish Bible, and all of these, these different communications worldwide are written in adverb verb. They've left the words out. Why do they leave the words out? Because they can control you. So by learning syntax, you can go back and put the missing words in. In now time, you can remove the, the prefixes and the suffixes, which are the past and the future, and go to the root words. Then find a root word that means now time information, not the future, not a word that means no contract. So you're, if you go through any Bible phrase and you see a word that starts with a vowel and two consonants, get a book of synonyms, look up all the synonyms, and go ahead and list those down and put those in, and then put the correct prepositional phrase in front of that word. Learn, you will learn how to build a sentence correctly from that phrase. Now, in my books and on my website, I have the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer has been syntax. One of my students stands up and says, I don't like the way you wrote that. I says, good, here's a book on synonyms. Replace any noun you want in the Lord's Prayer with any other synonym that is coordinated with that, and you will create a new Lord's Prayer. And then you've got to read it backwards using the opposite preposition. And whether you read it frontwards or backwards, it will still say the same thing, and you can write 10,000 Lord's Prayers, and they will all say the same thing. Now, you show me a technology that you can write the same thing 10,000 different ways, and it never changes its meaning. That is unique. Just like you can't change a math problem. It's either right or it's wrong. There is no, well, it's almost there, or it's almost right. You want to get, you want to get down to the crux of what is correct, that is where you want to be, in a correct position. And that's why this technology scares the, scares the courts. Because no law, which is a negative condition, is the only thing, that gets, and no fact, is the only thing that gets tried in court. Remember, the sign says no parking. No is an adverb, modifies the verb parking, and they put a box around it. So it's an enclosed area and can't be considered because it was a lie in the first place. And no is a negative condition, so how do you no park? You can't create a negative condition of state. Where's my fact? How can I pay a fine for a no fact? Well, I'm going to use a Federal Reserve note. Re meaning no is serve. So I have a negative condition of of payment for a negative condition of violation and a negative condition of court for a negative condition of law. 
So therefore, I have one condition of nothing. So therefore, it's voluntary compliance. And to make sure you volunteer to comply with negative, we put a gun to your head and say, choose. Right? You've all been there and done that. Everybody's got a parking ticket at least once in your life. If you guys have such things here in Australia. <laughs> but that's my, that's, that's my terminology of finding out what you know about what your, the difference between good and evil is. There's 5,000 names for God. But there's an infinite amount of ways to subjectively interpret how to get to that belief. But the, the, the bottom line is, you're either good or you're evil, right? You've got two choices. It's a plus and minus. There is no gray area. There is no stand in the middle and be zero. I did a theology seminar for 47 ministers from 16 different religions. One man stands up and says, I'm an atheist. And, of course, all the other ministers, they do the little hum, you know. <laughs> I'm going, yeah, but in the morning when you wake up, you stand in front of a mirror and you say, I believe in me. I don't believe in anything else in the world. He says, while you're believing in you, I says, do you have specific rules and regulations that you're going to conduct yourself as an atheist? He says, yes. I says, and you go out there to be a good person, aren't you? He says, yes, I am a good person. And you know the difference between good and evil, don't you? As an atheist, he goes, yes, I do. I said, well, guess what? You made a choice between good and evil. You have faith. I says, your faith may not have a definition that correlates with the other 47 men in here, but you have faith, just the same, and you make choices. Remember the movie Matrix? When Keanu, when Keanu Reeves, Neo, He's in the room with the, the 100 TVs. The architect. And the architect is having a conversation with, with him. And what does Neil say? The one, he says, it's all about choice. And you make choices every day. Left or right, up or down, in or out. And you're going to make your choices every day to be good or evil. And if you know what syntax is, you can make a mathematical choice. You have better pieces of information to make better decisions to be good. And then if somebody with evil wants to come at you with an illusion called adverb verb, you can say, that's a lie, and I can prove it. And that's the one thing that would happen in front of Wasilewski back in 1985. Wasilewski said, you can't prove that I lied to you. I says, you know what, you're right, I can't prove that. He says, I know you're wrong. He says, yes, he says, I'm wrong. He says, but you can't prove it. He says, when you can prove that I'm wrong, he says, I'll give you what you want. And that's what changed everything. And I went out and I found out how to do it correct so I could prove it. I have a signed confession for all 4,000 judges that I removed from the bench and 2,200 attorneys. Sign confession. That's the only way I can do what I do, and I'm the only guy on planet Earth that prosecutes judges and attorneys. I've got another one for you. You do? Yes, oh, another judge, of course. Everybody has one. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'll ask the question, who has the worst court system in Australia? And, of course, everybody's hand goes up. <laughs> and it's because people don't agree with what they know. But the judges have to take special courses in deductive reasoning. We have to look at you when you come before us, what your volition was to be here, what kind of game you want to play. Now, this is a story that happened in Seattle, Washington. The man comes to court, and the judge gets into a discussion with him. And he says, I have all the facts, Your Honor. And the judge says, oh, you have all the facts. He says, you have 30 days to bring all the facts back to this courtroom to make your argument before this court. And the judge says, or I'm going to put you in jail for six months. And he says, well, what do you mean by all the facts? The judge says, all the facts. And this is dealing with a traffic case. He says, but that's to do all. He says, that is a, would be thousands of pages. He says, you're the one that said you have all the facts. He says, I'm just making sure that you know what you're talking about. Choose your words. 
So the first thing this guy does is he calls me up and walking. He goes, hey, Dave, he says, I just put my foot in my mouth and I just told the judge I have all the information to come to court. And the judge called me on it and he says, he's going to put me in jail for perjury if I don't bring all the facts to court. He says, what am I going to do? I says, practice doing handstands. <laughs> he goes, practice doing handstands? I says, yes, that's the, that's the riddle. That's the solution to the riddle. He says, and when you go to court, you go in there and you pop a handstand for the judge. <laughs> and he says, your, your feet are dangling in the CO space and you brought all the facts to court today, which is planet Earth and all the facts. <laughs> so he walks into court 30 days later and the judge says, are you here to go to court? And he says, yes, I am. And he comes in there. And the judge says, well, where's all your paper? Where's all the facts you're going to bring here today? He says, you ordered me to bring all the facts to court. And he pops a handstand for him. <laughs> the judge says, what are you doing? He says, I'm bringing all the facts to court today. He says, my feet are dangling in the sea of space, and I brought planet Earth to court today in the well of the court. He says, you ordered me to bring all the facts. I did so. He says, you know, he says, that's the only right answer. He says, case dismissed. We're free to go. See, sometimes it's about subjective interpretation. And you have to you have to read between the lines. Okay. Moving forward, we're going to uh, go through the courtroom procedures. Now, a courtroom is divided into five different sections. And most people don't even know they're in this elaborate illusion. Some courtrooms only have two planes, but you will have a plane. And the judge. And when I get done explaining this, I'll tell you a little story. The judge sits on the top plane, so he is removed, and he's in a box. And he has his flag or his seal on his box, which means he is an independent jurisdiction. He can either see you, hear you, or have any jurisdiction. He is an actor in black robes. Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 44.1. It's the only place where it is found. It says judge is an actor. So. The clerk of the courts, however, sits on plane number one in most, in most courtrooms. Up until the time I put this presentation up here and blew the secret on the clerks, they then took the clerks off of the same plane as the, as the claimant in the Vasily. A Vasily is a servant employee, servant employee of the courtroom, which is your prosecuting attorney, and you are the claimant. Don't call yourself a respondent because re means no speak. Defendant means no contract. So don't get involved with no contract language. So the clerk was then moved off of plane number one into its own separate plane. When you take the witness stand, you're going to go ahead and you're going to move yourself from the, the common and you're going to put yourself into a box. And in that box, the witness cannot hear evidence or give evidence and cannot produce any testimony. So it's mute argument. The jury box is on a different plane as well. In the jury box, when you look it up in Black Sock Dictionary, it says this is an enclosed area that cannot witness, cannot see witnesses or hear testimony. Yep. Read it for yourself. It's all been published. They're in the box, aren't they? Which is an enclosed area. And therefore, there's no, there's no continuance of evidence between the jury, the judge, the claimant, the vassalier, or the clerk. The whole thing is all mute. Nobody, everybody is talking to nobody. The contracts are written in adverb verb. Nothing is being contracted, nothing is being said. And what did I tell you about what is the court? The court is the document. The Constitution are the words on the document. If the Constitution is written in adverb verb, and I swear to support the Constitution of the United States between two people who said nothing about nothing on nothing in a closed area of nothing without a postage stamp, without a flag to establish jurisdiction, I've got nothing going in and nothing's coming out. <laughs> How much money you got? Well, it's $275 an hour to talk, and you have freedom of speech at $275 an hour, and as soon as your money runs out, we will make a decision. We are practicing banking and commerce, and no matter what you think is happening, it never happened. <laughs> then you get to file an appeal if you don't like what nothing happened. How do you spell appeal? APP, <laughs> which means no contract. And what does the word appeal mean? It means the higher court will forgive the lower court for doing nothing about nothing with nobody <laughs> and up and agree with it unless it is something that will affect 
public opinion about how the court system operates, some genocide or apartheid case. Then they'll go ahead and they'll make a little bit of noise about it. And like everybody knows O.J. Simpson, right? That was a $40 million trial and it ran for like nine months. That was a big joke for the simple reason that they had to go ahead and take somebody and do an elaborate advertisement to the world about how our justice system works. That's all that was, just advertisement. And since then we have, what, 20 or 30 different crime shows on TV that advertise and tell you what's going on. But that's not the real world. It really doesn't happen. Maybe one case out of a thousand they might take and run a CSI on, but most of 99% of the time they just fluff it off. They don't have time or money to go ahead and chase it. So it all comes down to who you are, what you know, and what you put on your documents that come in the court. I can write on a document, one of my syntax documents, file it into court and put one line in there, I want hot coffee on my table. Now the courtroom door says no food or beverages. And yet, when I sit down at my table, I will have a, have a pot of hot coffee because I like to drink coffee. And I have a contract that I paid filing fees for to have hot coffee on my table, and that contract says that I'm going to have hot coffee, just to prove a point that that contract has jurisdiction in the court. <laughs> Try it. I guarantee you'll get it. You say, Your Honor, so what? Court's out of order. I don't have my hot coffee. I put it in my contract. <laughs> Bailiff, go get this man his hot coffee. It's part of his contract. Do it. You'll have fun. <laughs> So the, these planes, these planes are who you are. I mean, breaks it up and creates the illusion. Now, you can dissolve the planes and dissolve all the boxes by writing it in your document. Your lawsuit says there are no planes in this court. We are on a level playing field. We're going to use syntax language. There is no adverb verb illusions. And what we say is not 2 plus 2 equals 4. And you do a disclaimer of that. Or you do it, not a disclaimer, you do a claimer. A closure is the word, closure. All maritime law, under maritime law, all contracts must have closure. Well, when you're in a syntax level of mathematics, believe me, you have a closure. Our documents, because we've, we've had, through trial and error, and we're up to 2,200 federal lawsuits in the last 15 years, we are at a level where we take into consideration all these different points of closure that are necessary. When the Supreme Court of Hawaii wanted to sell 1.2 million acres of Hawaiian homelands without lodial title, as the king, I was responsible to stop it. So I took the 50-page document of closure that are necessary. When the Supreme Court of Hawaii wanted to sell 1.2 million acres of Hawaiian homelands without lodial title, as the king, I was responsible to stop it. So I took the 50-page document that the United States uh, Federal District Court in Honolulu, Hawaii, through the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court judges all went to Washington, D.C. to go up against John Roberts and the eight Supreme Court judges and argue why they had the right to sell 1.2 million acres of Hawaiian homelands. And I went ahead and I took the 50 pages and I syntaxed them and there wasn't one legal sentence in the entire 50 pages. It was just written in adverb verb. And it only took six sentences to articulate the fictitious conveyance of language and the damage that was caused because they don't have lodial, L-O-D-I-A-L. -L, location, D-I is original, A-L is contract. No location, original contract to sell Hawaiian land. And the post office doesn't have jurisdiction because they never had the correct sentence structure communication syntax. On any treaty trust or contract with the Hawaiian people since Cook landed there in 1789. That totally wiped out all claims that the United States government has against the Hawaiian people. And so with that information, the United States Supreme Court reprimanded the Supreme Court of Hawaii that you people are illiterate, you can't read and write, and you tried to perpetrate a fraud against us, go home. You don't have lodial title, you can't sell the land. So with six sentences and a two-day head start, I went in the back door because I got 
fast track to the Supreme Court of the United States because of who I am. As a plenipotentiary judge with mathematical syntax, and I defeated him in one page. And if I can do it to the Supreme Court, and they have standing to take, the, take a Supreme Court of another court and knock them down, then the language that sets precedence that syntax has jurisdiction over all fiction. And it does. So you guys have the power and the ability to go out there and use this technology successfully. Question. Why would the court system choose to recognise that? Why wouldn't they just dismiss it? Three plus three equals six, doesn't it? Don't know. You'd be, a, you'd be a fool to say it equals anything else but six because you would embarrass yourself. Okay. All right. They would have to confess that they can't read and write. If they can't read and write, guess what they did? They cheated on their high school exams. They never passed English. They cheated on their college exams. They never graduated from college. They never graduated from law school. They cheated on the civil service exam, which is misappropriation of their paychecks from the taxpayer, which is a Title 18, Section 641 through 664, misappropriations of taxpayers' money to extort money while engaged in criminal activity under Title 18, Section 1001, mail fraud under Title 18, Section 1341, and Chapter 15, which is the penalty for fictitious conveyance of language, Ch chap, uh, Title 15, Chapter 2B, Section 78FF carries a $25 million fine and 30 years in prison to fictitiously convey language to extort rights from a citizen. And I got your signed confession. You feel lucky today? <laughs> yeah. It's not, uh, folks, on the back of my business card is the whole procedure of how to prosecute judges and attorneys. It's already written there for you. <laughs> with, those, with those small points of, of law and the expanded definitions in my book and on my website, you can stop a charging elephant. Just take away his charge card. Question. Oh, go ahead. So, when you're talking about prosecuting judges, but if you go to a, say, a lower level, if it's just a, um, a corporation that you might be in dispute with, different levels, like for instance, like you might have arbitration, how far do you have to take it or how far can it go if you lose, say, the arbitration or you might lose a, a district court hearing because they might not understand, for instance, what you give some of these people, they don't understand, just think, this guy's, what is this guy on? You know, don't understand. Well, they're going to play the dummy up game with you, but don't worry about that. When you go to corporation, you're not in the law, in the courtroom. Now they have their public opinion, they lose their business, they go out of business, right? That costs money. So you sit down and you say, hey, Mr. Corporation, I just syntaxed your corporate charter, which made you a corporation. Guess what? Your charter is written in adverb verb, which means the Secretary of State who gave your corporation status can't read and write, and you don't have a corporation. You've now sold stock to the general public through the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is a lie and constitutes mail fraud through fraudulent conveyance of language goes back to a Title 15, Chapter 2B, Section 78 FF, and you got a $25 million fine and 30 years in prison. How much money do I need? I need you know, like a couple thousand dollar dispute here, but you're facing over here a criminal charge of $25 million, and I've got your signed confession that you messed all this up, that you've got fraudulent contracts that you've given to the public, and you've interfaced using federal currency while engaged in criminal activity. I have a signed confession for all of this. You feel lucky today? Now, let's negotiate a friendly settlement here. I'll let you live, you let me live. You think that their lawyer, who carries a $3 million blanket insurance policy, that they just hired to buffer them from the facts, is going to touch something with syntax? He can't even go to the judge. No judge will take the case because he becomes a co-conspirator to support the attorney, and the insurance company is going to cancel their, their insurance policies, which means they can't practice. They lose their job. Then the corporate is sitting there and he doesn't have any backup now. No attorney will touch the company because they're dirty and you've got to sign confession for it. The sign confession is the fact that their charter of how to do business is written in adverb verb and doesn't have standing. They don't have a trust to run their company. And the syntax proves that they lied 
from A to Z, president all the way down to the room sweeper. So could you, when you say like looking at it uh, from a case, when you say go to the charter of the, the company, could that work the same for their so terms and conditions? Exactly. Of their, so if you sign the it, terms and conditions agreeable to whatever it was, if those terms and conditions, once again, you syntax. Right. They okay, here's, here's, what, here's what he's saying. You get hired at a, at a company and it says these are the terms and conditions of your employment. And then they go ahead and a lawyer wrote it, and because you guys know syntax now, you can go ahead and correct that and say the lawyer lied to the company. You, can, you have the power to go ahead and syntax the fact that these are not a fair rules and regulations. But before you go back to the company and want to prosecute them for, for a lie, make sure you've got the solution. I didn't come here to Australia and say, your constitution is written in adverb verb and says nothing is a lie. I went ahead and I syntaxed it. I showed you this is a lie. It's got 200% fraud, and I wrote a brand new constitution. I gave you a replacement that was far better than the original to give you the guarantees of your faith, your religion, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of travel. Say again? Who did you give it to? It's published on the internet. You've had it here for nine months already. Everybody can download it off my website. You it's free. It <laughs> yeah, we'll give it. He's got a copy. Don't think that for a second that the courts didn't pull that thing off of the internet. My website gets beaten up hundreds of thousands of times by people all over Australia. I got caller ID. So, so, so if you're in dispute, you could sim text their terms and conditions that they're holding you, right. you know, to you would have to rewrite it in the truth and give it to them say this is what it should be. Right. In other words, it's proving that you have the intelligence to say this is a lie and I can prove it's a lie and this is what it should say. Now, I should be paid for the work that he did to write this. <laughs> you know what the second, second highest paid job outside of brain surgery is? Contract writing. People that can write in contract get paid $500 to $1,000 an hour in syntax. And you know what? 2012 is just around the corner, and we got 400 million people now studying. When we get 51% of the vote, this entire planet is going to have a new shift in dynamics of learning how to read and write in syntax, because sooner or later, not only is this planet going to unify its ability to communicate mathematically in syntax on contracts, but somebody's going to come knocking from another planet. And if we lie to them, they're going to throw a stone on us, the side of Texas, moving 50,000 miles an hour. Or we can have a truthful communications with another world, another planet, under commerce and be truthful, where they don't look at us as being a lying, cheating threat to their existence. You see? So there's, there is rules and regulations. Don't forget, there are no accidents. No matter where you go, there you are, and wherever you are, that's where you're supposed to be. It takes time. It's taken 22 years now to get to this seminar since Syntax was introduced to the world. And I'm the only guy standing up here and, and Steve over there now that are doing seminars. <coughs> Worldwide, we're the only two guys. And, but the videotapes and webcasts on, on, on Skype and go to meeting, and radio shows and TV shows are helping promote this on a global basis and making everybody aware. How, many, how long did it take for uh, you guys to find out that Michael Jackson died? 15 minutes after he was dead? I mean, YouTube, Google, Yahoo, AOL, I mean, the entire planet, 6 billion people knew about it 15 minutes after he died because he was popular. So the world is becoming very small. Everybody's cell phone rang and said, here's the news. Everybody that was on a computer, no matter what channel you were on, it bleeped in. No matter what channel you were watching on TV, it bleeped in. The whole world knew about it in 15 minutes. Well, syntax is going to be the same thing when it goes pop. One day, the TV is going to turn on, and no matter what channel you go to, all 200 channels are going to say, we're going to have a dynamic shift, and send you people are going to have to learn syntax because the whole world is shifting communications. We're going to have a one-world order of truth, 
I mean, correctness, one world money of correctness. The wars are going to stop. We're going to have balance and prosperity. And we can do it because we're going to be honest and correct. And then you guys can go to bed at night and not worry about somebody dropping a nuke on you tomorrow because you got correctness. And that's what we all want. That's what we're all learning. Question? I think we knew before Michael knew, actually. Say again? I think we knew before Michael knew that he died. Oh. <laughs> given, given the statements on, um, on contract and lodial title, where do we stand then with our title deeds for land ownership here, given the fact that this place was never invaded or treated? You've never had the correct sentence structure, communication, syntax, treaty on any land contract or mortgage in the history of this country's writing. So why the hell am I paying rates? <laughs> because if you don't, they will move you off the land and put somebody else there. That's not very nice. How do we fix that? Well, it's going to be fixed when enough people are educated and you vote in syntax. See, right now... We're not here to break the system. We're here to educate and correct. My, when I did this, when I originally said to my mom and dad, I'm going to go out in the world and I'm going to teach this, they said, don't complain about the government because you don't have anything to replace it with. You can't sell, tell somebody he's a liar if you don't have the truth in your hand. I couldn't call Judge Wazalewski a liar because I didn't know what his truth was or what my truth was, because I was misled. So I had to go out and spend 74,000 hours to get to where we are today to have a correct, correctness at a mathematical level so I could rewrite the United Nations Constitution, Australia's, New Zealand, America's, Hawaii, and anybody else in the world that wanted a corrected constitution. So in the short term, there's nothing we can do to, to get... Like we don't have the numbers. To, to your own personal piece of dirt. There's nothing that we can do at this moment. Well, you can to... study, be prepared, learn how to be a writer, because when this thing takes, play, takes place, the government's going to say, anybody that can read and write in syntax and do corrections and learn how to program a computer, we have immediate employment for you. Wages are probably going to start at about $100 an hour and up based on how, how much experience you have and the whole planet's going to get rewritten. They do not, uh, I keep getting emails, when is somebody going to write a program to rewrite the internet that fast, to go from adverb, verb, to syntax? Well, like I said, 900 variables for one word, two is 81,000, and so on. The computers can't do what my brain does. Stephen over there can do it. Russell Gould can do it, Greg Bartell can do it, and a, a hundred other guys up in the United States that I've been trained. They can all do it and do it efficiently. And when you guys learn it, it just opens up your whole world. You can see a lie. You have x-ray vision over everything. And it's a lot of fun. Then nobody can screw around with you anymore. The cops won't stop you. The courts don't want you in there. Every time I book a, have a court case down here that I'm supposed to testify in or defend, they cancel the hearing because I booked an airline ticket. <laughs> and when I was supposed to testify, what they did, yeah, because I'm involved in a, a bunch of cases down here. So what they do is they schedule the hearings when I'm out over the Pacific in a plane, can't even talk on the phone. They just say, you will be here in 24 hours while Dave's in the air, and we're going to hold the trial today. So when he gets here, it's all done doesn't change the evidence. Under the 72-hour rule after I land, I can go back in there and, and nail them for under syntax. It takes me just a couple of minutes to go ahead and syntax the entire lawsuit, drop an amicus curiae or a complaint in court, and say, you guys lied, I have your signed confession. Thanks for all the arrows in my quiver. Thank you. Next question, Gary. Just a few questions to satisfy my ignorance. Thank you, sure. David. Uh, number one. Um, the syntax language currently is in English. Will it be in any other languages? Yes. Uh, I, my website was written in French, German, Spanish, and Italian. Any and just recently, 
the, uh, our bandwidth was, suspend, was knocked down when we changed carriers, so I got to put it back up again. But okay. the, when we wrote the German, the German version, I had university professors from Germany just screaming at me, you can't do that. You disqualified all of our books in our universities and our constitution because you wrote that and you put it up there. What are we going to do with all of our, our, our school materials? I says, fix it. Okay, thank you. And the next question is, are you proposing syntax language to be uh, the one language for New World Order? Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with a New World Order that's correct where nobody can go to war anymore because you all know how to do things correctly. As long as you've got two, you're going to have controversy. So a New World Order is not a bad thing provided you have your freedoms to travel, your freedoms to communicate, to write, your faith, and in your, your, it's not going to be any guesswork as to where you stand in that faith because you're going to have a law that protects you with syntax. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Just one final part. Is this also the reason why the Masons also want to continue with syntax language as well? Are they in line with the New World Order as well? Yes, they're the ones who have been pulling the strings on the New World Order for 8,500 years. Okay. Now, Having the, the Masonic teachings is no more, no different than any of the religions in the world. They teach you the difference between good and evil, how to manage people. Because for every 97 followers, you've got three chiefs. It's always 3% manages 97%. That ratio hasn't changed since the caveman. Okay. And the cream always floats to the top. And you mentioned good and evil um, on the lower levels, but on the high levels... You talk about the same good and evil as well on the very the, high level? The syntax separates the wheat from the chaff. Yes. There isn't anybody anywhere on this planet today, I don't care how high up in the Illuminati they are, that I can't prove they lied. And I don't have any restrictions as to how high up I go. You know, the Supreme Court of Australia had their Supreme Court judge put on the world court at The Hague. Guess who pulled him off The Hague? I did. I filed a lawsuit against him for apartheid against the Origines. And he was kicked out of The Hague because he didn't protect the people he was supposed to in his own country. And I had a signed confession, and that's why they kicked him out of The Hague. And that's why Queen Elizabeth pulled my passport here and had me arrested when I set foot in Australia. So, in retaliation, I took the Magna Carta and I syntaxed it. It's written in adverb verb and says nothing. Did you know in World War II, Hitler sent, sent 240 stormtroopers over to destroy the Magna Carta? And 340 crack British troops defeated them. Several hundred men died in that battle. And it was to destroy the Magna Carta. Both sides thought that this was, if we can destroy the Magna Carta, we'll destroy the English Empire. In the English world, well, when I syntaxed it, it was destroyed. It was never there. 1215, written in adverb verb by Cromwell. Never said anything in the first place. And what they did is they promoted this lie throughout history. We wrote the Declaration of Independence. Thou was an adverb making declare. D meaning no, Clara means speaks, shun his contract. No spoken contract of independence. In, no, D, no, pen, write, ants, contract. No, no, write contract, no, no, speak contract. <laughs> and then they wrote it, we the people. Pronoun, adverb, verb. You can be a pronoun as a we or a verb as a people. That's why we have a verb court, a verb fact, and a verb law because you're verb people. And when you syntax the Constitution of the United States, it said nothing. That's where I wrote a new Constitution and published it. They still can't take their lie and shove it down our throats because we've proved the lie, we've proved the fact. And when you put them both together, take their lie and shove it down our throats because we've proved the lie, we've proved the fact. And when you put them both together, choose. Choice. Matrix. This program is the movie Matrix. A, B, and C. One, two, and three Matrix. This is the entire program of Matrix. It is the machine of government. The I'm Neil fighting for, the, for my existence as a human. And what is the virus? 
that des destroys both the machine and the people. The virus was the illusion of communications. And syntax destroyed. And how did, how did Neil destroy the virus? He says, okay, virus. Neil represents 3 plus 3 equals 6. And Smith had an infinity amount of Smiths, which was the infinity amount of numbers that could be wrong around 3 plus 3 equals 6. And he says, okay, I surrender. Take me. What's the first thing the, the virus of wrong tries to do is rewrite correctness. And every time he tries to do it, it says, well, 3 plus 3 doesn't equal 7. That's out. 8, that's out. 9, that's out. And inadvertently, you watch it take place in the movie, boom, all the virus is destroyed because it uses up all its energy to prove a lie, which you can't do. And when it's done, the contract was, I can live as a human because I'm correct, and the machine can operate because it's correct, because we need the machine, and the man has to service the machine, the machine has to service the man. Well, it looks like everyone's back. All right, we're going we're gonna to get started now, folks. Hope everyone had a good lunch. I had a cup of coffee. Way to go. All right, we're going to go through the parts of speech. There's only 10 of them. And when you guys went to school, you probably were 10 years old, and you studied about prepositional phrases. Well, when you were 10 years old, 11, 12, you were going through puberty. Your hormones made you a complete mess. And after you got done with puberty, the only thing you could think about was sex, boys and girls, you know. And so whatever you learned during puberty was totally, like, thrown out the door. And the rules and regulations they gave, gave you, you probably weren't paying much attention. You didn't think your parents loved you. And you were just, just a mess. So by the time you, you got into the reality of uh, teenagers, again, you were a batch of hormones and uh, misinformation. And then when you finally got out of high school and you were 18 years old, you didn't care much about school. It was just sex. And whatever, to get the better the sex, we, uh, uh, you know, according to Freud, uh, everything is predicated on sex and you've got to have better cars, better clothes, better makeup, better hair, you know, to in incorporate better sex. So you really didn't care much about the world, and that's why you're 40 years old, you wake up one morning and say, we're not in Kansas, Toto, and you want to come here and learn about why the whole world is screwed up. So we went ahead, and uh, I was the same way, but uh, I overcame that. And uh, these are the parts of speech. Now, the adverb is used more in language worldwide than any other syntax of communications. Now, the adverb is a modifier. Also remember a vowel and two consonants? The adverb operation of syntax is a no contract issue because you're modifying the, the condition of a fact. If you're going to modify something, that's perjury because it's no longer the original fact. And now the adverb creates the prejudice of your limited education or your limited knowledge to go ahead and sell your opinion or prejudice to another individual by modifying the condition of the fact in front of you. When you take a fact and you modify it with an adverb, it becomes what's called a gerund verb, which means a noun used as a verb. They explain it to you, but it's still a lie. Then they go ahead and they tell you when you went and took sentence diagramming that you need a subject. Well, SUB means no, inject is contract. Well, you want to create a no contract in a sentence? It goes back to a math problem. The math problem is 3 times 3 times 3 equals 27, right? So if I have a fact times a fact times a fact, I'm going to get a fact. But if I do 3 times 3 times 3 times 0 equals 0. Or if I divide, it's still going to be 0. Because a fact times a fact times a fact times a lie equals a lie. Here's your math interface on add, subtract, multiply, uh, adding, uh, multiplying, dividing as to if you're going to be correct, you're going to be correct all the time. You can have a sentence with a, let's say, 30 prepositional phrases. 
completely done correctly, and take the word for out instead of for the witness's knowledge, the witness's knowledge, and then go ahead and write, write 29 prepositions in the correct order in the sentence, but because you dropped the first four, now you've got an adverb, adjective, pronoun all the way to the end of the sentence, and you've lost all prepositional phrases because you committed a lie to start the sentence, therefore you've lost everything. So you can't be, you can't make any mistakes in this technology. The math will not support it. And we use the math to go and check it frontwards and backwards. When you write a sentence backwards, all the prepositions, we're going to get that when you do sentence structuring, all the sentences backwards, you have to use the opposite prepositions. Every sentence we write starts with a preposition for. You have two verbs, is and are, simple enough. And the word that follows the verb is the word with. My entire book, my website, every document, every lawsuit I ever wrote follows these same rules. And we'll expand upon the sentence later after I explain this. But these, these positions of where these prepositions and articles take place are very unique because of the every sentence is in a complete court hearing. You've got to follow the rules in every sentence. You can't violate them. You do. You make one mistake in a whole entire document, you made a presumption before the fact it proves you don't know what you're doing. That it was an accident or you don't pay attention to the accuracy of who you are and what you're doing. So we're, we're striving that don't do something by yourself. Always work as a team. I don't care, the more people you got in your team, the better. Because then you got more years of experience to check. That's why law firms do not operate where you have a lawyer working alone. He always has five or ten other lawyers reading and signing his papers to say he did it right and absolutely avoided a fact at all costs. Because if you create a fact and you're a barrister or a lawyer or an attorney, you will be disbarred. And that includes, includes judges. Remember, no law or fact shall be tried. And they have to stay within the confinements of nothing. Otherwise, they don't have lodial title. They don't have constitution and now they've committed perjury through trespassing on a fact which they don't have title to. That's why they have to go ahead and break the law 24-7. Now the adverb modifies an adverb modifies an adverb. The adverb then can modify a verb. The adverb can modify an, modifies an adjective and the adjective modifies a pronoun which is connected by an adverb after it. The only word that can follow a pronoun is an adverb or a period. The, when you take two nouns and you put them together, black pen, black is a noun, or black is a fact, pen is a fact. But black colors the pen. Therefore, the black now becomes an opinion. Is this a charcoal pen, an ebony pen, or a black pen? See, I can have there's 1,200 shades of black. So what shade is it? And even though this is black, my shirt is a just a little bit different color black. So it's subjective interpretation as to what it means, so therefore it's an opinion. Like he has a red shirt on. Trying to explain color red to a blind person that's never seen color. Impossible. So your opinion of an adjective to color something or to modify something is impossible. Therefore, your opinion, presumption, modification, has no bearing with the facts of what you're trying to do. So in the adverb, like we do the United States of America, United States of, all right, excuse me. I ahead of myself here. The United States of America. So you've got the you got the preposition of and the article the, but when you separate them, they both become adverbs. The adverb modifies the adjective. The adjective modifies the pronoun. The pronoun is connected by the adverb, which then modifies the dangling participle verb America. I was pres President Clinton's counsel for the sex trial. That's why it was sealed. What is sex? What is is? Then Bill Clinton says to the judge, I just showed the American people a verb is and a noun is. Would you like me to show them another verb and another noun? Let's discuss syntax publicly on CNN. 
and tell the world that the syntax of all communications is a lie. Well, no further questions, Mr. President. This court stands adjourned. Then he says, I got to go in front of Congress and I got to talk. And Congress, we're not allowed to take the, my attorneys in, even though he is an attorney, he's not allowed to take attorneys in with him and he has to give private consultation to these people. Now there's a movie called A Few Good Men with Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson. Some of you have seen it. You want the truth, I'll tell you the truth, but you can't handle the truth. And that's what Bill Clinton does. He walks into Congress and he says, before we get started, I'm going to explain things to you. And he makes that statement and then he holds up a $1 bill and he explains that America is a dangling participle verb on the money. Under mail fraud, Title 18, Section 1001, is fraudulent conveyance of language which activates mail fraud banking. Title 18, Section 1341 carries a 30-year prison sentence and a $1 million fine. But the penalty for fictitious conveyance is Title 15, Chapter 2B, Section 78, FF, $25 million fine and 30 years in prison for every dollar published in U.S. currency. He says, I have to address the world at my union address. And I have to tell the world that America is a verb on the money and disqualify all U.S. currency worldwide. Or we can seal my case now. All those in favor of sealing the case, say aye. All the hands go up, he walks out, and no newspaper, magazine, TV, or radio stations makes any announcement about Bill Clinton's impeachment from that day forward. Who runs for president of the United States? Hillary Clinton. No one in America talks about Bill Clinton's impeachment. No foreign government talks about Hillary, uh, I mean Bill Clinton's impeachment. Not even North Korea. For all the noise you heard on the news about North Korea and the United States, not one word about that. Who becomes Secretary of State? Hillary Clinton. She goes to Obama and says, hey, how about if I call the paparazzis in here and I do a news conference on America being a dangling participle verb? She becomes Secretary of State. Some of you know about the fact that Bill Clinton went to North Korea and got the two reporters who were held in prison for four years out. And when he was in Honolulu, Hawaii, he was on the Tonight Show, and the question was, how did you get the two reporters out of North Korea? I used the David Wynn Miller syntax. He was going to syntax the North Korean money publicly and disqualify all North Korean currency. Or give me back the two reporters. End of story. <laughs> nah. You see, so knowledge used by the right individual at the right time will create the amount of pressure it's called damage control. And so this is how, some, uh, how syntax has the power to make changes and cause, cause things to be influenced. Now the verb is a condition of, th is, is your action. Now the adverb can modify the verb, and the verb, if it stands alone, is an R. Because you use prepositional phrase, prepositional phrase, verb. Prepositional phrase, prepositional phrase. Because the verb stands alone, it doesn't become a pronoun because you are making a declaration, not a declaration, you're making a claim on your document that says verb is the thinking, con the condition is a singular, R is plural, and you take jurisdiction for the verb is an R. Because you define it, it is now what it is on the contract and no one can change it. If you do not take that position, it becomes a pronoun. Is an R, is is used for the is. It's a prepositional phrase. Therefore, is is a noun. The is, adverb, verb. Now it's a verb. Uh, for the is is, for is the pronoun, is is an adverb. I mean, for the is is. For would be a pronoun. The would be an adverb. The first is would become an adjective, and the second is would become a pronoun. You see, I can change the value of every, any word I want based on where I place it and knowing what the sy value of syntax is. So I just showed you an adjective verb, a pronoun verb, a verb verb, and a noun verb. Four different conditions of state. When I, when I did a, a sentence, I'll write it over here. The, the is for the, the. I got three PhDs in Atlanta University in my seminar. And they stand up and say, that doesn't mean anything. 
That's nonsense. I'm going, well, let's put a syntax to it. We've got a pronoun modified, connected by the adverb, which modifies the adjective, which modifies the pronoun, which is connected by the adverb, which now modifies the dangling participle verb is, I mean the. So I've got a pronoun the, I've got an adverb the, a second adverb the, and a verb the. Three different syntax definitions. And I can go to a dictionary and prove that those words are found with those syntaxes in that sentence. It's not an exercise that the the is for the the. It's an exercise that I have four definitions in every dictionary of the word, world that says there's a syntax definition for a pronoun the, an adverb the, a verb the. If I want to put another one here, it would be an adverb, adjective, pronoun, and make another adjective pronoun. And I take four conditions of the and show you the definition in the dictionary. And the PhDs in English now said collectively, we have PhDs in stupidity because you have the power through syntax to identify every word in the world with all parts of speech. And you can prove it mathematically, and you know what it means. And they never knew how to do that. 28, 29, and 30 years, respectively, as teachers, never once applying syntax to their classes, only teaching an adverb verb dialect. The last that, you said it's a verb? Yeah, it's a dangling participle. It's been modified by the adverb the, which now makes this one a, a, a verb. Verb is an action word. No. If I say for the the, it's a preposition article noun. I just made it a, 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 an article, and I just made it a noun, standing next to each other. Yes, it is. It's a dangling participle verb. You see, this mathematical procedure is an absolute in communication skills. These, these are the only ways these things can be found. <laughs> so, question, David. Because of the ambiguity in the language that we have and the modification, you can have uh, a series of phrases and the syntax that's applied can be different depending on the volition of the person that's doing it and the interpretation that they make. And then they would need to be consistent with that interpretation through the balance of the document. So for example, if I were to take that, the the is for the the, and I said that that was a pronoun, adverb, adverb, then I can have a pronoun. Adjective, pronoun, adverb? No, it wouldn't be mathematically sound. So what you've got to do is make sure you've got the sequence correct. So if we started from the back, of the sentence, we can say the, the, the is the one, two. Right, now this is what he's explaining. Where do you sign your documents? On the bottom, correct? Because they have jurisdiction for everything in front of and above. Everything is in backwards. Authorization runs backwards. The first word in the sentence does not have jurisdiction in the sentence. It's the last word. The only thing that appears in front of the last word is the, the. And then you've got to go to the next sentence, next word. And you've got an adverb, verb. So therefore, this has to be a pronoun. The pronoun is modified by the adjective. The adjective is connected by the adverb, which then connects to the pronoun in front of it. Because there's no prepositional phrase to certify the the. I mean, <laughs> the word the to start the sentence. If I said for the the, then it would be a five, six, seven, and this would become a two, and then a five, six, seven again. We'd have two prepositional phrases, but this is the, this is the danger of dropping one word and not you, starting your sentence with a prepositional phrase. Once you drop the, the prepositional phrase, you create an illusion. And like I said up here with math, a lie times any truth is still a lie. And that's what happens down here. What do we have here? We have a, a pen. In order for you and I to communicate, we first have to have an object that we both understand. We assign it an alphabet, the English alphabet. Could be the Russian or any other alphabet, OK? But we, you and I choose English. 26 letters, we're going to spell this P-E-N. If you and I sign a private contract and it's spelled C-U-P, it's between you and I, and this is now a C-U-P, not a P-E-N. So we agree on what the. The, the alphabet is, how to spell it, now we have to give it an, a, a definition. What are the terms? The term is that it's going to be used for writing. 
and that's going to be what the definition is on our contract. However, if I take the pen and I make a fist around it, it's now a stabbing tool, a concealed weapon, and I'll be arrested for carrying a concealed weapon. It's how you use something which makes a determination as to what the definition of it is. But according to our communications, this is going to be a pen, and so we have a contract of this object. Now, who owns it? Is it for your pen, for her pen, for my pen, for his pen? If I change the ownership of Lodio, I'm going to change the definition of where this belongs. So how do I establish this to be a fact? We have the alphabet, how to spell it, what the object looks like under descriptive definition, who owns it, and now we have a fact, and we call that a positional Lodial fact phrase. So that every word has 900 definitions as a fact. And if we have 900 definitions, 900 ways to certify this to be the fact of ownership, then we have a correct phrase. When you put correct phrases together, then you get into the multiples of order of operations of sentence structure, 900 times 900 times 900 times 900 times 900, and you get into 5.4 uh, gigabytes or billion just with, with six words. And when you're talking that kind of variables on one sentence, and you go with a seventh word or an eighth word or ninth word, now you're into terabytes of information for just one sentence. Huh? Well, in our technology, it's accurate to the terabyte level. Every sentence has a terabyte of information in it, and it's accurate to that level. And that's where the judges can't get around that. So that's, that speaks, see this course is written on a 29 reading level, folks. High school is 12. Bachelor degree is 16. Graduate is 18. PhD is 20. And we're writing and reading at a 29 reading level. That's why you guys get headaches and you get, to, you get just so, so wrapped around this thing. Those of you that quit school and never, never went to school or home studied, whatever, you weren't dumbed down. You don't have that handicap that everyone else had, and you have a great, that's why you failed English, because they couldn't dumb you down. When I was, when I was uh, 10, 11 years old, I went to an Amish Quaker in midnight school. Had an English teacher, was a Quaker. And she taught prepositional phrases. When I went back to the English schools in Milwaukee, this was in Indiana, in America, in a farming community, and then when I went back to the English schools, they said I was mentally retarded because I couldn't read and write an adverb verb and I had I only wrote in prepositional phrases. So they put me in special reading choruses trying to dumb me down to an adverb verb scenario. And I knew how to break this stuff down when I was 11 years old and tear, tear it apart. And I said, I won't, I won't create a lie. I won't participate the way you guys wanted to. I went through, through high school with honors. I was on the honor roll. I went through 17 years of college and had A's and B's while working. And I wasn't going to take a, a backseat to anything. And then last year in September, I took a first year uh, business law 101 with three PhDs and all the information I know as a judge. Well, by the third week of school, it was divulged that I was a United States Federal District Court judge. They figured that out from the answers I was given in class, which were above even the teacher's communication skills. <laughs> and when I wrote my first thesis paper on syntax, the teacher said he never even heard the word syntax, and he was the dean of the business college for 29 years. I'm going, how do you be 55 years old and dean of a college and don't even know what the word syntax means? What does that say about America's teachers? That was really sad. I had to stay after class for an hour and teach this guy about syntax. And then when I send Texas lesson program, he goes, oh my God, he says, I'm lying to the students. I can't do my job anymore. I got to make a living. He says, well, I guess you got to come to court and uh, come to class every day and lie to us. Yes. Now, on the side of being correct, we need to fix the car is for the driving. So that should be a one, two, one, two, one, two. Okay. Yep, that's and, and right. One, two, one, two, one, two. And what we're trying to demonstrate is that the last the word driving the, ing words are verbs. The, the the is for the the. 
is also a one two one two one two. It could also be a one three four one three four one two. Or it could be a four one one two one two. Adverbs modify adverbs. See, when you're dealing with an illusion, the subjective interpretation of where you put value or the weight of that word, where you put the emphasis on that word, is going to make a determination how it is. That's why Bill Clinton, when he said, what is, is, he paused. When he said, what is, he did adverb, verb. Or he did pronoun, ver adverb, and then he said, is, with emphasis, which means I'm making it a fact. Because he's saying the definition of is in the dictionary is a noun because it determines the condition of state of the definition. And so he was using it actually under subjective interpretation as a verb, adverb, and as a noun. And the judge didn't want to get into a syntax discussion about breaking down and getting into a syntax argument of how many times or how many ways the, verb, uh, the word is could be defined and then prove through subjective interpretation what the value of that word is, he had to vacate the case. And Bill Clinton gets away with a demur because he knows, because Clinton was a student of mine for two years going into the trial. That's why I was hired as his counsel. And when it came time to go in front of Congress, it was real easy, just hold up a dollar bill, disqualify currency in 150 countries, and when Hillary got to be Secretary of State, hey, Obama, you just inherited 11% unemployment in the United States in a world in a depression. Try doing it without money. <laughs> Do the math. Right? Squeaky wheel gets the oil. Okay. <laughs> Going back to... <laughs> I'd suggest, well, you guys can do the math on that, okay? Adjective, <coughs> coloring. Adjective always modifies the pronoun. Adverbs modify the adjective, which modifies the pronoun. And an adverb can make several. Now, if I'm going to go ahead and say the David Wynn Miller uh, syntax, my the would be an adverb, David would be an adjective, Wynn would be an adjective, Miller would be an adjective, syntax would be a pronoun. That's where you put a string of names together. Corporations may have five or six names in there. Law firms might have five or six names. That's where you're going to have a bunch of adjectives in front of the last one would be in a pronoun. Where's my prepositional phrase to certify the value of any word? As long as you're going to have a condition of color, it doesn't exist because it's an opinion. Now, the pronoun is any word that stands alone. Pen is a pronoun because there's no contract to make a determination as to what this means. If I ask you for a, a pen, you're going to give me an object, pull out a ballpoint pen. However, you ask me for a penny, and because you speak Maury, I'm going to reach my pocket and pull out a penny, which is coinage. Does 2 plus 2 equal 4? See, he's saying pen to me, but I'm hearing penny, just like 2, T-O, or T-O-O, or T-W-O. So you've got to be able to communicate with somebody and have a contract to do so. That's why so it is written, so it shall be done, because the oral communications are not what you think they are. The position, as I explained before, is the terms of what your contract is. And once you have your terms of your contract established, we then can have the load of your ownership, which is original. And with these two together, we now have a fact. And once we have a fact, it will become the positional load of your fact phrase. And then you have pastime. Pastime would be words that end in ed or the, or the adverb from or the prepositional phrase from. Either way, you are removed from now time. There is no such thing as the past or the future. There is only now time. You will always be in now time. When you correct the Bible, the Quran, the uh, Masonic codes, you have to translate it to now time because this is where you're going to be living and working in working with this technology. The future is a crapshoot. Hasn't happened yet. We'll figure that out when we get there. So it doesn't happen. And the conjunction is and and or. And again, and and or you have to define. It's not a presumption. 
The word and by itself is not a conjunction because it doesn't attach to anything. It's a pronoun. Or is the same thing. It's a pronoun unless you take jurisdiction for it. Every word that you use on your papers, you must define those. Do you want to and an or as a conjunction and an is and an are as a verb? You have to separate a definition under your abbreviations and say these words mean these things and put it right up there at the beginning of the document. That way a judge can't say that's going to be used for the and. If I say for the and, now you've made a noun out of it. Or the and. Does an adverb making and a verb. I change it again. Take jurisdiction for how you use it. Okay. Not for storyline. We'll go back to this now. Okay. Okay, now, this is a sentence, but I'm writing the sentence in the form of a graph. Because your mind is a mathematical configuration, a graph is very easy for you to comprehend. So, we're going to say, for the witness, well, we won't use the witness, we use the word claimant. Whenever you start a sentence, write a contract, make any kind of, of claim, you also you have to say you have knowledge about what you are doing. There, now it won't move. <laughs> of the facts. Is and are equals your thinking capacity. with the claim. Now, yeah, Dave. the claim, you've got, this is a cause. This is an effect. Thinking is your action. This is your possessive. Now, what is the claim? You have two things. You have a plus and you have a minus. Flank, claim, this is going to be a term. These are going to be the terms, not a definition, because definition, DE, means no fine contract. Because everything was written in adverb verb, the definitions in all dictionaries are written in adverb verb. So we went to the word terms. So once you establish the claim, you have to establish is that a positive claim or a negative claim. And then you have to go ahead with the contract. And what this is going to be is going to be the correct sentence, structure, communication, syntax, language, contract. And then the last thing is going to be by the author. Now, author, authority, authentic, authorization, first two letters, AU, which is a symbol for gold on a periodic table, AU. And if you have a sign, simulation, signature, it's a simulation, SI. That's why they always tell you put your signature down, write it in cursive, because it's a simulation. SI. That's why they always tell you, you put your signature down, write it in cursive, because now you've, you're signing a simulation to an adverb verb contract, and you're participating in the fraud by your own simulation. Now, I don't know if you guys have to sign your tax forms here in Australia, but isn't it in a box, just like ours are in the United States? Yeah. So you're the only, this is, the, the taxation program worldwide is you have to give them something, an assigned receipt that says you're giving it to them, but they don't give you a receipt back. 
or any evidence that you paid. They just kind of leave you alone if you participate. <laughs> so I'm telling everybody, for those that are government agents, if you're here, that pay your taxes with the correct sentence structure, communication, syntax. And pay your taxes because you're not smart enough not to. And then the IRS came back to me and says, you're a tax protester. You're telling everybody to pay your taxes with the correct sentence structure, communication, syntax. I'm going, yeah, and how does that make me a protester? He says, because we don't have any correct sentence structure. Says, oh, you just confessed to that you have a lie. And I'm telling you to be correct, and you're telling, confessing to me that you're a liar. That you're extorting money through a lie. And this is right? Well, you're not going to arrest us, are you? <laughs> so... Now, the reason we bring this up, we start every sentence with four because we found that it was the strongest preposition to start a sentence because it takes you into an argument or takes you into the facts. Of was then used as the, for of, the effect. We only have two prepositional phrases in front of the verb. And is and are your verbs. I write so fast I don't put the words in. Okay, with the claim, after you have a, a, an action of thinking, you have to have a possession. Over here, when you have knowledge, you're human beings. You have a brain. You see things. You witness. And you store information in your brain, just like the computer holds it. But until you hit the execution button to take the information out and move it into sense, you're claiming one thing in your computer. Your brain functions on the same way. You store information from your world experiences, and then you move it through thinking, and you make a claim, which is possessive of that one of all this knowledge that you've stored up in your head. Then you have to define whether or not that claim, the possessive knowledge that you've claimed, is a plus or minus. Or are you looking for a reward or a damage? Then you have to define how that contract is going to be argued or put to what these terms are. And that's where the, the whole program comes in, where you're creating this contract. And then somebody has to take responsibility for that sentence. So if you write it backwards, and when you write backwards, this here becomes, these are all separate facts. These stay the same. For the author of the contract, or correct sentence structure, communication, syntax, language, contract, then you would bring your is down with the terms, plus or minus, of the claim with the facts by the claimant's knowledge. Backwards, it says the same thing. And I, I'm, using, I'm using the opposite prepositions for each one of these words, but each one of these stay the same. With the contract by the author, or with the author by the contract. For the writing of the checks, for the driving of the car, for the car of the driving. For the checks by the, by the author. See, frontwards and backwards, there are conditions which are paired, cause and effect, that always stay together. So when you read the sentence backwards, you keep these things together. Now, leaving it as it is, Technically, you can move any of these nouns. These are your nouns. Author, contract, terms, claim, fact, and claimant's knowledge. You can put those any place, move all the terms around, and the sentence will still mean the same thing. So there are six different ways you can write the sentence forwards, and six different ways you can write it backwards, and it will still say the same thing. If you can't obstruct the meaning of something, it is what it is. And that's the unique thing that I can prove when I write my lawsuits. And if you can write the sentence backwards and it means the same thing as you wrote it frontwards, now you know you did it correctly. David, before you go, if I can ask a question, just a couple of people asked me a couple of different things and you might be able to enlighten them. Sure. They're wondering how you can make the claims that you make regarding the Universal Postal Union. Sure. And if they were going to research that, where they would look to find the information that you have that the Universal Postal Union controls the planet? Oh, 
Universal Postal Union was established in 1873 by using a two cent postage stamp. All 250 countries treated with the, United, with the Universal Postal Union burned Switzerland to, uh, to transport vessels between point, excuse me, transport letters between point A and point B. But when they wrote the treaty up, it was to transport vessels. Everybody in this room is a vessel. All cargo was a vessel. Everything that moved then under a two cent postage stamp fell under this jurisdiction. Now, think about 1873. How efficient were we at moving things around? Well, we had a steam was just first coming in, so transportation was highly limited. The amount of commerce that was going to flow between one country and the other was very limited. And all they had to do was wait for one year until everybody in the planet signed up. As soon as everybody was under contract, jack up the rates. Now that they gave them jurisdiction, they were in charge of vessels. All, all vessels have to move under commerce, and all commerce is called script, better known as money. In order to get the money, paper money, you have to file bankruptcy, give up your gold, your silver, and take paper. Paper was more convenient to move back and forth. Or have contracts, better known as checks, money orders, which were all controlled by the post office. So this is how they got their fingers into every pie on the planet and became the central bank through the post office controls all banking. Benjamin Franklin of the United States, when the Continental Congress got together, Ben was a French attorney working for the English crown to capture America. 1775, he sits back and says, hey, I'll be responsible for contracts and script. He writes the contracts in adverb verb, and he takes control of the money. Walks the United States into a bankruptcy and turns it over back to England. Yeah, we win the war, but we lose it on paper. And we're in bankruptcy with England for 210 years, and they're in control. If you go to the upu.com website, you'll have about 80 pages of reading on the history of the Universal Postal Union, and it'll explain how they came about. And it's all public record. Wikipedia is another one where you can go on to and look up things. You can get the, if, well, you guys wouldn't have the privilege, but I got to have the privilege of going into the fifth basement below the Pennsylvania Historical, li law, law, uh, historical Library and getting into archive books that were two, three hundred years old in controlled environments and having the power to syntax all the old two, three hundred year old scripts and then put the missing words in to tell me secrets that were, nobody knew about. And I accumulate all this information, whether it be postal, congressional, government, metallurgy, science, nuclear. I study all that stuff. I'm an information junkie and I cross reference things. When I get into seminars, I meet people, and I got people that are in all these different branches of government worldwide. And every now and then, somebody finds a little secret out, and they call me up and say, hey, Dave, I know the secret. What does it mean? And we exchange information. And I go someplace else, and I get another piece of information, another piece of information, another piece. Collectively, you create a storyline of who's in charge and what's happening. There's one thing. Liars figure, but figures don't lie. And the mathematical interface unlocks this. And when I can write the sentence frontwards and backwards, and it shows the absolute proof of what's happening. And it's the same worldwide. I have my proof. Somebody says, show me the law that says a vowel in two consonants means no contract. Look up every word in the English language. It'll prove itself. It isn't where there's a written law to that effect. It's just that the word no is a negative condition of state without, under, UN, or DE, or AB, all your prefixes, all negative conditions of state. If you have anything that is negative, you can't create it. It's a negative contract. If you put no in front of any word that's a fact, why would you put no in front of a fact? It's a no fact. Therefore, you have a no person. What is a no person? Every law in America and here in Australia says no person shall. <laughs> no is an adverb making person to be a verb and shall is an adverb in future time, which means you don't exist in now time and at the same time they all called you guys no persons. 
which means you're not corporations. Because what do you have to have to have a corporation? Two or more people in a quantum contract on a single piece of paper. And if it's written in adverb verb, you don't have a contract, therefore you're not a person. You're all individual sovereigns. Because there's no contract to tie you with anything except your presumptuous or illusionary opinion. And if you are not a fact and you are a sovereign, a sovereign means one. One is not corporate and one is a new, new person in the middle of the ocean, part of the food chain. Have fun trying to get to the grocery store to buy your groceries before you get eaten by the sharks. And the sharks are everywhere. Because if you're weak, society says that the strong will always harvest the weak and the 3% will always manage the 97% because they don't have their weaker in mind than the 3% that are in control. Can I get you to clarify that, that statement of not a person shell? Are you, tr uh, shell, are you trying to say that such a contract or such a command, whether it be a, an act or a law, it's talking about something other than a sovereign, something other than a human being. It's specifically discussing a dead entity. So the law is for dead entity. Or the Aren't you a dead entity on your, on your driver's license? Aren't you capitalized as a nom de guerre? Um, well, I have no proof of that. I only know what I've been told, and I have done some research to find out whether capital letters means that there's a dead entity. I haven't found anywhere written where to co a confirmation of that. Go down to your local cemetery. Every name on the tombstones is capitalized. Ask the cemetery uh, or go to a funeral home and ask the funeral home director, what does it mean to be capitalized? He says you're a dead person. Uh, can, can you give me something other than the, the, the if you're cemetery? a dead person, you're a no person. And if you're a no person, you have constitutional rights. Is that written anywhere that capital equals a dead entity? Yeah. Rom de Guerre. Okay. Look up, look up uh, under Styles Manual, capitalized names, Thank dead you. corporations. Uh, chapter one, title one, paragraph one of the United States of all maritime codes, all vessels must have capitalized names. First rule of contract is closure. You must give closure for your contract. And what is closure? It's the least common denominator of one. You can only have one jurisdiction, one term of communications between two people. You can't have two ideas. That's closure. And once you have closure and two people agree on closure, you have contract of one. You see, five plus five equals nine. I thought I'd get you on that one too. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. My, I write too fast sometimes. Dead corporation. Which is paper? Which is person? Okay. Okay. Mathematics. Better known as the quatrahedron. Smallest of all geometrical shapes has a four-sided pyramid, correct? The object within the center of that pyramid is point number five. If you take two objects with five, with one, two, three, four, five, two objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Five plus five equals nine, better known as tetrahedron or the Star of David. And who's in charge of contract and banking? The Jewish religion who uses Star of David as their symbol, which is contract. I offered, you accept it, we have a compliance of one tetrahedron with nine points of reference. Because two objects can't occupy the same place at the same time, therefore when a husband and a wife get married, they become one person under the law, right? And no matter what happens to one, the other one gets it. <laughs> I did? Are you married? <laughs> Everybody that's married is laughing. <laughs> I got it. Yeah, that's on the record. 
Okay, what's your, what's your question? The question is, how do you get 5 plus 5 equal 9? With I a, just explained it to you. With a it's double. geometry. Two objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. What is a piece of paper? It's corporate. Isn't there only one sheet of paper in my hand? Yes, you're holding a piece of paper. Okay. And the two people that came together on this are called the United, or three people, I got three witnesses on here called the United States. These right. three people joined together on one sheet of paper for one idea. Right. Their three ideas form one contract. Right. It's one contract, not three contracts, but one. It's unities. It's the okay. United States of the claim of the life. It's a simple enough concept. And, and because the claim of the life has a stamp, endorsed, a, name, a flag, to advertise the terms of the contract under law of the flag, an endorsement on the back of the document becomes a negotiable instrument, and the, the terminology written here in four paragraphs, or four sentences, articulate in now time, prepositional phrase, order of operations, that this individual, Stephen, knows how to read and write in syntax, identifies himself to be a fact, his mother and father to be a fact, who created him as a fact, mm -hmm. and he has two witnesses who also have claims to the life, which are facts, to certify and notarize this document that it is a fact. Right. And only a fact can notify a fact. And any time you have three people that don't have a claim of the life and you want to make one, A, B, certify C. Two always certify one. That rule is as old as writing. And A, C certifies B and B, C certify A. And that's how you get to have a claim of the life through spontaneous combustion. And what have, that has to do with a five plus five equal nine. It has to do with the fact that we are several people coming together on a contract, but it is one contract, not two contracts. There is a continuance of evidence better known as corporation. This is a corporation entity now. Now, just you're looking for further evidence of you being dead? There you Once, go. yes. All well, the proof you need's in there. Oh, the phone book. The five plus five equal nine. <laughs> hmm. Well, I won't be no, sleeping no, no. tonight. The, uh... hmm. See, you're going over here like this, and you're going down here, which is this. When the two of them come together, they overlay each other. And you have, you have one point here and one point here, which is the center of the cube, or the mass. And when you put them together, they both occupy the same space, creating one. That's how the government takes marriage and turns it into one for taxation purposes that a husband and a wife are married. Boyfriend and girlfriend are still five plus five equals 10 and are treated as separate entities. Once they get married and they become the one under contract because the marriage contract unifies them, then the government treats them. If one gets damaged, the other one's responsible and vice versa. If one does something wrong, they're both guilty. Say five plus one equals nine. Five plus five equals nine. Nine. Because it's one entity now. It's, the ent it's this entity here, the center of both, that becomes one because two objects can't occupy the same space at the same time. Why not? <laughs> because I got five here and five here, and when I put them together, you've got four points on the outside of your triangle and one point in the middle, correct? And when you put the two points together, the two inside points overlay each other and can't occupy the same space. Therefore, there's only nine points. One is dissolved because they come together called unity or marriage. And five plus five equals nine in quantum physics. That's why this is a quantum communication program. It deals with contract. Because of the overlay of the two points at once. Exactly. And the whole world, every government functions on the same rules and regulations, including the post office. And all the Masons have used this technology since the beginning of Masonry 8,500 years ago. That's why marriage has always been insisted upon by all cultures, all governments, worldwide. It's boys and girls, you know. <laughs> um, my question sort of goes back to earlier on in the day when you were talking about uh, Rothschild. Now, when you say that he sort of um, is allowing it to come into existence because it's going to make him more money, 
Is it also the fact that if he's going to make more money, he's allowed to, or him and the elite are allowed to keep the money they've already made by doing the wrong thing, but they now become protected with this new language you know, and they can also make more money off the money they get to keep without ever being brought to okay. justice on what they've done? The, the machine started a long time ago. Okay, We're going to go back in history. Uh, for 6,000 years, everything that went from China to Europe because the Americas weren't involved with paper money, dealing with contract, gold, silver, bartering with different silks and blankets and everything else. Everything went through Istanbul, which was Persia. Persian govern the Persians went ahead and uh, captured through taxation of going through their country money for 6,000 years. When the Vatican came into a being in 79 AD, they went ahead and they borrowed money from Persia to build the Catholic religion and the Catholic Church. That's why you have Persian architecture on all the churches. I'm a key master and so is Russell Gould. We are the only two key masters worldwide because we are the syntax, mathematical syntax correct individuals which are under contract with the Vatican to translate in syntax the, the Bible and all their symbolizations that they have and do it through mathematics. We know the secrets. And there's, that's a whole different area of uh, seminar information right. on a need to know basis. Okay. And deals with banking too and international trade agreements and treaties with the UN and other countries. The, uh, the history then moves forward from 79 AD to 1750. The Rothschild family goes to Persia and they borrow money. They never paid it back. 1800 comes along and Rothschild, through passenger pigeons, controls all the banking in the five capitals of Europe. And through passenger pigeons, nobody knows why, how they're doing it because they keep this as a family secret for 50 years, transport information back and forth, and so they got 80% of all banking in Europe is locked up with the five brothers. Then Napoleon comes along, and Napoleon is going to, goes up against uh, Cromwell at Waterloo. Rothschild knows by passenger pigeon two hours before Napoleon is, when he's defeated, knows that the new, uh, London Stock Exchange is in, everything is being traded currently trading at about 10 cents on a dollar. Then word comes that Napoleon won and it drops to two cents on a dollar, but a Rothschild knows that Napoleon lost. Yep. So he goes ahead and he buys up 80% of everything. Beg, borrow, cheat, and steal, and he buys up everything on margin. And when the news is announced two hours later that the war's over, the stock market jumps 500% instantly, and he becomes the richest man in the world. And then he says to everybody, you can have all the money you want, but you're going to separate the prepositional phrase into adverb verb, which means all contracts are destroyed. He never pays back, he never pays back Persia. So England now, this goes along from 1800 for 100 years. And of course the interest is accumulating, and along comes Lawrence of Arabia. Peter O'Toole made the movie, Lawrence of Arabia. But what you don't know is the classified document as to who Lawrence Arabia was. He was a secret agent to go in and break up Persia. Became Turkey, Iran, Iraq, uh, the Arab Republic, Dubai, and all those, all those areas. And Persia got broke up because they wanted to go in there and get the notes. They didn't get the notes. 1973 comes along, we have the Persian Gulf War. They go in there with their big bombers and blow up things trying to get the notes. They didn't get the notes then either. We're back over there again, still looking for the notes. Persia is still sitting, or the Iran, I, well, now it's in Iran. And we're not, uh, not Iran, but Iraq. No, Iran. Iran's holding the notes right now. They've already stripped. Now they figured it out that everything's being held in Baghdad, the notes are. But to go to war with Iran would be kind of stupid because it's four times bigger than Iraq. And Russia isn't going to allow that to take place. 
it's one thing the where it's at now, but India and Russia, that's too close. You've got Pakistan, we're in Afghanistan. Uh, the resources of the world are kind of run thin. The war is not accepted. Quantum language is disqualifying all, this, all the lies that are taking place. The secrets of the manipulation and conspiracy theories are coming out through these programs that have been advertising with forensic evidence and proof. So the, the notes are still there and Persia has a 250 year interest compounded, which is about a thousand trillion dollars right now against the entire English world. So if the notes are ever published, it could cause somewhat of a global problem. Right. So there's your motivation right there. Okay. <clears throat> This is your title. In the, in the contract states, it's die, which is original, strict as jurisdiction, court of the Australian Territory. T-E-R is Terra. O-R-Y is contract. So that's, that's how you, this is the title you put on your paperwork. When you file in the United States District Court, it means United is no citizen, states, District is demon god of the underworld for trickery in a closed area called court. You make a presumption and you're going to be tricked. And when you file this, they're going to go ballistic on you, but this is where you're at. This is the correct title. Don't forget, what you put on your paperwork is the contract of what the court is going to be. If you want to call it a demon god court, you're going to be treated like a trick. You're going to be denied things. And if you use the correct sentence structure, you're going to get correct sentence structure. Truth in, truth out. Fiction in, fiction out. That's another statement. You guys have all your adhesive contracts you've made since you were 18 years old are an adverb verb fiction. You believed and gave value to that fiction because you were entered into commercial, used money to give it value. And your contract has proved that that illusion you gave value to whether it be a mortgage, a car payment, your driver's license, marriage contracts, divorce contracts, all these things, fiction in, fiction out. You can't change boats in the middle of the stream. You're going to fall in the water. So now that you learn syntax, you can go back and you can write correct sentence structure, communication, syntax, contracts. And when you enter into those, those are legitimate. One of my, uh, I used to have a real estate company for 26 years. I bought and sold homes, did renovations and stuff. I have three PhDs right now, 535 college credits. I'm a little overeducated in a lot of things. <laughs> Went to full-time college for 17 years. The, the contracts that we created, or my mortgage contracts I wrote myself. They're two pages long, and they are totally in syntax. And when the people didn't... People who wanted to buy the houses didn't understand it. They would take it to a lawyer. And the lawyer would say, if you don't want this house, I'll buy it. This is a real contract. And just to get his hands on a real contract, he knew what he could do with it. He could sell the information to other real estate companies as well as write quantumized language to get into private business. Now, you guys are probably all focused on how this thing is going to affect in court. When you get into corporate writing, Corporate charters. You're not in a court system. Corporation to corporation, writing treaties, trusts, and contracts for corporate international banking. Right now, we've got several programs running under international banking, which are in their 10th year right now. So when you get into, we're trying to get the entire planet. We have treaties with 82 countries right now in quantum banking. We have a 117-page quantum uh, bank trust that has, I served at the United Nations with the embassies. And I have uh, uh, ambas my ambassadorship comes from both the syntax um, of the language. I'll explain that to you now. When I got my ambassadorship, the first thing I did was I captured the flag of America by syntaxing the definition of the flag. I then challenged the Congress, the Senate, the legislature, and the Supreme Court of the United States for anybody to have the correct sentence structure communication syntax oath of office to be who they are in that department and to come forward with the representation to defend the flag of the United States of America. Nobody showed up after the 10-day rule and the United Nations because I was the first person to quantumize the definition, 
correctly in now time of the flag, I now own the patents to the flag of the United States of America. When Obama took office, the flags that flew behind him in the White House were 1 to 2.25. The constitutional flag that I copyrighted is 1 to 1 1.9. That was the flag of the United States since 1906. And when I went ahead and I captured it, the United States then took and made all flags yellow fringe. So they went ahead and they said, the post office, all yellow fringe flags worldwide, you even have your British yellow fringe flag, those are postal flags. You work for the post office or you're in postal jurisdiction under port authorities when you see those. So the, when I got that, then they said, well, if you won't have a flag, you must have a country, and a country has to have a constitution. We supplied them with a syntax constitution, the same ones that are up on the Internet right now. And then they said, well, you have a constitution, a flag, and there's two or more people, and you're on the gold standard. What country do you declare? I declare the land of the courtroom during time of contract, which has never been claimed by any country in the history of mankind. And because I was the first person to have the correct sentence structure for the definition of the laws, rules, regulations, and description of what a courtroom is, knowing that it does not exist as a geographical, geographical room, but the paper that holds the words of the contract. That is the courtroom. That's why nine out of 10 of your cases are solved under summary judgment when you file your lawsuit. And the judge makes a determination without you being in court. Because it's the paper is the court. The paper has all the names on. The paper is the United States. And knowing all these different facts and where things are supposed to belong, the United Nations voted 199 to nothing, that I own the flag, that I am a sovereign, that I have an ambassadorship, as the correct sentence structure, communication syntax country, better known as the unity states of our world corporation. And, Ru and Jeff Skeeb and I, because it's two, make corporate. Because we're in a corporate world as corporate, and we are in fact with one, go with one gold ounce, we're now on the gold standard. But we don't have to pay the $1.6 million a year uh, membership fee for the United Nations. We have standing at the UN. The reason we don't have to pay that is because all money is fiction. And we're a fact. And the fact and the fiction can never meet. In front of the UN building in New York City, there are, 100, there are 200 flags. There is one, Title IV, not Title IV, that's what we used to call it, but now it's the correct sentence structure communication syntax flag, measures 1 to 1 1.9, and there are 199 3x4 military boat flags to represent vessels and dry dock of a foreign country at the UN building. Now, when you go in front of all of the UN embassies in their separate compartments, over on in the different hotels that surround the UN building where they have their embassies. They all fly yellow French flags with spears on top and gold braids, which means they're under maritime military bankruptcy or is a military issue. And of all the ambassadors I spoke with, not one of them knew what their flags meant. And when they saw how many different flags they had, one down in the foyer, one outside the building, one in their office, they didn't know what they meant. It's kind of embarrassing that you're ambassador of a country and you don't even know what your own flag means. <laughs> right. So there's your motivation right there. Okay. Right, thank you. Was it ironic that it's nuts? Baghdad was the head of Persia. After Istanbul, it moved over there. After so, uh, yeah, they just transferred the notes over after uh, Lawrence was unsuccessful in acquiring the notes when they broke it all up. But he was a secret agent. Yes? Just going back to the syntax within contract and the law, if it is to change, like people like us, I suppose, if we, if we were able to write it, and let's say most corporations out there now have got contracts and agreements, banking, house loans, everything, that are not valid. So if you were to rewrite it, is it as simple as being able to rewrite it and then if they challenge you in court or take it to court, are you saying that you will win every time, 100% of the time, just by First presenting off, that argument or okay. is it still subject to 
If you're going to rewrite it, both, co both companies or both countries involved in going to syntax would be in agreement. Right now, uh, we have agents here in Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, Dubai, the United States. All over the world, we are coordinating. We have 82 countries that now have syntax, quantum, 115-page quantumized bank treaties, and they are communicating and studying to get their people and the machinery set up for all this. When the time comes, everybody's values will stay the same. The contracts will be corrected. You will not that? notice any difference. There will not be any big announcements to, to scare anybody. You never scare anybody. You fix it. Yeah. As long as everybody fixes it at the same time, there's no place to run unless you want to go sit on a space shuttle someplace. But otherwise, we're all on this spaceship Earth. We're all part of it. We've got to work together. And everybody would be happy to fix it. This program and the things that I've said on this thing have already been broadcasted all over the world for 10 years. And so it's no secret. People know about it. They don't talk about it, but they all know about it, and they're all waiting for it to happen. So nobody's, nobody's afraid. They just know it takes time to study. I mean, everyone that's been in the program has spent years studying, and they know that just, it's just a mountain of information to do it. I got a 30-year jump on everybody else. That's why I teach it. And they, they respect the fact that I'm willing to come out here and teach it to everybody. And then make tapes so that we can spread it all over the planet. But how will that affect them? Like it's, it's one or two They're or three people. They're still going to be in charge because they, know they have friends. The guy up here has 100 contacts. You don't know who the 100 contacts are. You can't step in there and talk to these people. They, they all trust each other. And they all have rules and regulations of cooperation. And there's this thing is like a big pyramid. That they've got people at the top who talk to people at the bottom. It's corporate. They sit around the board of directors. They discuss things. All corporations do. When I set up the Hawaiian government, we had 22 people on the board of directors. All have equal voice in discussing how the, how the Constitution was going to be written. I went ahead and I wrote the Constitution and I said, here, this is your foundation to work from. Make it better. You got 22 brains working together. Make it better. And so they made certain changes along there to fit to their culture. I don't know what's in their heads. I'm not going to interfere with their faith or their culture or their, relig or their religions. I live in Wisconsin. My job is to make sure that the math is correct. When I was elected king, I only guaranteed one thing, that their contract would be correct. I said, I will not interfere with any subject matter. You put your ideas on paper, I'll make sure it's mathematically certified. And that's as far as I'll go with it. And that's what my promise has been for 15 years. And I've always kept my, my word to that, to all of you. When I gave the Origines their contracts and the Mori's their contracts, I did the same thing. You guys make it better. Build a better mousetrap. And I'll make sure that if you come up with a new idea, even if you write it in an adverb verb, I will syntax it and make it correct. And it will read frontwards and backwards or as many ways as you want to mix up the words and it will always say the same thing and then you can vote on it. Everything that becomes contract accepted by people as a constitution must be voted on in an open election otherwise the world court will not sanction the fact that this is a legitimate contract. The opinion of a few have nothing to do with the, the masses of a national constitution. That has to be voted on by the people. So I put that constitution out there so everyone in the world can read it and find fault with it. And if you can't find fault with it, like I said, if you remove everything that can't be, what is left are the facts. And if the facts are on the table and you agree with them, then vote it in. But always work to make it better because the world is an ever-changing place. So me, we can do that, but if a, if a corporation had it wrong, rewrote it in syntax, would all the contracts start from that date, like anything before that, or would Everything it automatically would, carry on? You, that would be up to the discretion of that corporation. If they're going to write a new syntax contract, they also have the capacity to fix everything else that was built before that. And they will negotiate with all the people that they are working with. So they could send you a new contract or a new terms and conditions you signed here. But right, but as long as your product got there and the money flows back and forth, 
The contract is just a piece of paper to make sure it happens, right? And all the thing we're doing is making the paper better so it happens without any discussion, that we don't have to go to court. Because if there's one thing that you would really like to know, is that you've fulfilled the exact letter of the contract, that there's no gray area, nobody can play a trick on you, and call you a no person, and then go out and steal what you, what you built in life because you're a no person. And every law says no person shall. Well, the government called you all no persons. Which means they want to steal everything. That's why probate court harvests everything with such a high tax rate when you die, 75%. Unless you're smart enough to go ahead and write a contract and take your assets and put it with your children or with somebody or with another corporation or in a trust so it's protected so it can't be taxed. You got to do your homework ahead of time. And if your contract is written in quantum, it can't go into court because it's a fact. And private contract supersedes judicial law. So make sure your private contracts are correct. That's a fact, folks. Private contract supersedes judicial interference by courts. Husband and wife want to get a divorce, sit down at the kitchen table and do it yourself. You don't even need a lawyer. You sign a private contract, it's done. A lawyer can't undo it, a judge can't undo it. They will, they will approve it 72 hours later. It becomes official, you've got to wait six months in most cases, and you're free. If you hire a lawyer, two lawyers will get you to fight until there's nothing left, and then they will settle because there's nothing to divide. Anybody wants a divorce? Divorce contracts are already written in my book. Copy it out of there. There's kids involved. There are no kids involved. I got contracts for both. They've already been approved by the courts, and they're free. Can't beat the price. Yeah. Two questions. Um, talking about private uh, contracts, uh, joint ventures, for example, uh, in property deals and so on, um, that applies there too in terms of you've got a private agreement between two people? Private contract private supersedes, but you have to stay within the confinements of real estate laws mm. and transfer quick claim deeds. Got to be careful. Make sure your taxes are taken care of. Transfer fees are paid. Licensing is done. You've done your... Uh, Whatever the due diligence is, because don't forget, you don't actually own that property. Right. You bought a contract that was written in adverb verb, mm. and that land came to the government because they killed the people that lived on it, so it's an alien, excuse me, A-I-L-I-N-G, alien, which means corruption from the beginning contract. The military is there to make sure that no one interferes with the illusion of contract as long as you're on it. Don't pay your taxes. 90 days later, you don't live there anymore. They'll find somebody else to pay the taxes mm. and sell it at a tax auction. Mm. Simple? Yep, perfect. Thank you. And the other question is, um, uh, syntax language applications to the English language, European language, I heard all that. I heard a, a multi of other countries, for example. So how does it apply to, say, Asian language and Arabic languages where the formation of sentences is totally different? The, when you do the translation on the math, they don't have prepositional phrases also. Even the Hebrew religion doesn't even have vowels. Mm. And so when you write things that don't have a English translation, you can't find a word or a meaning for it, you use the English word, even though you're writing in all the other languages, you put the English words in, and the math will always work the same. Mm. Huh? That's where the the language was created in adverb verb from the beginning. And the math will put the missing words in and the math will certify that that word does belong there. Or the volition of what that word means. Because you can't have two nouns together and say it makes sense because it's an adjective pronoun. And you have to certify the terms. If you just write in all nouns like the Hebrew languages, you only have adjective pronouns and therefore you've lost the ability to identify the one in 900 accuracy of the sentence. Therefore it's chaos. And if you have chaos, no one's gonna do contract with you. So now they have a vehicle through this technology to fix it. In 1999, no, that was actually 2000, the Chinese government 
better known as Walmart, <laughs> had only 100 stores in America. And then I went to the embassy in New York City and I gave them the, the treaty on the math interface on language, allowing them to translate the 10,000 symbols of the Chinese language into English took six months. Once they had this technology, they could write a quantumized contract for international trade and bring commerce to the United States and back and forth in six hours, not six months. Now there's 1,800 stores of Walmart in the United States controlling a trillion dollars a year in commerce. So Chinese really liked this. It took things from being a complex picture into a mathematical procedure. Could you get paid by the hour or by percentage? <laughs> How is it possible? No, no, this is a gift. I spent $12,500 of my own pocket money to print the books up and then hand delivered them, including paying my own expenses from A to Z to deliver them to 82 countries and form the treaties. No appreciation. And now, oh yeah, because every time somebody touches me, I got 82 countries ambassadors scream, screaming, you touched my ambassador. Any amount of commerce that 82 countries can, can apply pressure to any, in the, any given country considering they control 97% of the total wealth of planet Earth, that's a big stick. That's why I'm still standing up here talking to you. I got lots of friends. Got lots of friends. Well, there's other things. Yes. Um, as you were saying earlier, how all um, existing adverb verb contracts will have to be, or will be changed into syntax, what's to stop people as they realise that the um, original contracts weren't valid, just refusing to um, except the new contracts, such as mortgages, oh. credit cards. I said fiction in, fiction out. It's called volition. Right. The old L I T I O N, volition. The condition of thinking by your own confession is the conduct. Right. Now, here's the point you walk into the bank, and you're going to write a check. Well, you don't have a pen. Well, okay. So there's a whole jar of pens there. You pick them up, you write it, pull your checkbook out, write your check. You get done with your banking, back and forth, put your checkbook away, you put your pen in your pocket and walk out. No problem. Next guy comes in, checks the monitors, got cameras all over the bank, you know, looks at that. Looks at the pens, hesitates for a minute, picks one up, goes ahead and does his banking, does his thing. But instead of putting the pen back in the bucket, then asks permission to take it, he checks the monitors to see if anybody's looking and then puts it in his pocket with hesitation, puts his checkbook away and walks out. First guy is, did his banking. He's innocent because he was doing his business. The second guy just shoplifted a pen. He's guilty of stealing. And a jury will look at the camera because he did this with his eyes and say that man's guilty of body language sh shoplifting. Yes, exactly. And that body language there's no words. I mean, the guy could speak Chinese or whatever, and you're in an English bank, and he doesn't know anything from anything. But his body language is going to say he's guilty of a shop. He's a, he's a thief. He's stealing with volition. And you will be found guilty of volition. And the jury will all come back and, and prosecute you accordingly. Um, with volition, I was studying the criminal code the other day, and I've noticed, I think it's section 13, where um, someone, when someone is um, persecuted for even the most heinous crimes, um, the intent of the person at the time when he committed the crime seems to be, uh, according to the code, the major uh, factor in deciding whether he was guilty or not. That's it's what his intention correct. was at the time. Everything is based on time. What was your volition at the time of the crime? Right, so all you have to do is admit that you, were, you didn't think that. it was wrong to do it at the time and you'd get away with murder. Well, here's a case. It was, this was a Salt Lake City case where a young girl had a baby. And she was, a, well, she was 33 years old and she, she had a child. And the grandchild had difficulty and needed a blood transfusion. <coughs> So the daughter, or the, the mother of the child, the grandfather came forward 
to give blood for this child because they had surgery. When they ran the blood thing, it turned out that he was the father. He had raped his daughter when she was 12, which created the child. And it was 20 years later, because of the blood transfusion, that they were able to make a determination that the man was guilty of incest at the age of with a 12-year-old and went to prison for life. Okay, well, that brings me to the... So it isn't, it's, it's not, it, the, the, their, their conduct, the conduct of the time and place is against the law in all cultures worldwide for all time. So it doesn't matter when they catch you. There's no statute of limitations for rape or for murder anywhere in the world. You commit, you commit a murder in your country, you go anywhere in the world, you will be extradited back to your country because all courts are the same jurisdiction worldwide, foreign vessels and dry dock, and they all have rules and regulations for murder and rape and specific drug dealings and criminal activities, treason, conspiracies, you know, spying. There's no statute of limitations for murder or for rape. You get found guilty and they got physical evidence because of CSI and they can do that through DNA today, you're going to prison. Question. Uh, one thing you mentioned before about um, birth certificates uh, when we were born. Um, I've heard, yep, that 45 days after we were born, if there wasn't laid claim to the government, then own that. And you mentioned also a figure of... 45 days of trust is what it's called because a trustee has not, the trust was created by the birth certificate that the doctor signed, but the trust expired 45 days later, and then the child, which is the issue of woman now, becomes the issue of a state, and the state takes responsibility that if anything happens to the child, that the social security trust that was established expired after 45 days, it's then sold into the state as a commercial instrument, and then the state will take care of the child in the event the mother and the father neglect the child or die in a car accident and will we'll take care of things. And is that the only use for it or is it, is it, I've heard that it's on sale by governments as a promissory note? Right, but you have to put the money into the system so that the money is there through, for the life of that child from cradle to grave. Otherwise, there wouldn't be enough dollars in the system to make commerce move to build, buy homes, put food on the table, clothing, all the toys that we acquire throughout life. These are all things that are relevant to where did the money come from? Well, it had to be in the system to measure the value of your sweat equity. You give it value as life goes on. If it wasn't there, there wouldn't be enough money for anything. You'd be working for a penny a day rather than being paid two or three hundred dollars a day to do your job. Right. And fractional banking has to exponentialize itself based on the amount of things. Did you pay for the roads that are out here? I mean, you love running around on the roads. You love your, all your technology with your cars. You love all your modern conveniences. You want to give them up just because you want to make an argument about what the dollar's worth? It gets things done, doesn't it? And it really makes your life go smooth. You don't want to go from here to Sydney in four months, because you're in a covered wagon, you want to get there in eight hours if you want to drive a car or an hour by plane. You like the toys. And so you don't question how you get there. You just, you, just might, you just want to make sure it's there. And today, technology commands that we... The world's going to move forward. Screaming and doesn't matter. People are not going to give up their toys. Anybody in here want to give up your Blackberries or your iPods or your, or your cell phones or your computers and go back to watching three-channel TV in black and white? <laughs> Be bored out of your tree? Not being able to learn about all the millions of things that are on Wikipedia and having instant access to anything that you can think of you can get an answer for today without going down to the library, spending an hour to drive there, look up, look up in the books for months before you find out what's going on. Instead, it just takes five seconds and you got it on front of you on a computer screen or on your cell phone. The world is so fast and our brains want more and more and more. We can comprehend 10,000 thoughts a second. I mean, how fast do you blow through your, your computer? Your computer 10 years ago was a 100 mega, megabytes of memory. And you thought that was all the memory in the world. We paid $100 for another megabyte of memory. 
Today you get a gigabyte or 10 gigabytes for $20. And our computers are running in the terabyte speeds with 8 gig hard drives. And as fast as we can push the buttons, we can read the screens and, and download information. And the more we learn, the faster we learn. And it exponentializes itself. And you don't, your brain doesn't want to give up that information. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Get over it. <laughs> the reason I ask this is because there's a, there are a number of people who, who suggest that originally, because, because we haven't been informed about that birth certificate situation, that they, the government has actually committed fraud and therefore it has utilised the value of the money in that account without our knowledge so that when we go and borrow money from the bank, we're actually borrowing our own money. Actually, is it isn't your money. No. It isn't until you sign over and say you're going to put your life on the line for the next 30 years and pay it back. And don't they give you a contract? You don't care what that contract says. Did you ever read it and syntax it? No. The only thing you want is a roof over your head to take care of your wife and your children. You don't care what that, that car loan says. You want to be able to get to work without walking in the rain. You want these conveniences and you're willing to accept the illusion in order to, to function. And the government will allow you these illusions as long as they get a piece of it called commerce. Taxation? Taxation is you paying the military to guarantee the value of your money. If you don't believe me, walk up to a police officer with a $5 note, put a match to it, and watch how long it takes you to arrest you because you destroyed commerce. That law applies to every postal employee which controls all military worldwide. And that includes police officers, sheriffs, bail uh, bailiffs, military personnel. They're all there to guarantee the value of their dollar so that the commerce between countries flows, your food gets here, the raw resources get here, people got work. Otherwise, people don't have work and they're starving, they're going to riot. They don't want to riot, so they're going to make sure that the value of the money is guaranteed and that you're going to pay the service fee of the military to guarantee that money. And if you don't sign your tax form in the box? Who cares? Well, what's the tax? You can have 100% of nothing or 70% of 100. What do you think is a better deal? Now, what I'm saying is, as an individual, the claim is that if you don't sign in the box, that it's no, not a contract and therefore you shouldn't have had to pay tax. That's basically because... Again, no you don't you don't have the capacity to guarantee the value of the money. The military does. The military makes sure that the banks pay you your money. The banks, that, that the storekeeper will honor your money when you take it there to buy your groceries so that you eat today. Otherwise, you'd be dead in 10 days from starvation. It's about guarantees all across the board. There's all kinds, different kinds and levels of guarantees. The money guarantees. It's, it's just a vehicle to measure the commerce or, excuse me, to measure your sweat equity. And you don't want to work for nothing. And you don't want the guy that's, that's laying there sleeping, watching TV all day while you're out working, and he says, well, I have a right to everything that you make. Remember the story of the little red hen who plows the field, seeds it, harvests, and the pigs come along and say, you got too much. We want it. That's socialism. And you don't like that. If you're going to earn something and build it, you want, to be your, you want to acquire your sweat equity. So the government says, you'll have your sweat equity in this free economy, but we're going to take a portion of it to guarantee the value of it, and we're going to keep the books on this here, and the money that you pay into taxes will not only take care of the, the, uh, the military paying them to protect you so that the Chinese don't plant rice in your backyard tomorrow, or anybody else for that back to trespass. You want that, those guarantees that a criminal isn't going to bust into your house and hurt you, that the, the, that the police are going to put out, uh, capture the, the bad guys, the firemen are going to put out the fire, the ambulance is going to be there when you have a heart attack. You like all those conveniences. And so those services exist in the event there's an emergency. You live on the coast here. Supposing you have a 9.8 earthquake off in New Zealand. You guys are close enough to can you survive a 200-foot tsunami come crashing into your city here? What do you think the end result of that's going to be? And who's going to pick up the pieces afterwards? It's like watching New Orleans get washed away by a hurricane and see the level of what a disaster is or that 
earthquake that took place off of uh, Indonesia killed 235,000 people because they don't have an infrastructure or any way to protect them. because it guarantees your, your condition of life. The world isn't perfect, but they are building more satellites and more early warning systems and trying to make things better. You know what would be the real big disaster? There's a crack in the Big Island of Hawaii. A, 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 the, that volcano on Big Island is 10 miles tall. That crack represents 100 cubic miles of mass. If that falls into the trench 35,000 feet deep, it will produce a 100 foot high tsunami in the entire Pacific Rim. You realize the damage it would do to San Francisco, LA, Tokyo, Singapore, Shanghai, Hong Kong, your cities along Australia here, you'd all be hit with a 100 foot tsunami. And it would be multiple waves of it. What happened in Indonesia? That would be a drop in the bucket. A billion people would die if that, if that volcano ever goes pop and knocks that chunk off into the ocean. It's a disaster waiting to happen, and everyone on the planet knows it's there. What do you think would happen if uh, Yellowstone National Park erupted? That's a volcano 40 miles wide and 60 miles long. Two-thirds of the United States would be destroyed. The world economy would not exist because of the commerce that would be lost. 60% unemployment on the planet and about half the population of the planet would die because they couldn't get food, because that's a breadbasket of, of the world. All because of a single volcano, which erupts every few hundred thousand years. Um, it's gone five, so I'm just leaving it. Sure. So, what I'm telling you is there's, there's a lot of things on the planet. We live on an angry planet. We have, the, the world's trying to do the best they can to guarantee the survival of mankind. Global warming. I know. Okay. The uh, have you have you been monitoring the North Pole yeah. ice cap? Thirty in the last thirty years, forty percent of the ice pack has shrunk. But when the permafrost comes out, the methane that's been trapped for 50,000 years has been released. And methane is 50 times more potent than carbon. There's no toxins. Speak to Lord Mumford. Hmm? Lord Mumford. Yeah, the Lord Mumford. It's just conducted I've heard both sides. OK. There, there's, there, there's arguments on both sides about global warming and no global warming. OK? Uh, and and that's a subject matter, okay? And that's outside the jurisdiction of the syntax of the seminar. <laughs> we can debate, just like you can debate religions, you can debate politics, you can debate global warming political issues, but that has nothing to do with, uh, that's a science issue versus communications. Uh, I don't know the truth one way or the other. I've researched both of them, and both sides have valid arguments. And so the only thing we can do is wait and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> yes? You talk about a free economy. I'm not sure how free the economy is, and uh, I'm certainly not comfortable with the military guaranteeing my dollar and holding me to sweat, sweat, uh, sweat equity for the rest of my life to validate the dollar. Um, I guess I wanted to talk about volition. You talk about the, the volition of contract, whether it's in fiction or it's in truth. The volition is probably the most important thing. So if, if the case is that the central banks uh, lend money to the governments and the banks, and the central banks are privately owned, and then the banks uh, collude with these central banks to then, through fractional reserve lending, enslave everybody, what's the volition uh, of, of their contract? Well, they made it available to you, and you accepted it. You didn't go out there and say, you didn't go to the bank and say, I'm going to syntax your, your mortgage contract. They said, who's got the money to buy the house? And they said, well, you've got to go to the bank or credit union. You can go to private individuals, but private individuals don't, unless they're a family member, probably wouldn't give you any money. So if you want the money, you've got to play the game to get the house, so you've got to roof over your head and support your family. And if you had taken the time, you could have wrote your own contract in syntax first, and took it to the bank and said, will you accept this? Because it's correct. But isn't the volition of the lender um, 
incorrect if they're stating that they have risk, but they make digits out of nothing. So what's their risk? Does the lender have an education to understand quantum language? Did he take this course, or does he even understand the fact that there is syntax available to him? The answer is you walk into the bank and ask any bank teller or bank president, do you understand what the word syntax means? They're going to go, no. And you look at his eyes. Some people are absolutely surprised when they hear the word syntax. They go, I don't even know what that means. And they really are starstruck. Define it for me. And then you start showing them little pieces of information, and all of a sudden like, they go, oh, we got a problem. And then they get scared. Am I going to lose my job if I ruffle the feathers of the other people who don't understand the syntax? Because remember what I told you? First rule of business is don't hire your replacement. Nobody wants to lose their job. When I got arrested in New Zealand last week, the immigration officer, after I syntax his immigration form, says, I'm paid to do that. I'm paid to lie to you. And I don't want to lose my job because unemployment is 12% in New Zealand. So what's the, guy, what's the guy saying to you? He's going to break the law just to keep his job. And that's what we're dealing with all over the world. That's where the lies going to stop. And, and the true religion has to come in because the world's enslaved. That's why I'm doing these seminars. You've got to educate enough people to, so that you can vote correctness in. As long as people don't know, they won't change. You didn't know for 8,500 years, and 8,500 years nobody changed. The only thing that people do is they go to war with each other. You know, Odell said to me once, Odell was a chief judge's clerk. She says, people are angry. People who are angry file lawsuits. Business is good. I have job security. <laughs> yes. Um, it's on the same subject, just a different facet of it. I want to confirm what I hear you saying is that if people sign an agreement that uh, is not made in quantum language, but it's in... Um, uh, volition. Ver by their own volition, verb, bad verb, regardless of whether the word, and they both, both assume they understand what each other are discussing, and they've agreed on that contract, whether it be a a house contract or buying a car or even uh, on a constitution because they voted on it does that make it binding yes because both of you signed it so what you're saying our constitution they offered you accepted and you're both going to comply with it and if you don't where are you going to go you're going to go into an adverb verb court that's going to enforce the adverb verb law so what you're saying our constitution that we voted in 1900 regardless whether it's written in quantum language or not is binding well, it was binding until I rewrote it. Now people can stand up with a correct one and say, how come you guys didn't follow your own syntax that you wrote in your own styles manual and you went out there and you broke the law for the last hundred years? Why don't you know how to read and write? Why are you claiming that you know how to read and write, taking a paycheck for it, but you actually don't know how to read and write? But nobody's voted the one that you rewrote. Therefore, the parties have People not agreed are on it. still looking at it. It hasn't gone to the referendum. In other words, you have to, government has to stay up, stand up and say, we have a new constitution here. On Tuesday, in 90 days from now, we are going to vote on it. Do you want to stay with the old one, adverb, verb, or do you want to accept a new one? If you accept a new one, we're going to have to change contracts. So, and it's through the education of people. That's why I have my website up for 10 years. That's why I write these books and tapes, so that we're trying to educate as many people as possible so we get the controlling vote globally to fix it. Eventually, it's got to get fixed. You can't lie to everybody. You can fool some of the people some of the time, most of the people all the time, but not all of the people all the time. And at some point, you're going to... lie to everybody. You can fool some of the people some of the time, most of the people all of the time, but not all of the people all the time. And at some point, you're going to wake up and say, we're not in Kansas anymore total, and you want it fixed. Right. But practice, That's why we're all senior citizens here. In practice, <laughs> we still bound. <laughs> so we're still bound. In practice, we're still bound. We can't just go to a court and say, well, here's what I want in quantum language, and they say, no, this is our constitution we follow. We don't recognize your, your new version of, of a ah, constitution. Ah, but they do. Some of the court judges are brought up to speed. 
They agree with the quantum language. And because you are in a closed area called a courtroom on a closed contract in both the parties suing, both the claimant and the vassalee and the judge are all on the same page of quantum, we will have a quantum trial and the rules and regulations of the quantum contract will be upheld. It's when you have a discrepancy between a licensed adverb, a person that's an adverb verb, with a judge who's an adverb verb, and an individual who has quantum language where you have a conflict of fact and fiction, and fact and fiction can never meet. Okay. So but a lie is still a lie under the rules of perjury, and we have signed confession that it committed perjury. So now they have to do one of two things. They either have to adapt truth or vacate their fiction. So the only reason it becomes binding is because you're dealing with the difference between a, a truth and a lie, and the truth eventually wins out. Exactly, and because, because I paid a fee to file a document, and he signed it. I have a contract, commercial contract, and that stamp on here makes it a commercial contract. Even though they may say the money is fiction, the stamp is a gold certificate under law of the flag, and this contract is binding between two people because we have a whole value of gold. And therefore, when you explain the facts and you know what the facts are, then the judge has to agree with that. But you also have to get the judge off his plane, and you do that by contract and saying there are no planes in this court. And put that one little sentence in there. We are, there are no boxes, there are no planes, and law of the flag has jurisdiction here today. And the law of the all illusion, law of the flag. Law of the flag, okay. Law of the flag says if you don't wish to make contract, do not come under my flag. And you mm. read about flags of all different countries. Look at the, United, look at the, the, the Olympics that are taking place right now in Vancouver. Every nation that's participated, what's the first thing they walked in with? They had a flag up. They were all under their flag. And when they win, they get their gold medal, they put up their flag. It's always the flag of the country comes first before the people in the awards. So the judge and the other party can refuse to accept the flag. That means what happens with a court case? Or the oh, no. No, that flag's got jurisdiction. And that flag is defined in the court, on the paper, and when he holds that document, that is the court. It isn't the room, it's the piece of paper. That's the vessel that flies the flag. He's bound by this flag. Maybe he's holding it up, he goes, oh, you mean this contract? He's holding the flag up. And you can capture him by saying, you've just traversed with my flag. You're under law of the flag. Your seal <laughs> is a cartoon character and has no jurisdiction because there's no flags here. If you, if you do it right, you know about the stamp and the flag and the endorsement, and the terminology of syntax, you will prevail in your court. Because they can't make it go away. It's physical evidence. Doesn't matter if the guy wants to play games and say, well, go away. I'm going to dismiss this. He can't D-I-S, demon god of the underworld for mischief against quantum. You can't vacate quantum unless you do it in quantum. So if a guy, judge hands you an adverb verb order, it's no contract. Syntax it, attach it to another complaint and file it back in the court and sue him for fraud. He now becomes a defendant against himself. You make it sound so simple. It is simple. I do it all the time. I've been doing it for 30 years. Okay, guys. Well, that's 525. Tomorrow we're going to put some uh, the Australian 1953 uh, law that made the origin flag legal or as it was called, an act by Elizabeth. We're going to write that up here. I'm going to send text for you, and then I'm going to write you the correct version of it. Uh, well, also, anybody else got any, any sentence structure that you want me to dissect? We'll work on dissecting that, because every sentence that we put up here is going to become a seminar in itself, where the words came from, why the words have to be changed, the cause and an effect of why these things have to be broken apart and then put back together to make sense. And I can do that. When we did the seminars over in Auckland, we spent two days, 16 hours, dissecting sentences. And at the end of 16 hours, about half the people got a little bit of it. It's not as easy as you think. I can do it, and you can see it happen. And you can understand it as I do it. But then I give it to you, and I say, do it. You're going to go. What's an adverb? What's an adjective? How do I identify these things? Well, this is where it comes to repetition. That's why I say it takes 200 hours 
to shift your gears and become proficient like Stephen is. And once you get this, once you get this, you can't be lied to by anybody. You are empowered. You can walk into court with your head hell high and knock them all down. I guarantee you, you'll feel really good. Not only that, you're going to have everybody that's got a agreements or a lawsuit hire you at 100 bucks an hour to help them with their lawsuits. Make a hell of a good living. All right, 200. I'm financially independent. <laughs> so, Dave, what you're saying is it's not about arguing fiction to fiction, which is what probably a lot of people in the room have been doing. Let's go to court and say, let's, let's talk, but let's talk with the truth. And if they're not prepared to, then you notice them and you, you're going to sue them. For the, the only thing all of you can ever talk about when you go into court is what just happened. Then here and now. What, what just happened? Huh? You can't tell me what I did. What just happened? We witnessed something. Right, you're all witnesses. You can only talk about you. You have been damaged or you have been rewarded. You have witnessed something taking place. What did you witness? You witnessed the modification of language to extort, I mean, to create perjury. If you witness and can prove perjury through modification of language, the case has to be vacated. Who brought the case? The DA, the judge, the police officer? If they lied, they lost jurisdiction because it's a criminal act. The case is mute. They have to be held to a high standard. Sound like a marriage counselor teaching us how to use eye messages. It's all about talking about yourself. You can only, the only proof you have about anything that's ever happened in your life is what's in your personal brain. You can't talk about anything you see, only about who you know, who you are, and what you know. And when you get to learn, when you learn that one sentence, how to identify the damage that you are a party to, or a victim of, the damage you're a victim of, because of modification of language, you will prevail in stopping fiction from damaging you. Have fun tonight, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as far as any questions go, you don't, did you remember later? Send me an email, and I'll answer them, write them up. I answer emails all the time. Uh, as this process goes on, you do more study, come a bit, you have more awareness. Uh, you can contact me as long, you know, as long as you want to stay in the program, you can contact me. There's no cost at it. So, uh, I wrote up here in Act 19, 1953. This is when the Origini flag was uh, Queen Elizabeth had uh, recognized the Origini flag, and this is what she wrote to go ahead and give it its approval. Now, as you know, AND is an article and for AND ACT. AN always appears in front of a word stressed with a vowel. But because they left out with AN ACT or for AN ACT or by AN ACT, they didn't use the prepositional phrase, so this now becomes an adverb, not an article, in front of a word that means no contract because it's a vowel and two consonant. So then she goes ahead and says to declare. Now, DE means no and Claire is speak. And, not, and it's also a future tense adverb, which now takes declare to be a future tense no speak. So she said nothing. A certain flag now becomes undefined as to what flag she's referring to, making it an adjective pronoun, calling the flag a no, no, no. Two is an adverb in future time, modifying the be condition of now time but now it's used as a verb, which is an illusion. Then the is an adverb, making Australia to be a, a, a coloring national flag. So therefore, it's another adjective, adjective pronoun. To make, again, in the future, which has no now time jurisdiction, which means you shall never make, now is a verb instead of a, a uh, condition of state. Other is a vowel and two consonants, a no contract word. Adverb, now to make provision, P-R-O means no, B-I-S is sight, and I-O-N is contract. You cannot see the flag. And it's also used as the coloring of the pronoun flag. 
And then with respect, re meaning no, inspector comes from phantom. So if you have no phantom condition, in future time, to flags as a dangling participle verb. You can't end a sentence in a verb. She's ending it as a dangling participle verb and then signs it. Is there any nouns on the page, or any facts on the page? Well, the answer is no. There's no prepositional phrases. There's no condition of lodio ownership. And she's given no now time jurisdiction to anything. So every word has been a condition of future or negative. So there is absolutely no condition or certification for a now time or originally flag. And yet, since 1953, for the past 50 years, they have re, uh, pretended to treat the flag as being a national Australian flag. But this is a type of information. Does Queen Elizabeth have jurisdiction here? Well, she claims to be her postmaster. But has the Postal Treaty ever been written with the correct sentence structure, communication syntax? The answer is no. So therefore, Queen Elizabeth, as postmaster, has no treaty whatsoever, trust, or contract with the entire country of Australia. She also has no standing in this country because she's not an origine. So therefore, she's an illusion that has come here pretending to be something that isn't because there's no contract. And furthermore, you've got, uh, when you do the violation on language to fool the people, you've lied as, a public, as pretending to be a public figure and then telling lies to the people. This is perjury which is a criminal act in every language. Excuse me? Isn't it also considered treason? To, to, to any no, treason is an act that's called constructive treason, which means contract treason. Now, contract treason is when you sign a contract to perform a specific duty. A <laughs> microphone. Uh, contract treason is when you sign a specific contract to perform a specific duty. Actual treason takes place during time of war. You have to be under a declaration of war to con commit treason, and that carries a death sentence in all countries worldwide. The, uh, the constructive treason portion, if you join the military, but it's peacetime and you do something wrong, you probably wind up in jail for 20 years. Right, my understanding of the declaration of war is setting yourself up um, as an authority and governing the people unknowingly uh, doing uh, and carrying out such acts as to purposely um, hurt the people by removing their rights, um, well, various rights that they um, have, like human rights. Okay. When you use the word declaration, you're saying no spoken contract. And the, throughout the history of mankind, war has always been an issue of trespass and mind control. If I don't control your mind, I put a bullet or an arrow in it. And that's basically the fundamental. Anything that is acquired through war is called alien, A-I-L-I-N-G, which means corruption from the beginning. Mm -hmm. A conquering country, like when, say, uh, Germany invaded Poland. After the war was over, Russia invaded Poland. And after Russia left in 1989, all the land that was taken in both the World War II by the Germans and then seized under communist control from the Russians was all given back to the original title, lodial title owners of 1938. So it is not just about the land, it's also about mind control or controlling the free will of other people. That's correct. Well, in that case, then most of the laws which have in some way um, taken away or reduced or made the citizens of Australia believe that they have no rights or their certain rights have been reduced and that uh, those rights are given by the government rather than that they... They're making have. everything to be a privilege. Right. That's a declaration of war in that case. No. That's just misinformation. If that misinformation has been carefully designed for the purpose of uh, making the people believe that they, those rights, they don't have those rights, then... The minute they believe that they don't have something, they turn to voluntary compliance through fear of guns and clubs, better known as rape. Right. Rape is the performance of one human being over another without their permission or against their will. And if, if this was designed to be executed in such a way, and it's, it's uh, pre-thought, 
Yes, and so what they do is they give you all kinds of toys, uh, benefits, have you sign contracts, driver's licenses, social security, uh, make all kinds of promises to you, but in, inadvertently you become a good slave and 88 cents on a dollar that you earn goes to the government. So forcefully enforcing a law that is not a law is not a upon people, well, as unsuspecting you, people, it's not a declaration of war. As we've, as we've proven here, there is no treaty, trust, or contract written with the correct sentence structure here or any other country worldwide, and it hasn't been for 8,500 years. Right. But to rewrite mankind's history, you have to, uh, that's why I established a, a constitution in quantum language. We take the same volition of what was intended or the, how the people believe it should be. We took away the future tense, we took away the past tense, we took away the negative words, we replaced everything with now time, prepositional phrases, to articulate an order of operations that puts every single fact in its correct position of having an individual, having knowledge, declaring that knowledge through the verb of thinking, making a claim for that knowledge, contracting with that knowledge in the correct sentence structure, communication, syntax, and then authorizing it through their authors, their authentic condition, their authentic volition, so that we have a performance that the person knows that what they're doing when they do it. It's not an accident. When you go into court, one of the things that the judges have to go through, can you read and write? How far did you go in school? Uh, do you have a driver's license, which means you can operate an automobile? Do you know how to run a, a computer? Do you understand the words they've been smoking, spoken to you? Have they offered you or intimidated you to perform a specific way or say a specific thing uh, when you pleaded guilty for the crimes you were charged with and to come to an arbitrated settlement? And the, the, the individual who's sitting there will go, no, 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 you know, I, I participated, I'm doing this under my own volition, I've given up my constitutional rights, which means the right to contract with somebody else to go ahead and, and you're throwing yourself on the mercy of the court. I've seen some people get good deals. I've seen other people wind up with a life in prison when they thought they were going to get parole. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking so at much earlier than that. When, when a, a group of people knowingly set themselves up in an unconstitutional manner for the purpose of enslaving the people and pretending they, are, uh, uh, they have a right to govern, but their intention from the beginning was done not to govern, but to control. Isn't yes, that a that's do the not court they, system. Isn't that, do not, are they not a foreign power? Of course. All courthouses worldwide are foreign vessels and dry dock. When you go into a courthouse, you are no longer in Australia. You have left it. You might as well be on Mars. So if a foreign power declares itself to be the chosen of the people, declares themselves to be a government, and they set out to enslave the government, is not to enslave the people which they pretend or they swear to, to protect, is that not a declaration upon the people that they want to protect? Like you said, the word declaration, it's, they haven't said anything. It's just the illusion that you believe exists. But when you syntax it, like we syntax this, it doesn't exist. It's not even here and now time. It's an illusion. But you've been brainwashed to, to try and use all of these things in now time. But it isn't in now time. Syntax is a, is a word, and the operations of using syntax have been banned from all schools, universities, dictionaries, everything, so people don't know where to look. If you don't, this is the only program taught globally in all countries on syntax and all the secrets of government, the laws, order of operations, and it's mathematically certified. Same as a math problem, and that's the unique thing. People have tried to do what I've done, but they didn't have a math interface to prove it frontwards and backwards to justify why do I need a prepositional phrase or a positional lodial fact. And this is, this is where this technology was accepted by all governments and allowing me to teach it worldwide because the government can't rule the people with a lie because everyone knows it's a lie now. So they, they know it's got to get fixed and they don't have anybody qualified to teach it. So they're allowing me to make the videotapes, the books, 
and teach this globally and be the, the spokesperson for this technology because I own the copyrights on it. What is a declaration? Declaration means no spoken contract. D is no, Claire is speak, and ION is contract. Okay. So if a law or a proposed law is proposed, PRO means no, pose, take some position. A position means to have a fact or location. You have no location law. What you need is a contract. The correct sentence structure, communication syntax contract. It's that simple. Grumble, grumble, grumble. You, 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 you. <laughs> I think the uh, the questions that he is asking are legitimate. I mean, he's he's done a good job of standing up here and, and challenging me. Now, in um, when he did San Diego, we had a man stand up and do about sixty nine questions. The rest of the people in the audience got irritated with it, and I told everyone in the audience, I says, "This guy works for me." He's supposed to ask these questions. He's not dominating the, the thing. What he was was the clerk of the court for a federal judge for eight years. And what he did is he, made his, he was paid by the courts to go around to all the different people that would put seminars on against the Internal Revenue Service, against government, and embarrass them and disqualify their program every time, no matter where they showed up in Los Angeles or San Diego. And you've got a population of 38 million people in Southern California. So he had a full-time job every weekend of going out there and just taking these guys apart. Well, when he ran into me, I took him apart. And even though he, was, he asked really good questions, he didn't know anything about quantum language. So he was working from a fiction point of view. And I took his perspective and completely changed it. And he went after his own judge that hired him to go after me. And he came to 13 seminars consecutively. And he would get up and he would say, he would challenge me the same way a judge would challenge you in court. So what he is doing, the questions he's asking, are doing you a service because if he didn't, ask, if you didn't know or didn't prepare yourself for the level of these questions to be answered, and you want to go up in front and sue a federal judge, or a state judge or a magistrate, I said, you're going, to be, you're going to put yourself in harm's way. Don't do something half-baked because you will have a nice stay in orange pajamas and three hots and a cot, and you don't want to go there. So anybody thinks they can, they're ready to go to court, call me up. Try and run your scenarios past me. If you can get, get past me, because I'm the guy that prosecutes judges, and I know all those secrets, if you can get past me, then I'll say, you're ready to go to court. I'll even fly down there and back you up on the thing, if you're that good. So it, it's, uh, it's not a free cakewalk out here. That's why nobody goes into court and does this thing. And you guys got adrenaline. I don't have adrenaline. My adrenal glands were removed when I was 25 years old. I don't have a fear factor. So I, the, the flight, uh, fright to flight, I don't have that. I'm, my hobby is mountain climbing, hanging off a thousand foot cliff. You know, that's just so much uh, fun. <laughs> Any questions about this? Go ahead and ask me questions while I'm getting the next thing written up here. Okay. Uh, what I don't get about this is how you designate a, a part of speech to its word when it's used in a different way. Oh, that's easy. Mm. The, uh, the words, an adverb modifies a verb. An adverb can connect the, ver the, can connect the verb and can connect to a pronoun in front of it. But it modifies an adjective and it modifies a verb. And that's it, or another adverb. So the mathematical operations of syntax has to go frontwards and backwards evenly. Now, when the government created the, ad, uh, the, the adverb, adjective, and pronoun, these three parts of speech, they always get the operations of modification correct to create nothing. 
They don't use prepositional phrases or position lodial facts. They don't make any declaration or, uh, or rather they don't make a claim about what is and are are. They, because they, they're misusing all the words that they're going to put up here. And if you go to a dictionary, you won't find most of these words in a dictionary. You can't find a verb flag in a dictionary. You only find it as a fact. It'll say noun in the dictionary. But then a noun, it'll, it'll have noun is spelled N-O-U-N, which is no-no. And the reason this is a no-no is because here it's used as an adverb verb. So they tell you it's a no-no in the dictionary, and you think that a noun is a fact, it's a no-no. <laughs> and they're advertising that effect. If they were going to use a fact, they'd say a fact, but they don't use facts. In all the entire dictionary, in 1828, Webster, when he wrote the first dictionary, he said, the bastardization of the English language is the worst crime I could commit against mankind. I have to make a living, which means he was paid by the government to bastardize the dictionary. Webster was an attorney. Yes. Uh, two in the dictionary, if you looked it up, would be a preposition, right? Two has 20, uh, 38 definitions, and they're in the book. I have one complete page dedicated to the word two. It is the most bastardized word in the entire English language because one, it's in the future, and you can use it for, I can use two in all conditions of language. It's only used once as a noun. It's only used, uh, if you use it a pre as a preposition, I'm going to the farm. Mm -hmm. Two is a preposition, but now it's in future time, which means you don't have now time jurisdiction. For the knowledge of the person is with a traveling, uh, with the traveling to the at the location of the farm. See, that way. Oh. Mm -hmm. You've got to change your words around. It's a longer sentence. Mm. I'll get it soon. And you say you're going to the store from the house. To is in future, from is in past, and you've got two ideas on one sentence. Weren't you always taught that a nice sentence is one idea? Well, see, it, it's, it seems really... Uh, easy for you to fall into that trap because the reason for thinking is to abolish thinking. Why would you write a 13-word letter, a 13-word sentence, or a resignation letter with 60 words when it, the only thing is I quit? That's the end of the, right? I is an a pronoun, or rather I is an adverb making quit a verb. But quit is a condition of a state, not a verb. If you're saying I quit, and what you want to explain in quantum it would take 60 words to get through it. So the reason for thinking is to abolish the 60 words and, and jump over and take a shortcut. Shortcut. But as you've been told your whole life, the shortcut is always going to get you in trouble. You got to do things the long way. You can't take short. Well, just like when you all did long division in high school, we wanted to go ahead and take shortcuts and not show our work. And most of the time, we got the wrong answer when we took a shortcut. Or the teacher says, if you don't show your work, you haven't proven that you understand long division and how to go through all the monotonous steps of, of getting to the correct answer. And that's why it was mandatory that you learn these little lessons because the shortcut is not the easiest way in life. You have to do things a long way so you're thorough. Question. Um, the use of the Origini flag, where does that stand in regards to that being a fiction if you were using the Origini flag as your flag? The, well, this was written in future time. The Queen wrote this. Mm -hmm. and, and this was her act that she, she passed on to, to your country here to acknowledge. Oh, did you see any acknowledgement here? How do you spell acknowledge? A-C-K, no contract, which means you have no knowledge. Does this, is this a knowledgeable statement? So if I say, well, I'm going to acknowledge this statement. I just said I have no knowledge of the statement because the statement doesn't say anything. So... You believe that acknowledge means to pay attention and have a response, where in fact I just said to you, I don't know what this says because it doesn't say anything. And I just proved it doesn't say anything, and I use the word that says it doesn't say anything. But if you don't know the rules about a vowel two consonant, you go through your entire life and you use negative conditions of state and always get there. Just like uh, the world court, it's called the international court, right? In means no, T-E-R is terra, nation is people, all is contract. So there's no earth people contract. 
And every lawsuit filed since 1945 at the World Court was written in adverb verb except the three quantum ones that I sent in. There was a seven year wait to have your case heard at the World Court. I get mine done in about 48 hours. Because fact has jurisdiction over all the illusions. And the, the other thing is that the, the World Court, when we introduced all this technology, gave all the judges claims of, li of the live life, had them sign oaths, made them postmasters, bankers, and judges in quantum. Russell and I did this. When I went to Amsterdam uh, back in, oh, I think it was 04, 2004, I got off the bus, and the guards were standing at the guard shack. It's probably about 300 feet away. And as I walked up, they said, Judge Miller. <laughs> I walked up to him and he says, how did you know? He says, oh, we've been studying your material for two years. We knew you when you got off the bus. We know your body language and what you look like. I said, don't you want to see my passport? And he goes, not required. He says, we know who you are. We know what you sound like. He says, all the guys in the, at the court here study your material. All the judges do, too, and all the clerks. He says, you're, just, you're welcome. You can run anywhere you want here. No restrictions. And I went there with a banker friend. And they said, this guy can't come in. He said, and he was here to check on a lawsuit. I says, well, he's with me. Well, if you're going to vouch for him, then he can come in with you. Otherwise, this guy would have flown over to Amsterdam, spent uh, $3,000 for a round-trip pair for and hotel accommodations, and would have been standing outside the gate and not allowed to go in. And the same thing is at the Supreme Court of the United States. I go in there, and I, the first time uh, I went in, I said, uh, I'd like to see J William Rehnquist, Supreme Court Justice of, of the United States. The guard says, do you have an appointment? I says, no, I'm charging him with treason. <laughs> I says, and I have his signed confession. And they're going, sit down, you're under arrest. <laughs> so I got six guards, they completely surround me. And Rehnquist comes down, he meets me face to face. I tell him I'm a real person. I says, and uh, you, you committed treason against the people. I says, I have your signed confession. He says, well, you better be able to back that up. So I started syntaxing uh, an order that he just wrote on a lawsuit that was just published a few days earlier. I just randomly grabbed one. And he says, OK, sit down. We're going to talk. And Rehnquist and I became friends for the next 19 years doing covert translations. He gave me secrets of the Supreme Court and secrets of the operations of what a court judge has to know and everything that he gave me was in adverb verbs, so I had to syntax everything and then put it in the correct perspective. So he learned how to be correct from syntax. I learned the operations of the courts at the highest levels. So that gave me the power to go out into the world in any court, anywhere in the world, and be proficient about knowing the secrets as well as doing it from a syntax and proving how the lie works. This didn't just come by spontaneous combustion. It's just that the, the privilege of being in control of the math interface of language and then knowing how to translate this here and then put the missing words in and do all this. I gave him secrets in exchange for secrets. It was a barter. And, this, and John Roberts, who is now the Supreme Court Justice of the United States, was his aide for the 19 years. And when, Roberts, when Rehnquist died, Roberts took over because he was the only person that had syntax on his side because he worked with us. And when they tried to sell off Hawaii, he's already got 20, 21 years of experience in syntax. So when he's got a complete 50-page syntax document, it's not a joke. He fully understood what it said, and he fully understood how the people in Hawaii, the judges, couldn't read and write, and were just trying to run a bullshit scam against the Supreme Court. And the, the fully understood what it said, and he fully understood how the people in Hawaii, the judges, couldn't read and write and were just trying to run a bullshit scam against the Supreme Court. And the, the Hawaiian judges didn't know that they were prepared, waiting for them to walk into a trap. And they got thrown out of the Supreme Court with a real bad embarrassment. And this was all published in newspapers. That was back uh, 26th of uh, February, 2009. So then to use any flag, if you establish it yourself in quantum language, it, it has standing. Right. We have a lot of people that have, here in Australia, have copyrighted the flag of Australia already. Hmm. They actually went down and they sat down and I checked their, their, their declaration, I mean their, their claim for the flag, its dimensions, hmm. and in every single detail.
Okay, that, that the sentence structure was correct, and they the, filed a claim for it. As of the understanding, if the if the the, um, the flag isn't sort of recognised, it's um, a pirate flag. <coughs> well, you have different shapes. You have a three by four flag. You have a five by seven flag. You have a one by two flag. The three by four flag is your boat flag. The three by five flag is your military base flag. The so one by two flag is a constitutional flag. And then you have different colors. You can change the color of the blue field. You can change the different shades of red. And you won't even know you're in a different, a different uh, flag. There, there's another thing, so as I get this off here, I'll show you some stuff about flags. Before you wipe the bottom line, you have the word flags as a dangling participle verb. Correct. What is the um, infinitive of the verb flag? Or flags. I don't understand your question. <laughs> well, if that's a verb, then what is it in its pure state as an infinitive? It should be. It should be using a prepositional phrase by the flags. Well, if it's by the flags, then uh, that would be a noun, wouldn't it? It would be a fact. Correct. Well, you say that's a dangling participle verb. What would make it a verb? Two is an adverb. An adverb goes modifies. Forward. Modification is a change. A change is a motion. A motion is an action. An action is a verb. So you're saying just because it has the word to in front of it, that automatically makes the next word after it a verb, even Correct. though it's, and if that's not normally a verb, it's a dangling participle verb. Because you're ending a sentence in a verb. You can't end sentences in verbs. Right. So and, what and meaning have, does that have in a sentence now? What, what? What meaning does that have? What's the real Nothing. meaning? That's just it. The Queen is saying, we don't recognize the flags of Australia. We don't recognize anything. We never had a contract to recognize. We don't have lodial title to Australia. We killed the Aborigines and we stole their land. We built our buildings and our roads on top of it. And we haven't paid docking fees to put the road on the, in Australia. They owe the Origines 173 years of back rent to Dr. Vessels on the land. That's about a $40 trillion paycheck for the Origines. You think this was knowingly done? Yes, it was a, I can prove it. That's we did the same thing in, in Hawaii and the same thing in New Zealand. See, the unique, unique thing about Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, the, the Philippines, uh, the all these small places where Cook showed up and then the English showed up afterwards. The English, it might have been an English ship, but it was controlled by the post office. This is all about the post office, folks, from 1800, all around the world, all these sailing trips that took place. And these declarations that showed up, it was always the post office. What's the first thing that happens? One, the ship shows, the, the post office shows, uh, rather the uh, ship shows up, and it's always a military vessel. All military captains on a vessel are masons and postmasters. And they take their orders from the, from the Masonic order in Bern, Switzerland, and the, and the Vatican, and uh, the Central Masonic Lodge in London. I don't care what government you're working with, it's all controlled by the Central Post Office. Then as, the, as a mason, they use the philosophies to control people, and they initiate the kings and the queens of those... Uh, jurisdictions that they, they go into. They tell them they will give them anything they want and teach them all these philosophies to manage people and be successful. But when they join the Masons, they have to give up and surrender their king and queen titles and do what the Masons tell them. The Masons will then compensate them and give them the royalty and all of the fluff that makes them look par all powerful. Because the other people that control the banks, which is the money, control the shipping, the commerce, the import, the export, that do the engineers, that bring in uh, educated people who have engineering technology. You put all these things together, every one of them are Masons. They keep, that's where the secret society issue comes in. They all work together to honor the, honor the head Mason, who is the king or the queen, but that's the puppet. He gets all the flack. He gets all the honor that comes with the flack. While the postmaster, who is the postmaster general, runs everything, which is the port authorities, 
the money, and the transportation. Everybody wants to move. Everybody wants a freedom of movement. Nobody wants to sit in one place. You get bored. Boredom is a real bad, yeah, real bad pill to swallow. So the, mace, so, so the postmaster is going to make travel, build nice roads, and get the, the population, uh, establish voting, and then put all these toys out there that you're going to vote on because you like your freedoms. You like your running water and your, your shower and your 200 channel TV and all these things at the expense of the people who own the land. But then the people who own the land, uh, if they were stubborn enough to fight them, they all died of some natural cause <laughs> prematurely. And then the rest of the, the people that can't fight the technology. Uh, you watched the news last night. Falkland Islands. They just discovered they have 60 billion barrels of oil off the Falkland Islands that the British are going to drill. The Argentine government is up in uproar because they claim that the Falkland Islands belongs to them, and they, but they don't have the technology or the money to go to a war, another war, with Britain. Because Britain's got nukes and they got missiles and they got enough toys to do a lot of damage to Argentina. You mean they need uh, a plenipotentiary judge to give him a hand? I could go down there, yes, and with a contract, I can say, this is illegal, boys and girls. Show us your contract. You're trespassing. This is an international violation. But England's a small island, and they need, you know, they, they, England's pulling this. We got squatters' rights because we got bigger guns and bigger clubs. That don't make it right. <laughs> but that's always been the case. That's what they did here in Australia. That's what they did in New Zealand. Okay, back to syntax. On the word two, uh, you've got 1.9. Does that mean it's a uh, future, future tense, tense of word. the adverb? It's not only it's an adverb, it's a future tense word, which makes the flag to be a future tense verb. So they're not only, they're not only dishonoring the fact that it's a fact, they're taking the fact and they're changing it into something it isn't, and then they're moving it off into the future, so there's no now time jurisdiction to say, we did a now time violation. That's why all the twos come in. The United States Constitution bill has a Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights says you have the right to travel, the right to write, the right to read, the right to propagate. You have all these freedoms. Why? In two? Every single one of them starts with two, which means it's all in the future. We have no now time rights. And the minute I said that, and I published that all over the place, the United States government goes ahead and they drop the World Trade Center and say, all your rights are gone, folks. You've got to go through security, and everything is corporate. You want to walk into this building? You don't own it. You're going to be a trespassing individual. You need a passport. You know, Russell and I went to Europe. Russell mailed himself. He put a postage stamp and a flag on his chest, and he mailed himself to Europe. Went down to the post office, sent his body registered mail, put a registered mail sticker on him, signed his name across it, and he mailed himself to Paris. First time in the history since uh, in a hundred years that somebody transported himself a live body between point A and point B of a foreign government and got away with it. <laughs> and the reason he got away with it, and, and this is this, <laughs> this is really weird, as the 747 landed in Paris, all of the immigration and custom officers went on strike. So they had six supervisors to handle 4,000 immigrants coming through the gates. <laughs> we were backed up for a half a mile. I mean, this is really a... And they just opened the gates and they let everybody walk through, <laughs> including Russell. With his, I, they just said, hold up your passport, just walk through. And as I, Russell was with me, and uh, the guy goes, wait a minute, where's his passport? I says, he's a postmaster and he's mailed himself to Paris. I'm a postmaster and I'm... I'm I'm in charge of, the, uh, of, the, of my cargo, and I've signed my name across his, his uh, registered mail sticker. All right, you can go. <laughs> How did he get And that got, that got back to uh, the United States Postal Service and the State Department that Russell had mailed himself. Every judge in America was notified about this. It was, it was quite the route. How did he get through from America to get on the plane? Oh, then when we came back, we, we went down to the Vatican. We established our key master's position with the Vatican. Well, the head of the Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris is the great-great-grandson of Joan of Arc. 
<laughs> who was the key master with the Vatican. What are the odds of that? Mm. So we're there, and we've got to run a DC-10, 300 passenger, and we're all getting ready to take off. And here's Russell with a ticket, and he's mailing himself back to the United States. Well, the, the central of Bern, Switzerland, because we were just there and met with the United States Postal Inspector for the whole, whole European continent, and we spent an hour and a half with him. So he vouched for, for Russell's knowledge as a postmaster, but then the immigration and customs officers would not allow Russell to board the plane. He said he didn't have a passport. Well, we had filled out the necessary paperwork to mail him back to the United States. And I was the postmaster transporting my cargo, who was a fellow postmaster. And this wasn't, the guy wasn't buying it. So uh, he had to call up the supervisor at 2 o'clock in the morning to come down to the airport. And when he found out that we were both key masters with the Vatican and he was a key master, we had a really nice conversation. And he walked us through as, as, as diplomats with diplomatic immunity and didn't require passports because of our, our status. They called Rome. The Vatican vouched, or Cardinal Sedano vouched for us. So did the uh, State Department in Washington, which was uh, Postal Inspector Seuss. And Potter was the postmaster, vouched for us. So we had enough muscle from four different governments, vouched for Russell and I, that we got on the plane and flew back to uh, Philadelphia. So this is one of those, don't try this at home, boys. These are, right, these are, <laughs> The, the, these are, um, <laughs> this, was, this was something that got through the cracks. Everything that Russell and I have done for 10 years has been the first time it's ever been done in history because it was done through syntax. And so they slammed the door on anybody else ever trying to do anything that we were doing from getting a post, postmaster general position to being muster master at a Pentagon to key master with the Vatican, to uh, postmaster of the uh, Interpol, Bern, Switzerland, the uh, Universal Postal Union and Quantum, where they were in fiction. I mean, we captured, we captured Zurich, uh, the World Court, Interpol, uh, the Vatican, Washington, D.C., the Pentagon. I mean, we, we went around and we... we knocked all these things down, one one after another. They couldn't ca keep up with us. They, had, they were spending thousands and thousands of dollars trying to keep up with the airfares of us. Captured Vatican? Can you elaborate? Sure. When we wrote a syntax quantumized uh, international bank treaty with the Vatican, it was the first time they ever saw syntax. All their bank treaties worldwide since, since 79 AD were written in adverb verb and had no standing. Now that they've got a syntax quantumized bank treaty, it automatically vacated their entire position globally. And there's been nothing but trouble ever since that. So they, we still maintain our key master's positions and our postmaster's positions with the Vatican, and we do correspondence. Okay, well, we'll talk about that later. I'm going to go back to the syntax. <laughs> um, the word to, you said that's always in the uh, um, future tense? Well, they will use it as an adverb in future tense. So is there any time in Australia we use the word to in any um, in future past and present and most of the time it's used in the present? You yeah. only think it is. It's not. The rest of the sentence, all the different words that are here are going to articulate why the value of that word is what it is. Now the person that wrote this, you saw that there was a pattern. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, three, four. And those patterns of the queen don't change. I can look at any document I want. Queen Elizabeth has written. It's either written in one, two, or one, three, four patterns. Right. The reason I'm asking this, because we use the word to so much, and you said it is the most uh, bastardized word in the English language, um, that means we're going to be offending uh, our new knowledge of the syntax by being caught very easily using the word to. No, to is not found in my book. You've got 107 pages. The word two doesn't appear anywhere in my book. It doesn't have to be there for us to use it. <laughs> the point is, the point is your, your Freudian conditioning to use this word is only a, a conditioning. Right. Because you've been doing it so much for so long 
You're not qualified to do nothing. And that's exactly what happens when you use two. You create nothing. Right. So it teaches us how not to use it. Read the book. By the time you get done reading my book, you're going to see so many prepositional phrases and patterns and associations that your mind will automatically shift gears. Because when you read an adverb verb, you're going, this is wrong. I can do this. Every time you pick up a newspaper, the only thing you're going to be doing is syntaxing. If you told me how to do it, I'd be able to read your book. <laughs> <laughs> if you read, okay, people always read to yourself, right? You don't speak out loud. When you read to yourself, you're only your eye and your brain are registering. You have five senses. When you read out loud, you're speaking. So the mechanical part of your brain has to generate your speaking capacity. You have to be able to see. You hear what you're saying. You're holding, a, you're holding something in, in your hand, the mechanics of your eye moving back and forth. You've got all five of your senses working with you when you read out loud to yourself because you hear what it says. 90% of all the things you learn in life are from hearing what you hear on TV, on the radio, somebody else talking to you and teaching you things. That is your major connection to your brain, to your memory cells, is the, what you hear. So if you read my book out loud to yourself, all of a sudden, like, it's going to start registering it. You get into a court scenario, you're talking to a judge. You're in an oral conversation. He's talking to you in an oral conversation. But if you're reading and only the cells of reading are registering, your hearing part of your brain is uneducated to hear or to speak, to reproduce those sounds of what syntax sounds like. And so you, you're handicapping your own self. And, and besides, when you get in front of a judge, you're going to be nervous because you don't want to go to jail. That's always the, the threat and the intimidation scenario. But if you read and you read out loud to yourself, You've got all these different senses working together. So if one gets nervous, you've got your other backups, which are going to kick in and protect you. And it will calm you down. You'll be able to carry on a conversation intelligent. Not intelligently. Because you always want to put that L-Y, which makes all words that end in L-Y, are adverbs. Even the word family, only. Those are two words that are used all the time, but they end in L-Y. It's the L-Y words that kill you. And usually L-Y words, when you end the sentence, you're talking and you're ending that sentence with an L-Y word adverb. And so therefore, you've got a dangling participle. It should be a verb, but you've got a dangling participle adverb. Can you start a sentence with a pronoun? No. Only with a preposition. A pronoun says nothing. Just like, what is your name? But we start. That's a pronoun. I'm calling you. Sentences. We pronounce and adjectives. You're trying to grab that fuzzy little world of adverb verb fiction. You're brainwashed. That's why you're trying to make a brain, uh, an argument against syntax while because you're trying to use nothings. There, an adverb is a modifier. An adjective is a coloring modifier. A pronoun is a nothing. It means no, no, no. You don't have a contract for a pronoun. How can you make communications if you don't have a contract? So what happens if you start a sentence with a pronoun, like you and I and us and we? They're not always pronouns. I saw. I can be, in, in this case, I saw. It's adverb, verb. Or I am. I is an adverb, making am a verb. Or I can be the pronoun, and am is the adverb because it connects to it in front. Both of them are wrong. So what you're saying is that if you use a, a pronoun, a personal pronoun at the beginning, then it changes to an adverb if it's followed by a verb. No. Uh, in other words, if you're saying pen is, pen is a pronoun, is is an adverb. Mm -hmm. Is pen would be an adverb verb. Easy Both ways is wrong. You don't have a fact. You don't have a sentence. You don't have a prepositional phrase. You don't have a verb of thinking. And if you've got a verb thinking, where's the fact that you're going to be thinking about? You've got to have 13 words to make a legal sentence. That's the smallest sentence you can possibly write is 13 words. Anything less than that, you're just blowing smoke. So can you give us a running description of how 
a pronoun becomes uh, an adverb when you Like I said yesterday, if you ask me for a pen, I'll, I'll hold up a pen. If you ask me for a penny in Mori, I'm going to hold up a coin. But in Mori language, it means pen. Did you hear what I said, what I said, what I meant, what I said, what I meant, what I said? We got to have a communication. There's 5,000 languages out there. You're only thinking in one language, English. And English, E-N-G, is actually a D. In 1750, the English changed the D to a G because it was English, end of contracts. Somebody finally figured that out. So they changed it to a G so people wouldn't look for the word end, which means no. England was the end of the world, of Europe. You fell off it. Well, ever since Columbus in 1500 or 1492, they know that there was something else out there, and then people started exploring the world. All of the rules that you're talking about with syntax now and how words change and adjectives, are they all in the book, like from, from someone that's a beginner? Like styles, the like, it's in the styles manuals of all 250 countries. But where do we learn that if, if someone's just beginning to try and grasp an understanding of that? Is your book? My book explains it all, yes. My yeah. book explains it over and over and over again. To the point it becomes double speak. You can get on my internet site and look at it too. Yeah, I had a look there, at the internet site, so couldn't read. <laughs> <laughs> That's only because you haven't, you haven't come to the seminar and, and, had, and been exposed to all the things, the conversation. Fair enough. We don't need paper, we need, we need a washcloth or something, because paper doesn't do a good job. We need... see, see if the management's got a rag or like we had here yesterday. Or get some white, uh, get some markers that don't... See what you need is a dry marker. A dry marker just wipes off with an eraser. Because these things just smear. Yeah, if you ever take and put, accidentally grab a permanent marker and you white, put it on a whiteboard, the only thing that'll take a permanent marker is a dry, a dry marker. You immediately use that to erase the permanent marker and it'll come off. It's, the only, you know, it's because of the chemical that they put inside of it. And these are a little bit better, yeah. That's, that's a real coarse paper there. Yeah, that'll work better. <coughs> Yeah, this, this stuff here works better because they're softer. That's a real coarse paper. There. All right, now this here is a personal injury lawyer's writing. In, let me get my glasses. The... Uh, we're not going to use any names here because uh, to protect the innocent. <laughs> but this was a this case has been going on for three years. The lawyer in this case is becoming frustrated because he can't get the insurance company to settle with him. Now, when when you do when a, you write a legal contract. There's a law that says you cannot sign a blank sheet of paper, and a paper must have two legal sentences on it. As you can see, there's only part of a sentence that was brought over from the backside of this one. So this is not a legal sentence, nor is, is the autographs legal because they're both initials. You have to actually autograph something, not simulate it. And then the claim section is put into a box because Federal Reserve notes or uh, non-conclusive contract uh, values are not legal. So therefore, they box it. Anything in a box is an enclosed area and can't be considered. 
So therefore, your, all of your IRS claims that they send you here in Australia, or the same as in the United States, are all boxed, written in adverb, verb, double space, and italicized. So they're using four conditions of fraud to remove it and create the illusion. We then take, how do you fight your case? How do you get a settlement from an insurance company? Well, the, this insurance issue here is the same as my mom and dad. They were involved in a car accident. They wanted to give my mom and dad $2,000 because and they were senior citizens and they both had back injuries as a result of this car accident. This is an injury case also. It's almost parallel to all the experience I had in my dad's case. So, and my dad was, the, the insurance company sends out a 350 questions for interrogatories that they want him to answer, giving him all his personal history of his life going back to when he graduated from high school and he's 72 years old. And he's going, this is, this is ridiculous, and they want this before they're going to pay me. And I'm going, don't worry about it, Dad. I'll take care of it. So I went through, and it says adverb verb. says nothing. Doesn't, has no condition. And I went through all 350 questions. It says, this doesn't pertain to the car accident. Sent it back to the insurance company, saying, you can't read and write. Your paperwork is all fraudulently conveyed. Your questions are nonsense and have nothing to do with a car accident. Chuck it. And he did. So then the lawyer that they had would not take their phone call. So I call them up and I says, I've corrected, I've syntaxed the work that you've done for the insurance company. And by syntaxing the language on the page, you have my parents paid you money and hired you because you have risk management insurance to guarantee that if there's any physical damage in the contracting of your conduct, that the insurance company will, will pay the damages, better known as malpractice. So I said to the lawyer, the language that you are using is fraudulently conveyed, and now you're talking about money. So this is bank fraud. And the insurance company's lawyers are also fraudulently conveying their language back to you. And they are submitting a paycheck to their insurance company while they are fraudulently conveying language to keep this thing floating in the air and never coming to a conclusion. Well, at the same time that they are fraudulently conveying language and sending in a paycheck, the paycheck is reducing the assets of the corporation, which is the insurance company, which is traded on the New York Stock Exchange, which means they've extorted money from a corporation which is now stealing money from the shareholders and the Securities and Exchange Commission now has to come in and say, why are you paying employees to commit a criminal act under Title 18, Section 1001, and a Title 15, Chapter 2B, Section 78, FF, $25 million fine penalty and 30 years in prison while extorting money from a shareholder on the Securities and Exchange Commission? We only want $50,000. The penalty for fraudulently conveying language and extorting money from the Securities and Exchanges $25 million. And I've got a signed confession here. Will we, can we settle this now, quietly? And 48 hours later, we get a check in the mail for $2,500. And I'm going, yeah, right, OK. We need it. I says, Dad, Mom, I says, we need $385,000 for the aggravation and all the BS that these people have cost you. So we submitted a complaint of $385,000 to the insurance company. They immediately, all insurance companies worldwide, must take and put 10% of the initial claim in an escrow account, which they cannot touch. So that's $38,500. Plus, they have to take care of all the car expenses to rebuild the car and all the hospital medical expenses, which came to about another 30-some thousand dollars. But the the compensation for personal injury was 38500 I says, that is all you're going to get unless you want to spend three to five years in a court, get to a jury, and it'll be a crapshoot. You might win, but you're, there's a good chance you might not. There's an 80, 80, 20 chance on that. I says, so, I says, uh, by filing this claim and then showing them that the Securities and Exchange Commission is going to do an investigation on the lawyers from the insurance company as well as the individual who filed the claim with their lawyers where they acted together in a joint conspiracy to deny both the client and pay the insurance claim. 
And now we have a conspiracy, which is a 10-year prison sentence, to extort money, which is bank fraud and securities and exchange fraud. So now we got a whole stack, and everything on the back of my business card also applies. So all of these things are now set on the table, and we go and we meet with their, I call his, my mom and dad's lawyer up, and I says, uh, all these things are going to happen, and uh, all these things are going to happen, and I hang up the phone. My dad says, now what? I says, just wait. And I says, yeah, it'll probably take maybe 10, 15 minutes. I says, the phone's going to ring. Sure enough, eight minutes goes by and the phone rings. Can you be in my office in five minutes? So we go in there, go over to the lawyer's office, about six blocks from my mom and dad's house. By the way, they lived in Tampa, Florida at the time. And we walk in there and shake hands with the man. Nice, warm handshake. And then uh, I introduce myself as plenipotentiary judge, David Wynn Miller, and that I have your signed confession here for all these criminal acts. I had a whole list of them. I think it was about 22 of them that I read off to him, and how he had acted to create this language and work with the insurance company who created the language to violate the Securities and Exchange Commission's rules and regulations and constitute mail fraud. Then we got up and said, uh, we want $385,000. And I went to shake his hand, and he couldn't move his fingers. There was no blood left in his arm. His hand was as cold as if he had just soaked it in ice water for the last 10 minutes, and he couldn't move his fingers to shake hands goodbye. He couldn't talk. He couldn't hold a pen in his hand either to, say, to even take notes. He was that scared. And again, the next morning, we got a check for 2500 My dad says, what do I do? I said, tear it up. Tomorrow will be a check for 3500 Wednesday will be a check for 4500 Thursday will be a check for 5500 and so on, until we hit 385 And so every day... For the next 30 days, there was $1,000 more a day. And when he hit 38.5, he said, Dad, take the check down to the bank and cash it. You're all done. You got paid. They're going to take care of your car, your hospital bills, and you got 38.5 in your pocket, and it's tax-free because it's personal injury. And that was it. We never heard from the insurance company again. If you know how to get through the gauntlet, any one of you got a personal injury case, and I got the technology to take this as forensic evidence to get paid, in 30 days. And I can guarantee that. I don't care where you stand in the country. Because we told, uh, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> we're going to contact the insurance company. I sent text AIG. It was $100 a share. It dropped to a buck fifty. I sent text this insurance company's <coughs> paperwork, and they're, they're going to be out of business. And they already know what I did to AIG. So the minute I file a claim with these guys and tell them that I'm on board watching, they'll probably get this settled in the next 30 days without ever setting foot in a courtroom. And they'll get exactly what they want. When, I, when you get proficient at this information, and I talk to you on the phone, I'll say uh, 265672. You know that if you go to page 26 of my book, you're going to get the definitions, the tricks and the traps. You go to 52, you're going to get an 18-page Title 42. And if you go to 72, you're going to know how to prosecute an attorney in cross-examination. And if I only got two or three seconds to give you information, or you're in court and you're at the witness stand and I'm not allowed to talk to you and the judge has ordered me to sit there and keep my mouth shut, I can use, I can do this and do this I just said 23. I says, use page 23 for the tricks and the traps. You've already got it memorized, and you can go ahead and download on the judge because you just was something you got nervous and forgot about. That's how do you think basketball and baseball players talk in football? They're sitting there doing this here. You know, they're giving sign language to each other on the field, soccer, hockey, doesn't matter what it is. They, they all talk in sign language because these are preempted... Uh, documents, and all you have to do is be told what number to use, and it downloads 10,000 words of information. That's the unique thing about this technology. You can help each other once you, once you read the book, and you, got, you know where the page is. Pay attention to the pages, because if you work out a code with somebody else, and you need a partner in court, he can talk to you through sign language. You know, he just sit there and do this, do this. <laughs> You know, because when a judge talks to the DA in court, and you won't even see this happening. Yeah, and uh, Stephen showed you this a little bit of this yesterday. 
when we're cross-examining, the judge is doing this here, meaning talking to DA, saying, you open your mouth, you're going to go to, you ain't never going to have another case in here. Or the DA is asking for prison time in a case, and the judge is sitting there doing this here, which means I want four years in prison. The DA is, is sitting there going, no, I want, I want five years in prison, or ten years in prison. The judge says, no, I'm only going to give him three. And the other guy, the other prosecuting attorney, he's there and he's going, well, how about just two? You know, so they're having a conversation like this, using their fingers on their face. And they got this all rehearsed in the back room as they're going to negotiate in court. And they'll be talking one thing, but they're actually using fingers to, to articulate how many months or how many years this person is going to go to jail. So pay attention to the sign languages that are taking place in court because... If you know how it's being done, and I was in a gallery, and these guys were all doing the sign language, and I says, excuse me, uh, court reporter, these guys are talking in sign language, and you're not getting the whole story here. And she got up and walked out of courtroom. The case was called because they didn't have a court reporter. And they got caught. <laughs> with that sentence, there still are some serious uh, issues I have with it. Um, that's not in the first tense, uh, not in the first person. It's, it's on the th it starts off with the third person, and it doesn't specify that you were the runner, that I witnessed you running. Um, yeah, your witnessing claim is here. Right, but it doesn't specify who the runner okay, is. Okay, then we just add you as Sam's. Witnessing Sam's claim. witnessing claim. Right. How about that? And we that? changed the, the, the first uh, Sam to um, my... For, for my knowledge or for, the my, um, for my personal knowledge? Yeah, because the, you're not... Re See, you're the person that's watching a runner. See, the runner is irrelevant. He doesn't require the knowledge. He's in part of the sentence. It's your knowledge. You're the witness. So can I use the word uh, uh, personal pronoun instead of the name? Use what? My, the personal pronoun, my. No. My or mine. No, we don't use my, we don't use your, we don't use yourself. We don't use I or me. We don't use any of those because they're not first person specific. You have to have a specific name when you talk in a lawsuit. You have to specifically say that you are the claimant. Now, this is another thing I didn't tell you. When you write a lawsuit, at the beginning, the first thing says David Wynn Miller claimant. My name will be used as the claimant throughout the next 150 doc sentences on the page. At no other time, will my name be used as a first person specific because claimant is first person specific. Now when I'm in uh, a case I, with three other people as a witness, so we have three claimants. Now the, uh, in every, every sentence that ends where it's a witnessing or making a claim against the other parties doing the damage, it says for the, by the claimants because we are acting as a corporation suing this one individual and we, the three of us witnessing two or more, it's going to be claimants. And that way I don't have to keep writing everybody's name. It makes it, it simplifies the way documents are written when in law. This is standard procedure, whether it be fiction or in my technology, in fact, that, that terminology and that way of writing is standardized worldwide. So the personal names interchangeable with claimant in whatever uh, capacity it's on the documents but never with a personal pronoun. Right, you can't use a pronoun because you immediately drop it. You didn't take jurisdiction for the pronoun. Right. Um, then on the end of the sentence, if you can't use personal pronoun, um, what can you use to identify the, um, the person who was running? Can, well, if you have his you name, you're just name. simply witnessing a runner, that's all. Right, no, I'm making a witness that I can identify the runner, not just witnessing a runner. You want to identify your son as being the runner? Then put his personal name in here. And you can go here for Sam's knowledge of, of the, and then put a, pers a specific name and drop all this, take out one runner and just put a specific name is with a witnessing claim of the one runner. Who's the one runner? Well, instead of one runner, it would be the, your son's name as the runner. Right. But my, my, let, my letter or uh, claim is against you. So would I put your name in? 
I it's mean, not I'm the runner. Against, but making a statement. Of, yes, if you witness. want to state, because when you're going to swear a swear on an affidavit that you witness somebody, you can't use generics. You have to be specific that I saw this person shoot this person. He used his full name at this time and place and location. And now everything is time sensitive in law. Everything is location sensitive because of jurisdiction in law or in the law. Location, right, jurisdiction comes under. So a sentence, a sentence is not only, uh, it's, it's some, some location you have, to, you have to account for the time that the incident took place. You have to t account for the location because of jurisdiction. You have to account for the specific individuals who are, and give as much specific information, the name, address, social security number, has to appear someplace in the document. Uh, and any, uh, any witnesses that will corroborate your position in another sentence, because the document is a bonded document. So all these, all these points of information go together as a complete thought. If I were to write a document in the first person and referring to myself as I, I did this, I saw that, I did the other thing. No, you would be I a claimant. To, and then I gave it to the judge. And the judge would have read it. Out loud, and the judge would reading, be the one being the I. I. And the judge would be saying, I didn't do that. I right. Away, which is the reason why we need to be specific. That's so, why you're a claimant. You see, gold miners didn't file mortgages. They didn't file promises. They filed claims. Because claim and gold go together. That's why we use the word claimant. It's the strongest position of who you are. You're not a defendant. That's no contract. You're not a petitioner because you're not there yet. A petitioner is asking permission in the future, but is not a claimant because he has knowledge firsthand. You're not a respondent, which means no spoken contract. Now you're mute before the court. You don't want to be a respondent or a defendant. You are a, either Vasily, which is a servant employee of this document because your name's on it. You are better known as the United States. Two or more people coming together on a contract is the United States. The United States is defined as two or more people. You can either be the claimant or a Vasily. B-A-S-S-A-L-E-E. -E. The word Vasily, I copyrighted in 1999. That word never existed. Look up E-E -E in any dictionary that says employee. It's a fact. It's a word. E-E -E is a fact. You can use it in a Scrabble game. And a fossil is a servant. A vessel is a... A vessel is V-E-S-S-A-E-L, and vassal is V-A-S-S-A-L. And vassal is a servant employee of the paper. So if your name's on here, it's been stamped, you're under postal contract for commerce, they can't get out of it. Yes? Thank you, David. You mentioned page 23. Is this I, the book? Yes. 23 is not in here. Am I missing something? Or? Oh, it isn't? Or well, just misnumbered, that's all. <laughs> I write the numbers in by hand. Okay. It goes from 22 to 24. Did you lose one? Oh, I get it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I did those, because we made changes in them constantly, where I would take something out of content and say, well, this document isn't big enough, and I'll add two pages. I'll have 23A, 23B, because I didn't have time to rewrite all the numbers on all the pages from the master, from the master book that I have. Otherwise, it's, a, it's an issue. The master program, in other words, in my computer, was destroyed when my computer was burned up in the fire. And so the, the documents that I have that were completed have not been re hand retyped all back into the computer. So when we were going to change only one page between printings of one book and another book, I didn't have time to go out and hand type the entire 107 pages. That's nine point print. That's about three months of work for me. I'm not a speed typer. I'm still one finger here. <laughs> yeah. All the time. Do you want to take your 10, 30, 11 o'clock break? I noticed your book was all in uppercase shout. Any shout, right. A that? shout is a command. You must, you must be obeyed. You see, the government said, uh, this all came about in the Moser case 
with the uh, Secretary of State of the State of Wisconsin, uh, no, excuse me, the Attorney General of Wisconsin. Sued, I sued the Attorney General of Wisconsin for fraud in a lawsuit back in 1996. And this was in front of Judge Moser, the 96-year-old judge. And he went ahead and said, uh, Mr. Miller, why did you write all of your 12-page your document in uppercase? And he says, I noticed the E is a little higher, too. I says, well, I had a 1952 Bell typewriter. He says, you know, he says, that's the same one I used when I went to law school. He says, that damn E always, they had a... <laughs> Kicked up, he says that was the old ribbon, you know, the old ribbon typewriters to see in the black and white movies. Well, that's what I wrote my very first lawsuit on. And uh, he kind of chuckled with that, and he says, "How come you didn't? How come you didn't write it in lowercase?" I says, "Well, the uh, lowercase key is busted on there." He says, "Well, how come your name's in upper and lowercase?" I says, "Because I had to use a needle nose pliers to pull the key up and then tap it with a screwdriver." <laughs> To write my name in upper and lower case to make it work and to do a whole document like that would be kind of redundant. This is when I was real poor and starting out, you know. So he, had, he, he had, says, well, I got to give you credit. He says, how long did it take you to type this? I says, four months. He says, just with a, one key at a time and making sure that the typewriter was working right and replacing ribbons. He says it was quite a mess. He says, yeah, I see all the smudges on here. So then he turns to McDermott. Now, McDermott was the attorney general at the time of Wisconsin. He says, how come you did... How come you wrote all your lawsuits back to Mr. Miller in Alper case? He says, well, I didn't know what he was doing, so I copied him. <laughs> he says, you're the attorney general. You're supposed to know syntax. The attorney general says, what syntax? <laughs> well, after the judge got on laughing, he says, all right, he says, uh, it means shout. And that's when he educated me on the word shout and the, what I was doing. He says, it's a command that must be obeyed, he says. Because you wrote in syntax, a syntax command has jurisdiction over an adverb verb, which doesn't say anything in shout. It's just shouting nothing. And I won that case because I wrote it in, in, in shout and I wrote it in, in correct syntax. And that's why my book has always been in uppercase shout and so is my website. Now, even when I type on the computer, I send messages back and forth on my emails. I, I put it in uppercase, and a lot of my students come back and, what are you shouting at me for? Some people know about it, but it's, it's a word that most people don't know about. That's it. Uh, you guys satisfied with this? And I'll put another sentence up. Take your break, and uh, while you're taking your break, I'll do the writing. Yeah. David, can you please talk about, um, you mentioned about your um, near-death or death experience. No, I wasn't near death. I was legally dead by all medical reasons for 35 minutes. Can you, can you talk about that? And can you sort of talk about around your purpose, around what you're here to sort of the big picture around what you're to, to communicate and what the end game is? And also, um, some people made comments about walk-in energies and conjuring and, and channeling information data where that's coming from for you. Well, okay. How many of you remember the old TV series? I don't know if you brought that broadcast this down here. Well, uh, I Dream a Genie by Barbara Eden. Some of you saw that, okay. Well, I was 18 years old one day and I, I was watching that on TV and Genie's father come in, he was the big zen and took away Genie's powers and gave them back to her at the end of the show. And after the show was over, I said to myself, uh, of course the fantasy of Genie's and having all the power in the world, what is power? The word power is meek, M-E-E-K. The Bibles, the Bibles all around the world tell you the meek shall inherit the earth. A meek person has absolute power over life and death. And he uses it to teach people. He's a teacher. He does not use his power to hurt anybody. That's what the word doctor means, isn't it? Teacher. Doctor? The word doctor, I think it means teacher. I don't know. I haven't looked that one up or researched it. Uh, so I, I looked up the word meek. I, I found out what the definition of it was. And then I was 18 years old, and I stood in front of the mirror, and I looked at myself in the mirror, and I says, if you were given absolute power, the knowledge over all things, what would you do with it? And I says, well, I wouldn't hurt anybody with it, because I'm not, I don't, it's not part of my personality. And I like to teach people, so I says I'd become a teacher. 
And I said to myself out loud, would you make a promise to yourself that if you were given absolute power that you would become responsible as a teacher? And he would never hurt anybody with it. And I says, yeah, I would do that. So I'm having a, a two-way conversation with me and the guy in the mirror. Don't laugh. I was a marriage counselor for 12 years. I, I know how to talk, how to communicate with people and how do people communicate with other people. So I'm, I'm going to share this with you. So I said, yeah, I can do that. And I made a promise to myself that I was ever given the, the absolute power that I would become the teacher. And I would be a friend and expand upon that and dedicate my life to it. Well, a few years later, a couple days after that, I got beat up in the 1968 riots in Milwaukee. And I was held down by four boys while the fifth one proceeded to kick my right kidney like you'd tee a football. And it killed my right kidney, and they damaged my left one. So I got kicked four times in the left side and seven times in the right side. So my I had a dead kidney in me for seven years. It was excruciating pain on a day-to-day -day basis because I had a sack as big as my fist of dead black material in my side. And even at that, I had to work every day doing physical labor with the pain, and I got used to it. So my body created a super immune system because of the level of poison I had to deal with. Then when I was on December 3rd, 1975, I went into surgery to do an exploratory. The doctor, Pollard, who was the number one kidney specialist, he, I don't think he's alive today, uh, was supposed to do the surgery. He was out on the golf course. All the doctors came into the operating room with masks on. And I had a South Korean doctor who was only there as an apprentice who had never cut anybody in their life started to slice into me. Took out three ribs, took out my dead kidney, took my adrenal gland off the right side as well. Then he thought he was supposed to take both kidneys out. So because he couldn't, didn't want to cut the other side open because I was already laid in half from my navel to my spine, he went ahead and he went through my chest cavity, pulling everything apart, and uh, cut my left, he couldn't get at the left kidney completely, so he cut the left kidney in half, and he removed the left kidney, top half. There's five chambers, he took the two out with the adrenal gland, as soon as he removed my adrenal gland, I went into anesthesia shock and I was flatlined because anesthesia is a poison. I was legally dead and he knew they screwed up. And of course they told my parents and my brothers and sisters that I had died. And I was in the morgue for 35 minutes, cut in half, laying on a gurney. And the, the head nurse was down there and she, she's the one that told me the story after the fact. She says, uh, your heart started beating. And the, the coroner just said, oh, just let it, it's just gas from the body decomposing. And he, she went and she pulled my eye open with a flashlight, and she says, no, his eye's responding, his brain's alive, we've got to sew him back up. So they called the code blue, rushed me back upstairs, took him 11 and a half hours to put me back together. After, they couldn't figure out why I was alive without adrenaline. And when they did the blood work, my endorphin level was 60 times higher than a normal person, which is an amino acid. <clears throat> with no adrenaline in my system. I had been completely altered for some reason. Now the adrenaline that I have, now the, the endorphin that I have is an amino acid which is the food for the brain. After I found out over the years of researching why I was still alive, and the, uh, the hospital continued to maintain my blood type every month, take blood samples to see why I was still walking around because you can't live without adrenaline. And having half of one kidney, I didn't require any dialysis either. And I was in perfect health. And I also had a 25 heartbeat. Anything below 40, you'd be in a coma. And I'm walking around with 25. And I did this for 35 years with 25, until I electrocuted myself in my garage and it went up to 60. <laughs> <laughs> Kid you not, I forgot to unplug the extension cord when I put the, put the end of it together. and I grabbed it with one hand, the socket and the screwdriver in the other, and I <laughs> took 110 across the chest and reprogrammed my heart from 25 beats a minute to 60 beats a minute. Now it's back to like 30 beats a minute right now, 30, 35. About a, three years I had a lot of energy. <laughs> but the, uh, the endorphin levels, uh, and I, with me staying awake and maintaining an A average in school, working two full-time jobs at the same time, not sleeping. My nephew comes to me. He's, he's having trouble staying awake. He's going to, to computer school, and he says, 
Uncle David, he says, how do you do it? How do you run 24 hours a day without sleep, go to college, and do all these things that you do, studying, working? He says, what's your secret? And I says, well, it's the endorphins. I says, the endorphins that I have are brain food. Now, what they've done is they have accelerated my IQ from 140 to over 200 because it made neurons. Remember the movie Phenomena with John Travolta where he had a brain uh, uh, cancer which was fibristic and connected uh, brain cells? Well, that's what happens with you increase your amino acid in the brain. You take a 400% dosage of the amino acid, which is the brain food, and it causes your neurons, instead of having six contacts per nerves, I got like 20. So the exponential contacts of all the nerves have given me a brain that's like a supercomputer. And then it grew both of my brains together. So I only have one brain. I don't have two hemispheres. I have one. They did this in a CAT scan to prove this because of all the connections. So I re I'll do this for you as soon as we get the board off of here. Uh, I write with both hands frontwards, backwards, and in both directions at the same time, legibly. I can write left-handed as easy as I write right-handed. Frontwards, though, I don't have to do this like Obama does. So I can, my, my left side can see my right side, and my right side can see my left side. And while I read left to right in subject matter, I read backwards at 400 words a second in math codes. It's kind of something that only I do. I can't teach it to anybody. It's just something I do. And it allows me to absorb huge amounts of information. Uh, people bring me lawsuits. I did one last night for an hour. I had a hundred, I think it was about 100 pages, 120 pages to read in an hour. And then come up with all the solutions of how to solve the problem with all the laws, rules, and regulations. And to me, it's just a cakewalk to, to, to absorb that much information and process it. Same thing it is to break, break down sentences and, and show you what the, the secret codes mean. And what we're going to do here, um, well, I'm not done with this. The amino acid, everyone in here has amino acids that feed your brain. Now you have, uh, I believe it's 14... 14 or 18 different blood types and groups, and there's eight amino acids in your body. So your chances are one in 64 that you're going to hit the right one. If you can isolate the amino acid based on your blood type to feed your brain, you can go to a, uh, one of these nutrient stores like GNC. That's what we have up in the United States called GNC. It's a nutrient store. And you can isolate your blood, your amino acid for your brain and take a 400% dosage every day, you can increase your IQ every day. Now, when I was in, in Denver, I had a man who was involved in an automobile accident and he had part of his brain removed and he was mentally retarded when he came to the seminar, he could barely speak. And he found his amino acid and he went on a 400% a day dose and he also used a frequency zapper to accelerate uh, cell regeneration. And he came back to a seminar 12 weeks later. He had a full-time job, and his IQ went up 60 points. He went from mentally retarded to being a normal person, carrying on a normal conversation with anybody and having a full-time job, and he got his life back. And he'd sit up and did a testimony for all the people in the audience as to where he, the people met him the week when I was there the first time, and they came back three months later, and it, the same people came to the seminar. And now they got to see this man who had recovered from, a, from being mentally retarded to being a normal person again because he was taking the amino acids to rebuild his brain. So anybody can do it. You just got to figure out what it is. Now you would have to go to a doctor, have your blood analyzed, Isolate the amino acids that are in your blood and then find the one that's specifically generated for your brain and you've got to get a doctor to cooperate with you. And usually anesthesiologists are the ones that specialize in the blood chemistry because they have to use anesthesia with the blood and they've got to cook this formula up together. So they would be the people to go to. Your country might not allow this. And you know what the most dangerous person in the world is? An educated person. 
look at what I'm doing with education and the, the way I flipped planet Earth over, having syntax. So I was given the, the gift of, if you ask a judge what does syntax mean, he says it is the most powerful thing on planet Earth. He who controls syntax controls the world. Because this technology disqualifies everything that's ever been written, and the most expensive, high-paid, uh, rather the highest-paying job around is brain surgery, followed by contract writers. If you can write contracts and syntax, like I'm writing constitutions, I can sit down and, and it took me three months to write the United Nations Constitution, Australia's, New Zealand, and Hawaii's constitutions. And what I do is I take the existing constitutions. I remove all the things that are future, all the things that are past, all the things that are negative. Get a book of synonyms, look up every single word, find the now time definition, organize the words in the correct sentence structure, communication syntax, and then put the missing words in to complete the sentence. And it's all done algebraically. Once the algebra is certified frontwards and backwards, and the sentence can't be obstructed, it's then put into the Constitution, and there's 69 sentences in the Constitution. It is a foundation by which you can study from to improve. And I think as a group of 50, you were to read the Constitution as a group and try to add more things to it, you could make it better. But in New Zealand, as well as the originis here in Australia, the question was, well, somebody's got to do something. Somebody's got to do something. The American Indians, somebody's got to do something. That's all I hear is... Somebody's got to do something. The Canadian Indians, the Eskimos, every place they go in the world, somebody's got to do something. I'm going, well, okay, I'm going to do it. And I went ahead and I wrote all these constitutions. I wrote these lawsuits. I wrote all these programs. I put everything together. I said, I don't need your permission to do it. You prove it's wrong or make it better than it is. And there's your motivation. What is meek? Meek means I have the power to control the thinking capacity of six million people, to take this planet screaming and hollering into the future. I want a world where my kids can grow up, that they don't have to play, what is the answer to two? <laughs> or what is your name? Where word games can't be an issue. That everything is as black and white as a math problem because nobody ever went to war over a math problem. So I broke the code and I wrote the language in a math problem that no one can argue with. It removes anger. Some of you people have, have been like, I don't know, how many seminars have you been to now, Steve? 12? Besides the ones you do? And even the, one that, even the ones that he does, when I'm not there, there's a philosophy of this teaching program because it's a math procedure, your brain is looking at things mathematically. It's not looking at it from an emotional standpoint. Even me talking about religion yesterday. Who was God? I didn't see anybody in here get upset. Because I watched your faces and you all smiled. You said, that was how I learned religion from a thousand different sources. And it was so unique to me that nobody else can tell me who my God is. And it's the same thing with this technology. Whether he teaches it or I teaches it, the audience are at peace with it because it's a math procedure. It doesn't irritate the brain of, this man lied to me or told me something that wasn't true. And, I, and after 940 seminars in front of tens of thousands of people, and nobody gets upset, uh, we must be doing something right. And we don't get any negative feedback. And I want to make another statement about the scam site on the internet. All the people that are involved in a scam site were, were criminals, committed criminal acts, and went to jail for criminal acts. They tried to use truth to get out of criminal acts. Didn't work. So they went ahead and they put their thing up there saying, truth doesn't work to save me from me doing something bad. And this, this girl called uh, Colleen Darling Lloyd, who claims to be my wife, she worked at an employment agency. She downloaded my credit report, got my social security number, and then had four MasterCards issued as my wife because she had all the classified information under identity theft. She did it to 12 other men as well. She then went on a shopping spree for 100,000 bucks. She took 4,000 off of my card alone. Yeah, and I prosecuted her and put her in prison, Utah State Prison for five years. 
and she worked for an attorney when all this was going on. He bought the, New York, the Las Vegas Times newspaper to slander me. And she used to be an employee at, the, at that newspaper. And she followed this program because she got arrested several times and put in jail for wrongdoing. And I had her cases dismissed because I was doing seminars in Las Vegas, roughly 14 different seminars. And she came to follow the program. And because uh, she felt that uh, she was writing all these good articles, she was in, uh, had a, what's the word I want on here? She looked at me as being her savior because I could always make her lawsuits go away. And she wrote good articles in the newspaper because all the lawsuits I won in court in Las Vegas as well. And then when a law lawyers were being embarrassed and judges were being embarrassed, the Lawyers Association bought the newspaper and then slandered the truth. Lawyers were being embarrassed and judges were being embarrassed. The Lawyers Association bought the newspaper and then slandered the truthful language. And she had to work there and either slander or get fired. Well, she got fired because she wouldn't slander. Then she wanted compensation, got herself hooked up with four other scam artists, where they're better known as grifting, and then went ahead and downloaded and thought they could steal and not get caught. And they got caught and they went to prison. And if you read the article, it, it's all up and down. Emotionally, it's, it's a disturbed individual who did some bad things. And then wrote this article and put it up there on the, on the internet. I have a disclaimer up there as to all the different scam issues. I've never hurt anybody or taken anything from anybody. People that go into court half-baked get half-baked when they come out. If you don't have knowledge, like I said, you go from that wall to that wall. How many mistakes do you get to make? If you don't study, this is not a 10-hour program. This is not a 50-hour program or a 100-hour program. This takes an average person 200 hours to become proficient, just to understand what this sentence means and how to break it down. Most of my students that are good have two to 10,000 hours of study. I've got 74,000 hours of study, and I've been at this for 30 years. But this is my... This is my calling in life. This is my job. This is my contract with my God that I will be a teacher and teach quantum correct mathematical facts. And that's, where I, that's my spirit. I want to make sure there's a world for my kids and a world for my grandkids. And everybody that says, seen this program, uh, it changes you. Now, another thing is the mirror. Just like I had made a contract with myself when I was 18 years old. A husband and a wife, or a boyfriend and a girlfriend, you have problems. You, when you talk, when you talk, when I talk to you, I can't see my facial expressions. I can't see my eye contact. I can't see who I am and what I look like as how I present myself to you. Nor can you see what you look like talking to me or looking at me. I can see from your facial expressions, your body language, your smiles, if I'm making sense to you because you smile back at me, because you're learning something, because the mind is always happy when they're active. So if you have a problem with yourself, stand in front of a mirror and talk to yourself if that's the only person you trust. If you have a partner or if you have children and you want to have a discussion with your kids, don't talk to them face to face. Stand in front of a mirror. Now you've got four people there. You have to look yourself in the mirror. You have to look yourself in the eye. And you've got to talk to yourself as well as to the person standing next to you. You have to see and listen to yourself. Right now you just listen to yourself, but you don't see yourself. And when you see your own body language, 80% of communications is body language. So now you get to see who you are and what, how you perceive yourself to the world when you talk to yourself. And you'll learn much more about who you are. And whether you're talking to your child or talking to your spouse or your girlfriend or boyfriend, you're going to have, you'll be able to solve communications because you see body language and you get eye contact feedback. It's very powerful information. And it makes a difference between getting a divorce and staying together. Another thing is you are what you eat. I can take any one of you in this audience, put you on meat and potatoes for 90 days. And I will create a personality and a body chemistry type that will perform a specific way. 
I can then take you off meat and potatoes and put you on vegetables. And in 90 days, I will completely change you and you will be a different personality and a different person. I can then take you off of vegetables and give you nothing but fruit. And in 90 days, I will change you again and then I will put you on junk food. Uh, crackers, potato chips, uh, whatever, you know. And that, and I will change you again. Take a husband and a wife. They live together, they eat together, they work together. And then along comes the seven year cycle. 80% of all human beings, both men and women, go through a chemical change every seven years. It takes 14 months for this chemical change to take place. The chemical change will start very slow, and about the fourth month you get into it, you want to change your diet, change your clothes, change your job. And by the time this thing accelerates itself, you want to get a divorce at the end of 14 months. You want to change partners, you want to change jobs, and you stop eating together. And the wife might be at home feeding doing the, uh, a normal meal, meat and potatoes and vegetables for the children, and the husband's out eating junk food or, or sandwiches or drinking beer or something and has a different diet because of a work schedule change. And all of a sudden, like, his body chemistry changes. When the body chemistry changed, the scent, S-C-E-N-T, S-C-E-N-T, changes. And all of a sudden, like the attractiveness that kept you together when you got married because you were attracted to each other's scent and condition of thinking because your chemistries were the same, have now grown apart. You don't smell the same. You don't think the same. Your personalities are different. And all of a sudden, like you're living with a stranger. And after a while, it becomes so intolerable you can't stay together anymore. So if you're aware of chemistry changes, scent changes, food changes, sleeping patterns, and you sit down and you discuss it, you can get back to where you were. You, you can normalize your individual. See, in the old days, in the covered wagon days, before we had all the trans, instant transportation, a husband and wife would go out on a farm, they'd eat the same food, live together from cradle to grave. They didn't ever think about divorce because they, they were partners. Chemi chemically, they were partners. Today, we are separated. We sit on computers. We don't talk to each other. We, have, we develop all these different differences. And the world breaks down and we all become individuals. So stay, you, can, you can become anything you want to become in life. But you've got to know what your diets are. You've got to know what your personality is, your scent. Be a, you, know, you have to be, pay attention to things. What your, your, take your vitamins, your glucosamine. Know about zappers to stay healthy. There's five forms in life to take place. Your first rule is physical and mental health. Your second one is contract. You must honor all contracts that you make because if you honor your contracts, your physical and mental health will be intact. The third thing is you must uh, take care of the things you create. In other words, children, if you have children. Because you created an entity that's going to grow up. Because if you take care of your children, they are a reflection of who you are, which affects your contracts and your honor, which affects your physical and mental health. The fourth thing is your job. You have to work. You have to be, you have to have a, a job to support the children. Oh, wait, I got that wrong. Children, uh, your job comes third, and then the children come fourth. Because you've got to have the job to support your health to support your, uh, rather your contract, because if you don't have money, you can't make a contract, and then your physical and mental health. When you get these things out of, out of track, the whole thing falls apart. And then the fifth thing on the list is your, your spouse. They are an independent individual. Whether it be men or women, that comes five on the line because they have the same rules and regulations. They have to maintain their physical and mental health. They have to maintain their contracts that they honor. They have to maintain their jobs and ability to uh, feed themselves, earn money, earn respect, earn whatever it takes in the world, and you both work together to take care of the children. And if you, stay, if you keep these five rules intact in your life, you will find that you will be successful throughout, and you will get through all the hardships you have in life. 
Anybody questions on some of these philosophies and issues? There's a, there's a lot of, I, I specialize in like 115 different fields because of the amount of reading I do. I've been a day trader in the stock market for 41 years. I, so I research companies that are developing medical technologies, sciences, engineering that are futuristic. And then I cross-reference this thing. Sometimes a company will develop something in 1980, for instance, 30 years ago, and it failed. It doesn't work in society. Well, next generation comes along, and now it's 2000. The same company wants to go ahead and do the same thing. I'm going, that company's going to fail. It looks really good at first. I'll short that company because it, the project doesn't work. And it'll just it'll go high because it's an idea which nobody remembers 20 years earlier, and it'll slide off into oblivion and be worth nothing. So I'll make money on it. So... By, by doing all this reading, when you put money on the table, $50,000, your learning curve changes when you want to study an object that you're going to buy and invest that much money in it. So you learn in depth. You learn about how the company is run. You learn about mechanics, corporates, corporate structure. That's why when I come into a country, I can go ahead and set up like the Origines. I can sit down. I can show them how to set up corporation how to write contracts, how to have a corporate trust. That's what we did in Hawaii. Got the Hawaiians organized, had a corporate trust, educated them how to read and write in quantum, how to, how to run a business as a corporation, have a board of directors, have elections, elect judges, have license plates, driver's license, insurance, so they have the right to travel and communicate with each other. We're not just a bunch of unorganized yahoos. And because the United, the United States government has recognized the Hawaiian kingdom and their ability to organize on a responsible level under Robert's Rules of Order, they are functioning and growing as an independent entity, and Hawaii is getting back their identity to become a sovereign island again. But Hawaii is owned by the United States Postal Service, it's owned by the Japanese Postal Service, and it's owned by the Chinese Postal Service, as well as the Hawaii Postal Service. There's four entities on that island. So that's, uh, it isn't what you, everybody thinks it is. Japan regards Hawaii as one of their states, so does China. And with 35% of the population is Chinese and 35% is Japanese and 20% is white and the rest are Filipino and Hawaiian. So it's, uh, it's a melting pot in the Pacific. And they're cousins to you guys down here, so. Uh, think of any questions before I start on this? Um, yes? Uh, I think I heard on one of your discs that you're um, looking at, well, the banks worldwide, and I think you're talking about a currency that you're setting Yeah, we're, we're currently, currency. since 1990, we went to the United Nations. We served 82 countries with bank treaties. This is a 115-page document. has all the notarized, the CPAS, the C-Treaty, the drug law. Russell Gould and I created this here. We have all the postal treaties involved with that, as well as the bank constitutions, the bank uh, transfer of money, all done in syntax language. Uh, there is no money in the syntax world. We deal strictly in gold, silver, and minerals. We currently have, uh, I believe it's close to 400 million, troy, uh, million tons of 999 silica, which is used for all computers and TV screens in a single deposit in Wyoming. Uh, that's our mineral deposit for our bank. But we're, we haven't touched it. It's just, you know, it's in the ground. These are crystals that are 60 feet long and 8 feet diameter. And it was discovered in 1953 while elk hunting, back when there were elk in, in the Rocky Mountains. And then we wrote a quantumized uh, land patents on the, doc, on the mineral deposit, and we filed that with the Department of Interior. And the Department of Interior tried to sue for that uh, our mineral claims were irre irrelevant. I said, yeah, in what language you guys, the, mineral, the in Department of Interior, say that they own it? They don't have any, any constitution. They don't have any correct sentence structure, communication, and syntax. They even have a charter or an oath of office. And our, our claims were upheld at the federal court level. So we 
we have access to these things if we want to go ahead and mine them. They started mining them last year. There's other areas around the world where gold and uh, silver deposits have been contracted to go into a, a quantumized banking. Russell's currently overseeing that. Uh, we have activity taking place in Sydney, uh, Auckland, Dubai, uh, London, uh, the insurance with the insurance companies worldwide with the Chinese on Syntex banking. They, everyone has the banks. They've had 10 years to study the information and get their people in order, but the whole world has to shift together. You can't have a banking truth and a banking fiction simultaneously because it, the truth is going to disqualify all fiction. Last year, we syntaxed the insurance and the mortgage contracts, which created the Great Depression in the United States with, and collapsed our housing market. We have 5 million foreclosures taking place as a result of that. And so everyone's really upset, but it's got to change. I mean, it's got to get fixed. So we'll go ahead and we'll do this. Yeah, we got 20 minutes. All right, this is a... A lawyer wrote this, and the lawyer who wrote this is got four wheels spinning in the mud, and he's not moving anywhere. Now, the adverb we is undefined. Will becomes the verb. Be making arrangements, which is a no contract word. So making is an adjective here, making arrangements to be a pronoun. Now, for you... Now, he's calling the client a verb here, and he's calling his law firm a we. So the law firm is an adverb, and the client is a verb. Where's my fact? Now, to be is an adverb verb in, in future time, which means the possessive has been removed, moved into the future. And then they put medic, a medical, is a medical exam. Instead of saying medical exam, it's medically exam, adding L-Y to make it an adverb, modifying the exam to be no contract as a verb in past time and becomes a conjunction neutral. For assessments, which means no contract, M-E-N-T is contract. And uh, they're going to make that into a coloring with what? With is a pronoun. So they're going to color nothing. And he said nothing here, so he's coloring nothing. A is an adverb, making a doctor to be a verb because doctors only practice. P-R-A means no contract. Doctors will write the reports in boxes. They will write it in adverb verb, italicize it, and double space it so that there is no medical report that you can come back and sue for malpractice. The doctor will guess about most of the things he puts down. Because he doesn't know the history of an individual, he can only see what's in front of him at the time, and can't certify collectively what a car accident does to an individual short of seeing a broken bone or a ruptured organ. He has to guess about everything else. So they turn him into a verb. In due course becomes an adjective, I mean an adverb, adjective, pronoun. But when you're dealing with a, an adverb over here, this adverb can make doctor to be an adjective and in to be the pronoun and due course to be an adverb verb, turning it into a dangling participle verb. Now, when all possible, a an attorney, if I look at all the rest of the sentence structures that this attorney has written in 125 pages, if he ends sentences in a dangling participle verb, that means that this is his volition to never complete a sentence, and then this will be correct because it it is, is associated with all the rest of the patterns that he has been creating. And so this first, this top line here is, a, is a, a fiction. So is the bottom line a fiction, but this is a more correct fiction based on the other patterns and associations that an individual has done. So in a, a medical examination or an insurance claim, we would go ahead and take, how would you write this? The question is, how would you write this? We showed you what's wrong as a syntax sentence. Well, first off, we doesn't exist, is, exist here. Will, we're not going to use that word because that is undefined. Be is undefined. Making is undefined. Uh, arrangements, 
is a future tense thing. It doesn't, it's a no contract word. That comes out. But if they're going to make an arrangement, you got to have you got to have a contract. So the law firm is going to go ahead and have knowledge. Oh, this here is interfering with us. This is the word justice, J-U-S-T-I-C-E. J-U is no law, S to speak, T-I is title, C-E is judge. Judge title speaks no law. That's what justice means. You want justice? You get the same justice as everybody else gets. <laughs> no law. That's one of the traps. You know how we found that? The dome in the state of Wisconsin has Lady Justice standing like this. In, it's a mosaic on the, on the ceiling of our dome, our capital dome. And it's J-U-S-T-I-C-E. I'm going, why would you break a word up like that? So I looked up the symbols of J-U-S-T-I-C-E in, uh, the, Masonic, in the, the Masonic codes, and this is what it says. So they were advertising. And Authority always runs backwards, so there it means uh, judge title speaks no law. Okay. Uh, the implication is for you. Two B is in future time. We don't want anything to do with that. We, we know we've got to have something to be a medical exam. So that's relevant, but that's a compound word. But a medical exam, EX means no. Uh, so for a law firm's knowledge of the client, client's damage is With the medical claim, of now assessment means no contract. We don't want to be assessed. Of the evidence, doctor is irrelevant, due course is irrelevant. Uh, of the evidence with the damages, uh, not damn body damages, possessive bodies damages, by a doctor. There, now that's the correct sentence. That one will hold up in court. That one will get you paid. So we don't want a doctor to do an exam. We want a doctor to certify the fact that there is a damage. In other words, show me a x-ray of a broken bone. That's physical. That's not an opinion. Uh, proves that somebody has a headache. Anybody can say they have a headache. Prove it. Well, if you take a picture of an aneurysm or something that's a disorder within the brain, yes, we'll have physical proof of it. They can do a blood test and say your blood pressure is too high. You have too much uh, uh, creatinine in your blood. That'll cause a headache. Do you know what headaches are caused by? Two things. High blood pressure or low blood pressure, or you've got to go to the bathroom. Because if you don't go to the bathroom, whether it be urine or feces, you got too much poison in your bloodstream. Take, and the second, and there's another cause. If you have, uh, if your flatworm creates too much feces in the cartilage, it'll create pressure in the spinal cord, better known as nitrin, nitrogen. And uh, if you take and you crack your neck and break the bubble, 
usually it takes about three seconds from the time that the nitrogen bubble removes itself from the spinal cord, your headache goes away. So sometimes it's just as simple as cracking your neck, going to the bathroom, or checking your blood pressure. If your blood pressure is either up or down, it means you have a chemical imbalance in your system due to probably your diet. Say again? You might need water, you might need coffee with a little, little caffeine in it to jake, jack you up a little bit, or some ginseng. You might need uh, to calm yourself down. If you've got hypertension, take some baking soda. Pull your pH down in your blood. Baking soda is great. You've got jumpy legs, leg cramps, sore feet, any of those kind of things when you lay down. As soon as you lay down, your blood pressure in your legs drop, changes. It goes from 180 down to 100. There's not enough circulation to remove the amino acids out of your bloodstream, you get leg cramps. Take baking soda. It's the safest, cheapest cure-all that you can imagine. 15, uh, 15 seconds later after you drink it, it'll totally check your whole bloodstream. What sort of dilution? What's that? What sort of dilution? I use a half a teaspoon in of four ounces of water and drink it. That's enough to knock it out of you. Based on, I weigh 180 pounds, so. That always takes care of me. If you're a 240 pound guy, you might want to take a whole teaspoon. Or a 300 pound person might need, through it, might need a whole teaspoon. 100 pound person, maybe a quarter of a teaspoon. Take whatever you need. If that's not enough and you still feel a little bit tight, take a little bit more. If you take too much, it'll make you feel like really weird for about 20 minutes, but your body will neutralize it. <laughs> yes, question. If, if you're corresponding with company or corporation or a bank or whatever, like with the first letter it was understanding uh, we will be making arrangements for you to be medically examined uh, for the assessment with the doctor in due course. I get that completely, I know what's coming up. If I received something in the mail that said for the law firm's knowledge of the client's damage with the, I wouldn't understand that. So is there a place, what I'm saying is if, if you're writing in syntax to a, a corporation and you want to write it in truth English and they don't understand what you're saying because they don't do syntax, well, where is the breakdown in the communication? Write it both ways. So you could write it this and then... Sure, you can write it in adverb, verb, syntax which you're, uh, that you're used to and then go ahead and say, well, we, we, wrote ahead, we, we wrote it to you the same way a lawyer would and make that statement. This is how a lawyer writes to you, this is how your lawyers read it. So you can understand it. And then syntax it and say, this is how many syntax mistakes you made, and this is what it looks like corrected. And give it to them both ways. Now, when we do lawsuits, the, 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 the federal government requires us that we have cover pages on our lawsuits. When you file a law uh, federal, you have the same rules down here as we do up in Wisconsin, or in the, should I say, the states. Uh, and they say, we won't file the papers unless you use our form. Same thing with process of service for uh, notifying the clients, the individuals. Now don't forget, you guys are schooled in syntax, the people you're talking to are not. And you know from your own experience that it takes a long time to learn this, so the guy you're serving is not gonna be a spontaneous combustion of, bang, I understand this right away. So don't worry about it. Give him his papers and adverb verb, use the government's form, slap the quantum on the back. Give it to them both ways. That way you're protected under quantum and they have the volition, if they show up, all service is good service. That's the rule. That's because if the person shows up in court and says, I didn't get service, your honor. He says, well, if you didn't get service, what are you doing here? In other words, how did you find out to be here today? By his own confession that he is there shows that he got good service. Simple as that. Your volition, your performance is what makes the contract. When we graduate from judge school, you get a hat that says, if nobody's talking, everybody's walking. Which means we need people to confess to anything that they do and everything that they do. We need them to get into an argument of traverse. It's just like I say to you, what is your name? Your instinct is to tell me your name. The correct answer is, your is an adverb modifying the verb name. My name is not what? Is that a question or, an, or a statement? 
So you've got three different questions I could ask there. And if you, if you maintain a level of questioning, it's called a demur, to get to a, a conclusion, which is a contract of communications, and the judge knows you have the capacity to communicate with him, he's going to know not to get into this discussion with you because you're going to educate everyone else in the courtroom. This is a case that happened in Tampa, Florida. Man comes out of a bar, 1.30 in the morning, drunk, takes a leak in the bush. He's on a vice cop who's standing there, he's on his foot. So the vice cop steps out and arrests him for lewd and lascivious with, and, def, and going to the bathroom in public. Now this is his third offense, so it's a mandatory five years in prison and a $2,500 fine in the state of Florida. And you think the guy to have a little bit more sense, you know, after being convicted twice of this same thing. So he's in court, and his friend who had came to my seminar calls me up and he says, Hey Dave, you want to go to court with me today? My buddy's going to court and he's, he's facing five years in prison. And you can see what you can do to help him. So there's roughly 100 people waiting to be heard in front of this court for traffic offenses, misdemeanors, little jaywalking offenses, you know. And the, uh, the judge uh, tells the bailiff to pass out these, you can plead guilty. Uh, not guilty. No contest. Okay, adverb, verb, adverb, verb, and guilty means responsibility. Which means no speak. <laughs> so you can plead no speak, no not guilty, which is adverb, verb, and a negative condition of making this a verb, or no contest, which means that my contest is a, is a verb, and it's a no verb, or rather a no contest, which means a no contract. So which part of no don't we understand? So I went ahead and I take the form, and I corrected the 88 mistakes on the form. Then I assigned a Title 18, 1001, fictitious conveyance, under mail fraud to extort money, criminal activity under Title 42, 1985, subsection 1 for conspiracy, subsection 2 for obstructing evidence of witnesses, and subsection 3 for depriving evidence and witnesses for an act of racketeering under Title 18, Section 1961. And then I said to the judge, you just caused a damage under Title 42, 1983 as a personal damage against this individual. Would you like to participate? The judge is looking and says, oh my God, he says. And he looks at all the people. There's 50 guys in the audience. And he goes, give this back to the, to the man. I'm not going to accept it. And as soon as the, the bailiff got it, because he's the one passing it out, he crumples it up. My client goes, that's my evidence. I want my evidence. Judge says, that's your evidence. He says, yeah. He says, you guys made 88 mistakes. You tried to extort money from me. Judge says, give me that back. He looks at it and he says, all right. He signs the bottom of it. He says, how much money you got in your pocket? He says, I got 20 bucks. He says, $20 court cost. He looks at all the people in the audience and he goes, oh, we're going to do something different, bailiff. Lock that door. He says, Every one of you will be in here, he says, if you pay $20 court costs, he says, all your cases are dismissed. We've got speeding, drunk driving, <laughs> lewd and lascivious, uh, burglary. There's a couple of uh, fights, disorderly conducts in bars. I mean, everybody in the room was facing hundreds of dollars and years in prison, and they all lined up and signed, paid $20 and got out there and had all their cases vacated. Because the judge just found out that he gave all 50 people a lie. And we just discussed how the paperwork was a lie. And as soon as he had the courtroom cleared, the next 50 guys came in and he harvested all of them because they didn't know they didn't know. He told me to get out of the courtroom. <laughs> <laughs> so the rest couldn't be harvested. So, but that's, I was in, I was in, in, in Milwaukee, I, was, I had a parking ticket I sat there, a guy had a 125 mile an hour speed violation in a 55 zone and got $20 court cost. Because I was there to witness and a judge can't commit a felony in front of the judge prosecutor. Everyone in the courtroom got $20 court cost in Milwaukee and was dismissed. As soon as I walked out the courtroom door, the next group got 
he had tinted windows, $88 fine and four points <laughs> against his driver's license. I mean, it's pretty serious stuff. Drunk driving, six months in jail, $2,500 fine, which is normally just uh, about a $300 fine. But he threw the book, he had to reharvest everything that he lost before that. All right, on my 2002 tape, and probably secondary and third, fourth, fifth, and sixth part of people telling a story over and over again, and how it's been moved around the world, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, on my tape, I said that things are part of Puerto Rico. The post office is the UPU. The UPU controls, uh, all post offices worldwide control the port authorities. Port authorities are the ones that pay the judges because they, are, they work in a foreign vessel in dry dock. So the, the port authorities are not off of the tax, the tax rolls because of it being classified as a foreign vessel. When you enter a courthouse, you have left your country. That's why no constitution, rule, or regulation in your country has anything to do with what's going on in that courthouse. I don't care if the judge has got a whole bunch of revised statutes from his state or his federal laws sitting on his desk. They are not part of the piece of paper that is your lawsuit with a stamp and a flag on it. That is the Constitution. That is the only reason why you're in court is because you or the other party filed points of information on this document. If it's written in adverb verb, the judge is going to say both sides can't read and write. You're both derelict vessels on my foreign vessel in dry dock, and he will conduct himself accordingly based on subjective interpretation and what is fair and equitable for the volition of the thinking of the two parties before him. And if he thinks that both people are con artists and they're trying to rip off each other, he's going to allow the attorneys to go ahead and rip them off. <laughs> that, you know, comes from divorce. Uh, and if, a, if an individual is in there and he has a legitimate claim, physical evidence, quantumized arguments that are absolutely mathematical, the judge has no choice but to allow that individual to win his argument because if he does anything like use the word dismiss, which is a negative condition of state within a quantumized document, which not, does not allow any negative condition of state to exist, he hasn't done anything. You can vacate because vacate comes from value, but you can't dismiss it. Uh, Puerto Rico's got nothing to do with anything. If you want to do the IRS thing and say it belongs in Puerto Rico, I know I made that in my 2002 state tapes, and that was through misinformation. Since then, I've corrected it on my website. It's the post office uh, globally and the port authorities, which you're dealing with. Now, taxation in all countries worldwide, uh, as society has evolved, you go to the poll, polls and you elect public officials, or you will elect specific laws, rules, and regulations to be put on the ballots. Just like it used to be legal to smoke in an enclosed area anywhere in Australia. Today it's against the law because, of this, because it violates public safety as far as all different kinds of illnesses that come from smoking. Same thing isn't true in the United States. We have the same laws. Some states haven't enacted all of them yet, but uh, like 60% of all people that live in Florida are over the age of 60. Their immune systems are weaker than a 20-year-old. And therefore, the laws in Florida say there is no smoking in any enclosed area anywhere in the state. Not in bars, bowling alleys, restaurants. But in the northern regions of the, of the country where you have a young population, smoking laws are still there because young people like to smoke. And they haven't passed those laws yet in our states but there, it's coming where it's becoming nationalized. You don't get federal aid if you have smoking in your, in your state, so it's, the state goes ahead and they pass the laws accordingly. In other words, you're blackmailed into it. <laughs> uh, and uh, there was comments made about the $400 million that was won at the World Court in the Jebski cases. Those were all disqualified by me 
That never happened. That was misinformation that was circulated. And uh, I went to The Hague and I personally got the lawsuits and they were all disqualified. So that never took place. There was never any banking monies transferred uh, or judgments paid out on any of that stuff. Skiba was indicted by the Boston Grand Jury and because he's a friend of mine, Boston Grand Jury did an adverb verb indictment. Indictment meaning no. Uh, well, I'll spell it for you. That's the way they spelled indictment from the grand juries. And what that says is, I is an adverb, modifies the adjective N, which modifies the pronoun D, which is connected by the adverb I, which is connected by the adjective C, the adjective T, the, adjec uh, the pronoun uh, M, the adverb E, the adjective T, and the pronoun T. Because it's underlined in the continuance of evidence is broken, this here, all letters in the alphabet are, are facts. Your vowels become, the I's are vowels, and, uh, but they're used as adverbs in this argument. And I and E ears are interchangeable. So what they've done here is they've done a 134, 1334, 134. It's not a word, it's an acronym of misinformation. And when I corrected it, this happened in uh, Frank Marinfino's case for $1.3 million and 17 years in prison for failure to pay taxes between the ages of 18 and 34. I was then called in and I took the witness stand. It was a very unique story. The judge was fired for two years because of it. The, uh, I took the witness stand <clears throat> and I said, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I have a question for you. DA jumps up and says, Mr. Miller, you cannot ask the question. You cannot ask questions of the jury. I says to the DA. I says, well, if I can't ask the jury questions, I can't qualify if they're smart enough to understand my answers. The judge says, Mr. Miller, you can't ask the question of the jury. I says, well, then I'll ask you the question, Your Honor. I says, and you ask the jury. It's your court. You've got ruling on that. He says, yeah, it's my court. He says, I'll tell you what, Mr. Miller. He says. Uh, this, uh, this question, if I don't like to question, will you spend six months in jail? Says, yeah, no problem. He says, it's really that important that this question be asked of the jury. I says, absolutely. I says, if you don't ask the jury this question, how are they supposed to know what I'm saying to them? And the judge goes, well, it must be a pretty important question if you're willing to spend six months in prison over it. And the district attorney stands up and says, I object, Your Honor. Mr. Miller's not allowed to talk to a jury. He says, overruled. He says, Mr. Miller, you will whisper in my ear the question, and I will then ask the jury. So I whispered in the judge's ear, and the judge goes, you know, that's a really good question. <laughs> he goes, I would really love to see the answer. He says, if I don't like your answer, after you ask the jury the question. No, he says, if you don't have an answer for me after I ask the jury a question, I am going to sentence you to six months in prison if I don't like your answer. And I says, so be it. He says, okay, we have a contract. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I'd like to see a show of hands. Does two plus two equal four? And all 12 hands went up. I says, this, and I blurted out, does T-O plus T-O equal F-O-R? Does T-W-O and T-O equal F-O-R-E? The DA jumps up and says, your Honor, I like to hold Mr. Miller in contempt for making fun of the jury. I says, what do you mean I made fun of the jury? You spelled indictment with underlining each letter. You misrepresented, rep, misrepresented the value of this word, and these people thought that there was an indictment against Frank Marinfino. I says, by your own trickery of syntax, and you wrote the documents in adverb verb, and the IRS supplied you with information in adverb verb. You both acted in the conspiracy to obstruct this jury, and this jury didn't know any better because you read off what you are here for today. So you committed a fraud in syntax, you committed a fraud in communication skills, you committed a fraud three to, in, uh, in two plus two equals four. 
I says, this jury would know a, an apple from an orange. I says, based on syntax. And, the DA, and then the, the jury jumps up, uh, not the jury, the uh, IRS jumps up and says, we have no claim against Frank Marinfino. And then the, the DA jumps up and says, well, my claimant has now withdrawn all charges. I have no claims against Mr. Frank Marinfino. The judge stands up and says, Frank, there's no charges against you. You're free to go. You don't owe them any taxes. You're not going to jail. You're a free man. Mr. Miller, get out of my court. You got 15 seconds, and I'm going to have you arrested for trespassing as a derelict vessel in dry dock. <laughs> so I proceeded to walk out of the courtroom, and then he said, Frank, do you know what was just said? Frank goes, no. He says, what do you mean? You don't have any knowledge of what just happened here today? He goes, no. He says, Mr. Miller has the knowledge. He says, and I copied him. Oh, you cheated. You copied. You don't have knowledge. Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 12 b ones I hold you in contempt of court for perjury. As you came to this court under false pretenses, and you don't know what you're doing. 18 months in jail. And he went to jail for perjury. The judge. The judge sentenced him to 18 months. But... As soon as he vacated the case, he recused himself from the trial and then started under judge's motion a new trial to hold Frank Marinfino in contempt for copying and not having knowledge. And from that day forward, every judge in America used the rules and regulations of knowledge to certify if you are qualified to come into court and make an argument. So if you're going to write a syntax document and correct a fiction document and identify the facts on that as to be a lie. You better know how to walk and chew gum at the same time, just like I do in this program. And then, see, don't even challenge me anymore because the only thing they do is get beat up and really highly embarrassed. By the way, the judge on this case, Pregason, his father is the grand Masonic master of the entire state of California and the chief judge of the Supreme Court of California. His father had to fire his son because I testified in court under syntax and used the fact in court and vacated a jury, as well as a DA in the Internal Revenue Service. No one in the history of California ever defeated the IRS or a jury, and the fact that I could go in and blow these guys out of the water and I do it every time I walk into court, it became a danger to allow me even into the courthouse, let alone into a courtroom, or even file a lawsuit. And I've got worldwide reputation for that. That's why you guys get, you hear so many stories about me out here in Australia and New Zealand. But it's always fun when I go to court. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any questions? Uh, Dave, if, if we get skillful enough to write in syntax and we turn up to court and correct our documents um, and ask the other party why they've uh, fraudulently conveyed language and committed mail fraud and all the other things, we notice them of that and of all the uh, penalties. Can't they turn the tables on us? Because if we've written to them in adverb verb, or we've even signed documents in adverb verb... You're not held to a high standard. You're not a licensed bar attorney that went to college for six years to study how to mechanically and mathematically create fraud. They're held to a high standard. You're not. Simple so it's, as that. It's a culpable action on their behalf, is it? Yes. It's engineered. It's not an accident. It's a mathematical engineer. Um. In the word indictment, you said 134, 133, 4134. They only just sent individual letters. How do we know? Because it's underlined. It's the underlining and the space between underlined because it's a, it's a word, a, a letter, a space, and another letter, and it's specifically broken with an underline. If it would have been a continuous line, that would have been a different story, but he specifically underlined it to separate each letter to be a separate entity. Because all words in the alphabet are, uh, I mean not all words, all letters of the alphabet are nouns. And it says so, you can look at any dictionary in the world. They identify them to be nouns, but A and I and E and O and U are used as independent letters and they have multiple definitions. So the vowels, the vowels change the, or have values. And it's like I makes, is a person, A is a conjunction, I is also a conjunction. So what makes N a, uh, an adjective and what makes... Because when you put a noun in front of a noun, it becomes an adjective pronoun. It's a modifier. It colors it. Even though you don't think N is a, N is a, 
a, uh, is a color, but when you do it in this format, this is called a syntax. This is specific engineered syntax, and you can't pay attention to the fact that this is a D and this is a, uh, a N and a D. The fact is that if you put a noun in front of a noun, this is an adjective, and you have to have an adverb in front of that to make this a pronoun, and then it has to be connected by an adverb. That's the syntax, and the syntax says that this is a lie, that this is not the word indictment. It's just a series of letters that were written independently with a fraudulent syntax, with a modified condition of syntax and not a word. And the fact that they were underlined indicates that a person who did it understands syntax. Exactly. It was an engineered lie to a jury. He lied to a jury and I caught him. That's perjury. And when you obstruct a, a jury, you're looking at 10 years in prison. The judge got fired over this for two years. And Douglas, his, his clerk of the court, was fired right along with him because he's the puppet master. And two years later, Pregason and his, his clerk of the court was back in the, the, the Daney case. And guess who walked into the courtroom? Me. He wasn't even on the bench a week. And I come walking in and I sit down. Oh, no. And, and Douglas goes, Judge, Miller's here again. <laughs> The and the Danny case went on for six weeks, and we won the case. I mean, they, they did everything in their power to get these people to talk to them. And the only thing the Danny's had to say, there were six of them involved, to the prosecuting attorney was, can I see the set, correct sentence structure, communication syntax? To the judge, to the prosecuting attorney, and to the jury, for six consecutive weeks, never broke and said anything but, can I see the correct sentence structure? And in the end, they, they vacated the case. 18 months later, they intimidated them enough to get lawyers. The minute they got lawyers, eh, it was about a week later, they all went to prison for three and a half years because their lawyers silenced them from using syntax and volunteered for them to go to jail and put them all in jail. Nice solicitors. Yeah. Um, and in the <laughs> middle of the word, you've got the uh, C and the T. Well, it, how come the C didn't become a modifier for the T, for the other noun, for the phone? Because... M, anytime you can have a whole bunch of nouns, you, I can have uh, 20 adjectives in front of a pronoun. But I can't have, a pronoun can't be in front of a pronoun. Only an adjective can appear in front of a pronoun, and the only thing that can follow a pronoun is an adverb. These are rules and regulations that cannot be violated in syntax. So M is a pronoun? M here is used as a pronoun because it's followed by an adverb. Oh, it's affected from, of course. Right, frontwards and backwards. Right, thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, g'day, David. Um, my question is not exactly about um, yeah. where, where, where we're at there. Um, I, I have a, an, an international uh, commercial shipping certification right. uh, that's issued to me. Um, by a body called AMSA, which is the Australian Maritime Safety Authority. Uh, they issue a document called the STCW95. Uh, you've got to go away and do a course and you've got to do all, right. all kinds of things to, to get that. Um, during that course, um, you know, they're, get, they're getting you ready for your life out, out at sea, um, mm -hmm. you know, doing commercial shipping. Um, and they made a couple of points very, very clear to us at, at this course. Um, and that was, you, you basically, your qualification became irrelevant because that just got logged on the system and, and you were. Um, your passport was irrelevant because you might be in a home port. Right. Okay? But the moment I step off my ship and I go down that gangplank and, and, and get onto that wharf and, and I want to walk back up those... Uh, that, uh, stairway and get back onto the ship, I need, I need to make sure I've got one very important thing in my pocket. Your medical certification that you are not transporting any contagious diseases. And it's the most important piece of paper I have. Public safety has jurisdiction over all things on planet Earth. And I'd just like to make this point. How many of you have seen some of these, there, there's a disaster movie where a plane comes from Europe and there's a a terrorist on board releases a noxious uh, a virus on board the plane. The plane is ordered to be vaporized by the military before it enters U.S. airspace. 
for uh, Harrison, uh, Rex Harrison, uh, and Sophia Lorenz made a European movie, The Cassandra Crossing, where, I, where I, a train had a poisonous, had a disease on board. It stopped, they sealed that, that, that train up, and they were going to destroy it at the Cassandra Crossing. But because they had a medical team on board the train, they, were, they realized that they could cure the disease with oxygen at 20% rather than 14.6, which is atmospheric and saved everybody's lives and were able to stop the train and prove that they didn't have to be disintegrated and killed. You know, everyone killed on board and everybody's life was saved at the end of the movie. The point is that if you, the Black Plague, because it wiped out half the population of the world, or if you have some, what they call the devil virus, gets free, does it, that viruses don't know any boundaries. There's been enough movies made about how a, a deadly virus can get get free and destroy the population of mankind. Uh, the Omega Man is another one. Uh, the new one they just come out with. Uh, let's see, what's another one? They did that The Omega Man was done with... Uh, Charlton Heston, right. And then the new one is with uh, Wilson. So I guess my question is, David, um, when, when, I, when I board a... Uh, a, a, uh, a foreign vessel in dry dock, the court. Yeah, the court is the same way. You walk into a foreign vessel in dry dock, I tell everybody if you're going to do a <clears throat> syntax, because they arrested several of our people saying you have a mental disease and we're going to put you in a mental institution because well, you're a quantum in a world of fiction. You didn't know where you were. So what we did is we made sure all of our students went into the courthouse with a quantumized document and also had their medical papers saying they have no contagious diseases and are mentally sound. And so when the judge stood up there and made the comment, because he's the captain of his vessel, uh, we held our medical papers up and says, we're, we're board and certified to be healthy. We know exactly who we are and what we're doing. Thank you. And that stopped that. And no one's gone to, been locked up anywhere in the planet for the last 10 years. So. That was the only defense they had back then. But then we came back with, show me, judge, your board certification that you're a doctor or you're a psychiatrist or you have any kind of mental training. And it disqualified them. So, another question. Uh, David, when you mentioned the titles, like you mentioned 41A, et cetera, where do we find those? Where can we, are they American or Australian? Or okay, all the titles, whether it be in your country my country, China, Russia, doesn't matter where it's from. The piece of paper that we call the courthouse, you have to define your title. If I want to say Title 18, 241 is conspiracy, and I assign it a definition, it's just a reference within this document, and that's what it means, because I defined it with a quantum definition. I could say Title 18, USC 3 is conspiracy. I could say... ABC equals cons conspiracy, as long as someplace where I take that abbreviation and I assign the definition to it on this vessel, when this vessel goes into court. Now, what I've done is I've taken their definitions, and their definitions, when they are written, Title 42, that's the way the government writes it. Well, I went ahead and I said, well, that's not the right way. First off, it has to have a colon to make this is for the Title 42, and this is a hyphen, wrong way, yeah, this is a hyphen tilde. It's a, the hyphen separates the word because tilde is a location. 42 is not a value. The government called it a value. It's a location where you find a definition. So I was grammatically correct and copyrighted the correct use of punctuation around the words. And when I copyrighted, a judge will look at that. He knows what his fiction site is. And I've already syntaxed it, so he knows what the definition is corrected. And then it's assigned to my documents. That way I can communicate both in the fiction and fact world simultaneously. Now my copyrights in the United States, or rather my copyrights for these this technology is worldwide. I don't care what government you go to, all courthouses 
are foreign vessels in dry dock, and you are not in Australia. You are not under re Australia revised statutes or state of New, New South Wales statutes. You are whatever it says on that piece of paper. So if, you're, if you go in there with a half-baked definition and a half-baked attitude and you don't know what you're doing, he will declare you to be a derelict vessel who doesn't know up, down, left, or right, in or out, and he will harvest you for trespassing on his vessel. So don't make nonsense. If you file nonsense, it will be treated as nonsense. Yes? So would you suggest that you notice the court in advance, 10 days in advance, of uh, the court document that you, you plan to... No, because when up. you file it, that tells the judge by contract that he's got 45 days to schedule it for a, a hearing based on the forensic evidence that's in that document. If he, cannot dis if he cannot vacate your ability to communicate at a level of mathematical accuracy, then he has to give you a court date. Now, from the time you file the papers you're going to get a received document stamp, which starts a clock that runs for 30 days. At the end of 30 days, you must have within that 30-day window service upon the people that you are talking to and that information of service back to the judge, and the judge then will issue a, a summons to answer the court within 20 working days. Saturdays and Sundays don't count in a state. And it's 60 days for federal because Saturdays, Sundays, holidays, they all count. But it all comes out to be a 45-day trust law then because it, they're giving you 45 working days of the 60. Now, the 60 days that they are talking about that the federal courts always tell you that you've got an answer is a trap. We don't give them 60. That's in their world of fiction. You take 45-day trust law which vacates, you got 10 day answer and a 10 day answer back to the answer, that's 60 days. You vacate your own case because you don't know the difference as to what you're supposed to be doing. So you will only allow 20 days for an answer and because it's a syntax, a syntax document, you set down the rules and regulations, can their answer not be, them. Can their answer be that they need more time? No, don't give it to them. Also, they're going to ask because at the minute you waiver your, your time, your 45-day speedy trial, they can wait 10 years before they answer you back. They can't win in syntax, so the only thing they're going to do is tie it up in time. Don't give them the, don't give them a, don't give them the time. Also, if we feel we're proficient enough to speak, uh, to write in the truth, but not, maybe not to speak in it. Uh, two plus two doesn't equal four. Speaking is irrelevant. Only what's written counts. So you notice the court that you're happy to traverse in adverb verb? The court's going to make a summary decision based on the forensic evidence that you present to them on paper. Yeah. The only thing, reason they're going to bring you into the court is trying to entrap you to disqualify your own paperwork. And so, so you would speak in syntax to notice them that, that uh, as it's written, say, shall it Nine out of ten cases are done under summary judgment based on the forensic evidence of the lawsuit presented to the judge. It's only, uh, if they want to do a put up a show for everybody, they'll go ahead and have a court hearing for it. Or if they know that there is a condition of perjury on the table, they'll get the man to confess to perjury. I can get anybody in this room to confess to perjury, and you won't even know it's happening. <laughs> See, if you, if you drop a frog into hot water, he'll jump out. If you drop, drop a frog into cold water and bring it to a boil, you will cook him, and he won't know he's being cooked because he's cold-blooded. It's the same thing with the courtroom. If you make everybody feel warm and fuzzy, they're going to cooperate. If you shock them, they're going to get all scared and run away. So you want to be able to, you get more bees with honey than you do with vinegar, or flies. <laughs> the, the story you were relating before about the guy that had the, with the IRS, yeah. and you won the case for him. After that, on his way out, the judge pulled him up because he wasn't familiar with what was going on. The judge was able to. Right, I had about six down. hours. I had six hours to give him a briefing as to what I was going to do. How far can the judge go with that? For instance, if if someone went to court, had you representing them in court, but didn't understand to the extent that you do, and the judge was questioning that person. And okay. If that person I makes a mistake, and he say, "Well, you don't know what you're doing. David might, but you don't." Right. So Baden's case happened over in New Zealand that way. And Baden admitted he couldn't walk and talk like I did, and the judge had him for breakfast. In, uh, in uh, 
the Krummemeyer case, which is up on the internet under scams. Uh, Krummemeyer went to prison for three years under IR. He, he, excuse me, he was in an IRS case. We defeated the IRS case because the language was a lie. But 10 minutes before he was sentenced, I found out that he had cashed $800,000 in insurance checks, which were never made public to me, but the DA's office kept it secret until he made his final delivery, saying, you didn't pay taxes on the insurance checks. You laundered money. You lied to the court and to the jury that you didn't have any checks. I've got $800,000 in checks you signed. I'm going, well, that's perjury. So he got sentenced to three years, four counts of perjury, which was 30 years in prison, and they only give 10%. So he got three years of hard time in a federal penitentiary. But this is the third time he's gone to prison over perjury for IRS claims on checks. You think he'd learn the first time? In that case, I, <laughs> in that case, I can understand. But if, if you were to represent someone else, like for instance, the cases that you've done here in Sydney with, with the children and everything, couldn't the judge do the same in all those cases, saying, "Well, the person that you're defending doesn't know what you're doing"? Or the doesn't all the people that I have gone to court with have been briefed by me and have spent probably ten hours of pre okay. headbanging with me to know what I am doing so they understand what is going on. Yeah, but not to your extent. It doesn't matter if they make if the judge. They still can't they walk the mistake. walk and talk the talk as, as to my extent. No. But the fact that I disqualified the court and everything that they're doing in the court, the court can't move forward. It doesn't matter whether you can read or write. The court doesn't have any jurisdiction in the first place once they were disqualified. I'll be in court March 2nd, as a matter of fact, down in... Uh, Sydney, in Dr. Masseuse's case. For all the, anybody here from Sydney and you want to go to court and watch me. Yes, yeah, Sam? You said you can do something. <laughs> You're making me feel self-conscious now. <laughs> you said you can disqualify um, and get people to admit for perjury by using the... Um, the process of, uh, you know, was it the... Cross-examination. Cash, cross-examining and um, right. uh, catching them with honey by making them feel good about themselves and getting them to uh, to, to answer the questions. And then when you ask the last one, you, they, they caught themselves and you right. catch them in the act. But, um, and you also mentioned about the, uh, the fact that the judge will only make a finding on the facts. I mean, it is my understanding that the judge can actually accept evidence verbal evidence uh, according to their system, can the judge admit verbal evidence and ignore, uh, I'm sorry, can the judge admit verbal evidence from the, from the bar and ignore the written used, contract? That can be used to, to disqualify the syntax. Uh. What you're saying is, yes, the individual can kill his own case by saying, I don't know what's happening because somebody else wrote this for me. That Not statement will disqualify. Sorry? That evidence will disqualify. And I'll tell everyone in this room right now, I don't need your permission to prosecute the judge for anything he does to you. I have knowledge, and they know I have knowledge, and I can go into court over your objections to my interfering with your case and prosecute the judge and the DA for violating your civil rights because you can't read and write. And I have that authority. I can do that in any country worldwide. So the judge can't use his intelligence against you like I've seen. What's that woman on TV all the time at 2.30? Yeah. Judge, judge Judy. Judy. <laughs> I see her violate several basic human rights. No, no, she didn't. The first thing that starts out in that, all those TV judges are saying is, these people signed a contract to vacate their civil rights, vacate their contract rights, and allow the judge to make a determination over to their oral arguments in court of common sense. And those are just common sense trials. Sometimes they have very good arguments. You might pick up a few points to pay attention to. Other days, there ain't a court in the world allow a circus to take place like that. It's, up to, it's totally up to the discretion of the judge. And, and we got a guy, we got a judge up in Wisconsin 
He got, he got disbarred, as a matter of fact, and it was found guilty of uh, sexual crimes. But he'd walk around with a, the old ping pong paddles where he had a little ball with a rubber band on it. In a murder trial, he'd walk around and he'd play with this thing because <laughs> both sides were talking in adverb verb. The contracts were in adverb verb. The jury couldn't read and write. And he knew about syntax and he knew that all these people were illiterate in front of him. So he just played with this, this rubber ball paddle. He was bored. And everybody thought he was nuts. And then he was, when he was challenged by the chief judges, he said, well, these guys can't read and write. It's a syntax argument. I'm not going to tell them anything. I'm just going to do what I'm going to do at the end of the trial. I don't care what the jury says. He says they're in a box. It's an enclosed area. They can't hear evidence or see witnesses. I'll make a determination after the fact. And if I don't want to put my foot in there, I'll let the jury do whatever they want to do. And, and, and if I don't like what they do, I'm going to override them. And I'm going to make my own decision anyways. I had a case where the jury came back and said, this man is not guilty. The judge says, listen, ladies and gentlemen, you don't seem to understand. I told you to go back in there and find this person guilty. That's not a request. That's an order. You will find them guilty as charged, or you're going to sit in there for as many months as it takes. And they kept the jury in there for a week, 24 hours a day. Wouldn't let them out of the jury room until they came back with a guilty. And no matter how many times they kept they had to keep fighting and fighting and fighting, and finally they all gave in, and they said, okay, we find you guilty, so they can go home to their families. So then the judge got sued by the Greater Sur Jury Association for fraud. The jury, and the, when it got to the higher court, the judge went in and said, the guy was, everybody lied. It was an adverb verb case. Syntax was on the table, and they all lied. They're all guilty. Um. He may not have been guilty of the crime that they said he was, but he was guilty of lying on multiple counts of perjury, which added up to more time for perjury than he did for the, the guilty for what he was actually in court for. Like Al Al so he wanted to use a distraction. He didn't want Syntex being put on trial. He didn't care what was put on trial. He was just going to put this guy in jail because he lied to the court and the judge knew it. See? But he didn't want to give out any secrets, so he changed the rules. Okay? All right, I'll get back on point here. This here is a graft. Your mind, now this is the same, these are the, the title sites are in the back of the business card. These are the words. Now, the numbers can be anything you want throughout any country you happen to go through, but the causes of action of these conditions of words follow in a specific order. Now, you have to be able to prove each one of these words through the title site and the definitions which are expanded upon on both the website and my book if you wish to study those. So the question is, these are the players, you got your, your judge who works with the DA barrister, who works with the sheriff bailiff, who works with the clerk of the courts who files papers, and then the police department who goes out and investigates on the street or is your professional witness. Now, the end of, uh, Let's say this pen is a knife, okay? Now a knife, the word knife is... Let's say this pen is a knife, okay? Now a knife, the word knife is a fact, or the word gun is a fact. And it's laying here, and the, the police officer picks it up, and he says, the gun doesn't say for the gun, by the gun, of the gun, for the person's gun. He just says the gun. That was an adverb making gun a verb. The noun or the fact killed the person, but the verb was what was presented to the jury. That's misrepresentation. Wow. So therefore, this, this person here misrepresented his court, uh, his, his files. All clerks must have a four-year college degree in order to be a clerk of the court. To receive, to be Port Authority uh, officers, to receive the vessel to be docketed at the port of the court. Now, when it's docketed, the, the clerk will usually look at it to see what department it goes to or reads it, but allows the modification of language from the police to come into the court, and then it goes to the Sheriff's Department, Detective Bureau to do a further investigation, maybe check up on things at a secondary level before it's given to the barrister or DA, district attorney, 
to go out and then find the laws, rules, and regulations to fit the definitions that were, were brought to establish the violations of civil rights. Okay? And then those points of information would be given to the judge. If the modification of language from the police officer and the clerk and the sheriff are not stopped and corrected because they can't read and write and they cheated on their civil service exams, high school exams, and uh, they're all part of the conspiracy, and the DA doesn't stop and correct it before he gets it to the judge, these guys all work together. None of them can read and write. It's just a big act. So are they guilty? Do they have knowledge? Well, I take their paperwork, and I syntax it, and I prove that everybody who touched this piece of paper in all things from the street to the, to the jury and back to the finished order from the judge making a determination that it's a lie. It's a syntax lie. Did they have knowledge? Absolutely, because it was mathematically certified by every one of them. It wasn't just where one made the mistake, they all made the same mistake. They all acted together. If we don't lie together, we will lay together. <laughs> So they all lie together. All right, now you have to give closure. Did any of these individuals give closure that they were going to use the modification of language to extort rights or to obstruct the information that was presented in the courtroom? The answer is no. None of them stopped to give closure as to use syntax to define the words and prove that they were wrong. So the closure of every one of these individuals participated. Did they port the knowledge into the court? In other words, did they docket the evidence? Yes, they were all guilty of docketing evidence to go ahead and damage somebody through fraud. Did they all participate in fiction language? The answer is yes. I have everyone that touched the documents had to sign off. So we have a signed confession that they all participated. And did they now port a correction? Once you, you have to give closure and port it, then you have to certify the fiction modification and port it. Yes, they all put it in. They all signed on to it. Did anybody stop and correct it? Nope, I do. Now, did they act together in a conspiracy? Anytime two or more people participate on a wrongdoing, you have a conspiracy. Now, that comes under Title 18, Section USC 3. That's an association after the fact that a, a fraud has been perpetrated and all individuals participated together to make that fraud go forward without obstructing. Title 18, USC 3. So the conspiracy first is brought as a civil. After the civil is argumented, then it's responsibility of the DA's office to go back and criminally prosecute everyone under a conspiracy criminal, which carries a 15-year prison sentence and $15,000 fine. But when they modify language to extort money and privileges, it now goes up to $25 million in 30 years in prison. My program, however, carries 1,225 years of prison time and two and a half and six, I think it's up to $60 million in fines. Yeah, I only got to prove one to get all of it, <laughs> which is easy to do. Okay, now, did they obstruct? Absolutely. They obstructed evidence, they obstructed witnesses, they obstructed paperwork, because they modified everything from the original facts. Now, did they deprive the individual from having a, a correct trial, correct information, correct evidence, correct due process? The answer is yes. And so all these get checked off. Did they all act together to reduce this individual beyond the point of recovery to put them in a box in orange pajamas? The answer is yes. That's a 30-year prison sentence, Rico. Was the guy damaged? Well, I only got to prove one for damage, and I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 times 5. I've got 50 damages. <laughs> is the guy damaged? Yeah, I think a jury would pretty well cite through that because you've got a chart on a whiteboard in front of a jury to make and take all the evidence, syntax it, define it, and educate a jury of 12, 
And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that somebody lied, that somebody damaged, that the court was just a, an illusion of the guy committed murder, rape, major drug dealer, did some other kind of hideous crime, bank robbery, beat somebody to death, you know. These are, there, there are certain crimes in society, it doesn't matter what the language is, doesn't matter what the jurisdiction is, these people will be removed from society. They can't get out of it. There's no tricks or traps and truth or fiction that are going to get you, that are going to allow you to stay in society if you violate public safety. You know, there's a Star Trek episode where this individual, who was a lady, has knowledge of a deadly, deadly virus that's going to be released on a planet to genocide the planet because two planets are at war. And Picard and the doctor are sitting there and they're discussing, why won't you tell us about this? He says, well, because I have, a I have to maintain confidence with my clients. And there's a war going on. And you have no jurisdiction to detain me. And the doctor says, well, you know what? A person has to be crazy to go out and kill a whole planet. Therefore, as a doctor, I have to medically certify that you're crazy because you're going to kill somebody. And therefore, we have to lock you up in a box, in a straitjacket for the rest of your natural life. Or you can cooperate with us and tell us what we know. <laughs> and the doctor has jurisdiction over the captain and over any other planet under public safety. That was brought out, I think that was in uh, Evolutions, they brought that out. Because the, the Borg were going to go back to violate the time-space continuum to remove a certain issue. You see, so the public safety issue is still number one on the Borg, whether it be a Navy sales, uh, or rather a man entering a ship at sea or coming onto land, and throughout the airport, they have cameras everywhere watching people. Those cameras are now equipped with heat sensors. If you're walking through and you're glowing, I guarantee you the ATF are going to walk up to you and say, you have a fever, you have an infection. We don't know what you are, but you're going in quarantine. You're not going to get on this plane. You're not going to leave the country. You're not going to come into the country. So, you know, everybody's watching. There's always somebody watching. Technology today is to a level where they can stop diseases from being transported because you can, uh, they've established the fact that a terrorist doesn't necessarily have to carry anything. He just has to inject himself to be deadly and then move between point A and point B. And then when he gets there, he is the weapon. So they have all this new sophisticated equipment up there to monitor individuals between what is normal and what is not normal and then remove these people before they have a chance there's another thing to, for all those who, if you don't have the technology established here now, it is coming in the next few weeks. Uh, I was in L.A. airport, and the siren goes off. There's a, and you've got signs up everywhere. When the buzzer rings, you will freeze. You will become a statue. If you move, you will be shot. And a lady's phone rang, and she went to grab for it, and she got tackled by two ATF agents because she moved and everyone, I mean, you got 10 lines of people going through inspection and the siren goes off because somebody moved or did something or they saw a device that was suspicious and before anybody could even move their finger to push a button, which would activate a detonator, anybody moves, they get shot and everybody's got their guns out. So if you walk into an airport and you see these signs, when, it, when the buzzer goes off, you better become a statue. And if you move, you could get shot. Because you're no longer in Australia. You're in a UN territory under a threat of terrorism. And everyone is a su suspect. And so if you're going to, because I travel as much as I do and I move in this world, I learn how to survive. And you're all guilty until proven innocent. <laughs> Um, I used to be a private investigator and they taught us that we have to write the reports in such a way that whoever reads it, their attitude should be, Guild, bring the guilty bastard in, we'll give him a fair trial. <laughs> um, okay, you mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned that 
all these things can be proven from one breaking of the law. So, so I want to confirm, does that mean that one document in um, adverb verb that's presented to the judge, that the judge uses to make a finding on, is enough to tick all these boxes you have here? That's it right there. Anything times a lie is a lie. Any times zero is a zero. Anything divided by is zero is a zero. So you've just given us the formula for winning. 100% of everything. from a criminal action, any civil action, not done in quantum. Absolutely. Why do you think they're so upset? Am I allowed to swear? <laughs> Thank you. Um, there was... Oh, I do have one other question. Oh, and question. then, and then, the question is for the district attorney while I'm on the witness stand. So, Mr. Miller... You mean to say that we are going to let murderers, bank robbers, and rapists go free because we didn't use the correct syntax? My answer back was, why didn't you use the correct syntax in the first place so I don't have to come here and defend such a thing? You're the guy that went to college for 10 years. You're the guy that created the laws who were obstructed. Why didn't you fix it? I fixed it. I gave it to you. Why don't you fix it? You've got the answers. Fix it. And the judge says, so be no further questions, Judge Miller. He's making an ass out of the DA. Yes. I have a question somebody's asked me to ask you. Um, yesterday you put it um, in a box, um, that, uh, in a, some sort of pyramid style. It's a about triangle, God. folks. It's got three sides. A pyramid has five sides. There's four sides to the pyramid, and it has a base. That was, free, that was an ang a triangle. That was a triangle. Okay. Um, I could have used a circle and just wrote the numbers around a circle and put it in the middle. The point is you have three elements. You will always be correct. You will honor your correctness. And there you will find your, uh, yeah, you, know, you, will, you will make a contract and you'll write a correct contract and you'll honor the correct contract. What's the first one? Create. The first one, you have, you have uh, uh, contract, honor, and duty. Okay. You know what duty means? Responsibility? It's not, huh? Responsibility? No, respon responsibility means no spoken. But responsibility and duty. Duty is quantum. Responsibility is adverb, verb. It's a lie. Duty is something you must do. A duty is a contract that you are sworn to uphold because you have an oath and a contract definition to perform that oath. That's why military personnel have duties. Civilians have responsibilities. Civilians are on a different plane than military. And military are under contract and you have duties. And in a civilian world, you have orders, which means no contract. And in the duty of a military, you have commands, C-O-M, contract commands. If you don't follow your command, you get a bullet in the brain. In civilian, they put you in a box. Okay. So how does that affect what type of God you believe in? What kind of a God do I believe in? The God that, has, that I have researched to a thousand definitions that are unique to my understanding, which none of you are privy to because you weren't there when I studied my thousand definitions which I syntaxed. You guys all studied your thousand definitions that were all separate from each other, so all of you have an independent definition of what God is, the same as the other six billion people out there who have their six billion gods. So the point is, everyone is unique. Man, God is created in man's image. The def synonyms of image is imagination, art, and creation. End of story. It can't get any simpler than that. It only takes 15 seconds to explain it. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to clarify something you, I think you said yesterday in relation to um, now working for the American military. Was it to put in place something in syntax to prevent them from any future prosecution against, was it genocide, war crimes, things like that? Well, okay. 
as muster master, what is a muster? A muster is an individual when you go on a cruise ship, the muster, you go to your muster stations, learn how to put on a life jacket, where to go to your lifeboats in the event the boat sinks after Titanic. Number two, you get onto an airplane. For those of you who have flown, the stewardess tells you how to put on a life jacket, how to put on a seat belt, what to do in the event the plane's gonna crash. That's a muster. All musters are marshals. All airline stewardesses and personnel on cruise ships, which are musters, are also U.S. Marshals. What does the word U.S. mean? United States Marshals. Two or more people coming together in a closed area called a vessel, better known as charter vessel. Charter vessel means you paid, you get a receipt, bill of lading, you become cargo on a vessel. The cargo could be a ship, a plane, a train, a bus. That's why you always get a receipt. You get on your city bus, you're, a, you're on a charter vessel, you paid money which made you a postal employee traveling under the Department of Transportation as a vessel which now became cargo on the bus, or the train, or the plane, or the boat, and so on. And it's all about maritime commerce and contracts. I'm a bit lost. How, how do you mean, though, in relation to, because if I understood it correctly yesterday, um, I may have misunderstood it, it sounded like in your working with them, it, it prevented them from any... Um, prosecution against um, no what I said was in the event a foreign government hire, hires their lawyer to write an adverb verb claim which I can syntax and say it doesn't say anything right. against anybody it doesn't matter if it's the United States military I have eight treaties with 82 countries for this effect okay in the event any country sues another country and they don't use the correct syntax they're disqualified. Right, so if they do, if any military from any part of the world do commit some That sort I of have war a treaty crime, with, I will uphold my responsibilities and I will syntax it and I will prove beyond all reasonable doubt that it's either correct or incorrect. Good, okay, thank you. You know, the World Trade Center, when it went down, took out 3,800 people. There were 3,800 lawsuits filed for wrongful death. All 3,800 people who filed those claims put their, their name in uppercase spelling called the nom de guerre dead person. I took one case on called with the Mariana, uh, uh, Mariana was the lady's name, her husband died at the World Trade Center, and it was done as a syntax Title, uh, Title 42 lawsuit. That one lawsuit disqualified all 3,800 lawsuits. The government did not have to pay out a trillion dollars because how do dead people say they've been damaged? Very simple. And they wrote it in adverb verb, which disqualified under syntax their arguments. Again, the United States government didn't have to pay out a, million do a trillion dollars in damages. So, in the, in the judge on that case, when, that, when, that one, when I filed my case, it took only a couple of days and the whole thing went mute. There was no public announcements made about it. The whole World Trade Center and all the lawsuits just kind of disappeared because they can't advertise syntax and give it credibility on a global basis because it would set up a chain reaction globally and disqualify insurances, money, uh, banking, mortgages, contracts, trade agreements. In other words, it's Pandora's box being opened. That's why everything went mute, same way as Bill Clinton's sex trial got sealed. They can't let it out, they can't let Pandora's box out of the bag at this point yet till the whole world is brought up to speed simultaneously. So everything is being done covert, quiet, and allowing me to do these seminars. Yes. Yeah, Dave, just still gaining clarity on the, um, the title, <laughs> title 41, 42. So um, are they, are they actually in your book? Yes, everything's in there. Where There's a whole they? section on titles, whole section on dictionaries. I can't find them in <laughs> Every single law, there's two lawsuits in there, civil, the divorce, in the back of each one of those. As you read through it, you'll see them specifically listed. They'll say Title 42, Knowledge. Every single time I use a title site, I also assign the definition to it, a short definition. And these titles... And, and then there's expanded definitions in there uh, on each one of the titles and what they mean. So when we refer to a title, um, I know you said like, we do the, the tilde and with the number. Right. 
Um, and these are written in quantum. Where's, yes. Where's the original ones? Um, are they part of? The original ones in the United States codes or in your Australian codes are written in adverb verb. If you use them, you, it's nonsense. In what sort of law? What? In any law, anything written in adverb verb is nonsense. Oh, no, I mean the title. I'm trying to still understand where titles come from. This is a closed area. The way you define your words in here, you're telling a specific, using the correct sentence structure, communication syntax, to identify what the words mean on your lawsuit. Not only do you have a definition assigned to a Title 42, 1986 for knowledge of the law and the right to stop and correct it, but you also have every word. What does the word knowledge mean? What does the word correct mean? What does the word and mean? Or mean? Is? Are? All these words have to be defined independently as well as, well as in a complete sentence to be associated with that, that number, Title 42, 1986. Mm -hmm. Title 42, 1986 says, in order for evil to flourish, good men must do nothing. If you witness a crime, you don't stop and correct it, and you're a party to the crime. If we were to... Um... Your country has the same laws as we do. All countries in the world have that same law. And where would I find that law in Australia? Uh, you'd have to go and look it up. In your revised statutes. Australian statutes. revised statutes. Statutes. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. Common law, criminal, criminal code statutes. would be one place. Yeah. Civilian. Yeah. Civilian code. Uh, usually all you have to do is type in the word knowledge under Wikipedia. And it'll take you to a definition of knowledge. It might even give you a title site. Now, if you go into Black's Law Dictionary and you look up the word knowledge or criminal or conspiracy, you will have specific lawsuits with the case law. But the case law is written in adverb verb. It will also give you the title sites for those. And then that is cross-referenced through a central library on Lexis and Nexus, which is a worldwide internet for judges and attorneys and barristers in all languages. And you've got to be a member of Lexis and Nexus or an attorney with a code to get into that. Okay? It's not open to the public. They don't want the public being able to do their job for them. Question? Um, you said public safety was the number one law or rule or whatever. So how come with what happened in 9-11, it was a controlled thing? How come that was a massive public safety breach, obviously? They declared it to be an act of war so that they could avoid all the public safety issues, wrongful death, poisoning half of New York City with asbestos. And you know, the asbestos argument has never been made public to anybody even though we got 50,000 people dying of cancer right now in New York City from asbestos exposure and the World Trade Center coming down and all the smoke that you saw was all asbestos being blasted all over the whole city. Talk about population reduction. <laughs> so how come people, everyone didn't notice the Arabs planting bombs in the buildings weeks before? Yeah, they didn't have technology like that. That wasn't an issue of a bomb. That was an issue of taking and creating an electromagnetic pulse. That kind of technology goes into uh, people who own a C4. You see, the department of the Pentagon that was destroyed is where all the black ops is practiced. All the guys that deal in, in C4. What's the first rule of the assassin? Kill the assassin. So you get everybody together that was involved with that in the Pentagon and then kill everyone, 186 guys, in the same location. Anybody else that slipped through the cracks? They're going to be so afraid they'll never talk. Conspiracy theories. What have? Well, you know, it's like I was at the Pentagon the day after a 737, 173 foot wingspan created an eight foot hole, considering the fuselage is 20 feet across. <laughs> you figure that one out with no airplane parts around it. How did people, how, why are people gullible like that? I just can't understand it. Or Flight 93, the only plane in history to crash in the ground making a hole 50 feet deep and 100 feet wide with no airplane parts around except one 50 pound piece of aluminum, which I think somebody brought and threw it on the ground. 
even the titanium motors, which have melting, which, which, are, which are specifically built, the blades are specifically play, uh, built by Rolls-Royce, they, and they can withstand temperatures of 3,200 degrees. They all vaporize too. Hmm. <laughs> And there was no airplane residue, not even, not even fuel residue. Everything disappeared. Must have flew through a vortex, yes. Uh, just a couple of questions about stamps, David. Um, values, the stamp values. Um, when do we use whole denominations? I always use whole denominations because if there's any discrepancy about fractions, there's no such thing as a fraction in law. That's right. That's Don't right. open it up. And they can't demand any more than two cents because that was the original postal treaty. But if you want to get it there and you don't want any hassles, put the right postage on it. Sure. It's just easier. Okay. Okay? Yep. Um, I guess I'm still trying to get my head around the whole concept of, um, not to get off topic, but you doing what you do um, and being allowed to continue doing it still with things like 9-11 taking place, them showing that um, whichever the powers that be who orchestrated that are prepared to go to such lengths to kill people, why would they see a language coming into the system as a better way than what they've done for so long as it is, and that's just killing people, controlling them, manipulating them, keeping them in fear? Why would this... I know you said it'll make a lot money. of people have not heard the program, don't right. even know it exists. Yep. And these are people that are still don't know, they don't know, and are still out there doing what they do because that's the only thing they do know. Yep. Once they've been exposed to this program, whether they accidentally get on the internet, have seen the videotape, into a seminar, they absolutely can't go back and look themselves in the mirror today and say, I'm going to make a living going becoming a liar. Just doesn't work. You're going to get caught. Everybody gets caught that lies. So. It's just, you know, with 400 million people already out there with this information, and it's only going to be a couple more years, and I'm going to have 51% of the population, and they're going to vote in correctness. I can understand that, but I guess I'm thinking that they would be aware of that, so why would they allow you to continue that? Wouldn't, because wouldn't. there's nobody that can replace, there's nobody out there qualified to do what I'm doing at a level to which I do it at. I've asked, yeah. answered all your questions, don't I? Who else is going to stand up here and answer your questions on all the different topics you guys come up with? Yep, and I've been doing that for 940 seminars. So it's in itself, it's an impossible task that, I, that I've made possible. I said, sure, anybody wants to do what I'm doing, fine. Stephen does it. And he, you know, if, if he doesn't know the answer, Stephen will say one thing. And this, this will go back to a story with, with Henry Ford, president of Ford Motor Company. I tell this at all the seminars. Young executive walks up to Henry Ford at one of the big shareholders meetings, and he's got all these big, important vice presidents around him, and says, uh, Mr. Ford, may I ask you a question? Ford says, well, of course you can, and everybody goes silent. He says, what's the answer to this problem? He says, You're, you advertise the fact that you know the answers to everything. And he says, yeah, that's correct. So the man asks him a question. He says, phone. Punches it up, calls his, calls his brains, his, his think tank of 200 IQs, asks the questions I need to answer in 15 seconds, gets the answer back, tells it to the man. Is that the correct answer? He says, yes, it is. He says, but you didn't know the answer. He says, but I know where to look. Oh, and by the way, you're fired. <laughs> okay, one, just one final question. I guess it's just to appease my own sense of, I guess, good and bad as best you can judge it as an individual, does um, your syntax, syntax language in any way facilitate um, stopping any future criminal proceedings against people who have in the past done crimes against humanity? No, not at all. So it can... Fiction in, fiction out. Fact in, fact out. Okay. And if an individual committed a crime and he thinks he's going to use uh, truth, to legalize his crime, and he knew it was a crime, because he'll, accident, he'll actually convict himself in his cross-examination of his argument. And if, if the government needs me, I don't care who you are, if you think you're smart enough to talk in syntax, I can get you to confess to anything in about 
I don't know, maybe 15, 20 seconds. Okay. I've got, I've got the knowledge to put the words together, and you'll feel all warm and fuzzy and participate. Thank you. I think it's a very small percentage of the population that understand the truth. Uh, how do you see the transition of the world waking up to this? Because when I first found out about the truth 18 months ago, or so, I, was, I was pretty pissed off. So how do you see the masses, if, if, if there is a 10 people knowing 10 people and an explosion of information that they've been lied to for 8,500 years, how do you see that being managed? Well, how do you see that transition? Because people will only move as fast as their ability to comprehend an issue. When the judges and I get together, like I said yesterday, people are lazy. As long as they have their TVs and their, their beer, they don't care where the tank parks. They will study for a while and they'll get tired. They'll go and, and experiment with a half-truth half and say it doesn't work because they don't have the full amount of information. Or they get tired or they don't have enough uh, spine to complete the task and they just quit. They drop off. It's easier to be part. It's like the movie in The Matrix. One of the guys says, I'm tired of living in a crappy submarine eating crappy food. I want to go back to my illusion and have a steak and be somebody important in my dream world. And people are that way. They made those statements in the movie Matrix because the average person who has sued the government or who has brought action against the government as what you call the patriot groups or tax protester groups or anything else, they find that the individual has an attention span of 24 months. That's it. And they're gone. They go back to, to their own little world of an illusion. I've been at this 30 years. I'm the longest running individual worldwide that has stood up against the matrix because I have syntax and I have continually promoted and expand and defined the accuracy in all the different parts of the world that it's going to touch upon. Setting up the constitutions, Robert's Rules of Orders, getting the, the trusts together, getting the organized people to teach them how to use a trust to create a organized body of thinking to appoint judges and how to elect judges, how judges have to think to make a determination as to what is right and what is wrong and know when they're being lied to. And so there's 1,800 branches of government that have to be certified. But the first issue is you've got to have a contract to explain what your job titles are. And that's what I'm doing. I'm teaching the syntax to get to the contract and writing the contracts as fast as I can at my own expense, publishing them nationally, worldwide on, the inter on my internet site, so that everyone can study equally at the same time. And I tell everybody, improve it. I'm one guy with a bunch of ideas. Get together and tear it apart. Make it better. Always make it better. Today is the first day of the rest of your life, and every day you will beat your own record. Improve. Educate yourself. And you, you'll have a better world for both you and your children. OK? On the subject of stamps, and the values that we use, we've got gold stamps and then we're just talking about stamps with whole denominations and not using fractions. Now we've had the instance where we use claim of the life and we use a gold stamp and then in other documents we're using whole value stamps but we have had occasion where we've used stamps like 55 cents. So, Yeah, I use 42 cent stamps on service documents. I put the $1 stamps on my court filings for docketing stuff. So with the stamps that when still makes you a postmaster transporting the vessel. When we've used a fraction, that would be because that stamp has already been authorized by the fiction as being valid for the transport of the vessel. Of right. The In other words, the, the governments have set up the fact that it's, it costs 42 cents U.S. and maybe 55 cents Australian to transport one ounce of weight, which is your class A letter or, class, or first class mail, which has been established worldwide in all denominations. And it is... Uh, you, then you go to your foreign exchange and you have your uh, exchange rates between countries and currencies. So and everything is directly proportional, it's the same worldwide. So working with the reverse of that, if a court wasn't to accept your document because it had a 55 stamp on it, they'd have to be disqualifying the Universal Postal Union. 
Yeah. So, so <laughs> and they're paid by the port authorities, and the judges are postmasters, so therefore they would be shooting themselves in the foot. And then they're also acknowledging that you've actually carried out a correct process, but they're trying to find a hole in it. And then that would expose the fact that they're, not, they're never doing the right process. With their That's correct. And all the rest of the lawsuits would now become null and void by their own self-confession. Okay. And it's time for a break. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes, Sam. Um, some of us here have been to courses where we have heard that the Australians have printed out as much as 10 times the amount of uh, fiat money or paper money um, as opposed to the amount of gold that the Federal Reserve has got in stock. Therefore, at, uh, throughout history, the gold value has increased and the paper value has decreased to, to meet up at some point looking at uh, a variety of graphs which have been sent through the email. From what you've just said, is that Australia, due to its natural resources, may come out of bankruptcy much earlier than 19, uh, 2022, I think, was what you had on the board. Right. Um, because of our uh, uh, resources. How you shook your hand from left to right, which means you didn't agree with the fact that <laughs> the um, currency, or I should say the paper money that we have, um, is that much of a difference between what we have in reserves and what is actually in circulation. Um, if your government wanted to pull all the gold out of the ground and we wanted to pull all the gold out of our ground and the Russians want to pull all the gold out of their ground and their coal and their oil and all their mineral resources, there'd be such a surplus of everything that it would devalue all of its values, okay? Money is just a means of exchange on any given day. The, uh, and how deep in the ground have you dug? 100 feet? Okay, you can go down 50 miles and find stuff, you know? They got mines down in, uh, uh, in South Africa that are three, 4,000 feet deep. 50 miles is 80 kilometers. No, no, you can say if you, if you go down 50 miles in the ground, you're gonna, you can probably still find gold down there, you know? But the temperature, when you get down to a certain level, it gets hot because now you got heat from the earth coming up. You know, if you go down only a, I don't know, I think it's 20 feet in the ground, the temperature is 50 degrees year round. I don't care if it's the Arctic or it's uh, in the middle of uh, a desert. The temperature is the same underground. All the caves in the world maintain the same temperature year round because it's an underground. So uh, all this stuff about the paperwork, paper's not being worth any because it's not banked by gold. What's your view on that? That's nonsense. You got to answer it. What, is a what are your roads worth in this country? That's back to, you know, your, your roads, your buildings, your cars, your infrastructure, your intellectual intelligence, uh, the minerals in the ground are still there. You You're can sell, you buy stock in, in Hecla mines based on how many ounces of silver and gold and copper are still in the ground and what it's valued at. And then they go ahead and they take the daily exchange rate and they multiply it times what the reserves are in the ground and that's what establishes the price of the, of the stock. It has nothing to do with what's already above the ground. No, that's irrelevant because what they do is they pull all this gold out of the ground and they refine it down to probably a 25 percent. I was up in Alaska. Uh, I went up to Fairbanks, Alaska. This lady picked me up at the airport because I did a seminar up there just back about eight years ago. She says, hey, how'd you like to see my $3 million? And I'm going, where do you keep it? She says, come on, I'll drive you over there. And she drives me over, it was about five miles out of town. She says, that big pile of dirt there, it's about 50 feet tall, just a big pyramid. I says, this is a nice Cadillac, brand new 2002 Cadillac. She says, yeah, I took two five-gallon pails of dirt off of that pile to buy this Cadillac. That's how rich the gold is in that pile of dirt. She says, the, the machine came through here, and they dug up my mine. They separated it all out and gave me this big pile of refined dirt. And every time I need money, I just go there and shovel up another five-gallon pail and take it down to the assay office, and they give me so much cash and I pay taxes on whatever gold I shovel up and break out. As long as it's in that refined state, it's tax-free. Can I have her address? <laughs> Point is, that's the way in everywhere. You go down to all your mines all throughout Australia, they will dig it out of the ground, and they'll pile it up there. They know exactly what its assay value is per ton, and as long as it maintains a specific ore to dirt, ratio it's tax-free sitting there and of course you have security cameras around there nobody's going to go up and pick a five gallon pail up and walk off property with it so and as long as the gold is like right now it's a thousand bucks an ounce they know exactly how much they need to run the business and refine it pay the taxes pay the insurance satisfy the shareholder satisfy the shareholders 
and not disrupt the status quo of how many ounces of gold are available planet-wide. So they keep the price stable. Mm -hmm. Then they go ahead and they say, well, you know, if gold jumps to $2,000 or $3,000 an ounce, that pile of dirt just might disappear overnight. And that's how fast they'll refine it down. Okay. Now, you also mentioned, you know, answer before that the, what the roads, what the buildings are worth. Um, that's all are part we of value. So the, you're saying the dollar is backed by infrastructure, infrastructure as well. Yes. So the money that the country has borrowed, uh, what is it, 78 billion or something that we borrowed over the last couple of years, that's gone into infrastructure, that's a solid investment into the dollar. Right, because inflation is going to just keep on what it costs to build today versus what it's going to cost 10 years from now. It's going to be totally different. So there might not be a complete waste of money putting all this money into the country. If you put in the road, the road's going to go ahead and put up factories along the road and get the commerce to and from. It's going to generate taxes. It's going to generate jobs. It's going to create a chain reaction of events. You know, when I was uh, 20 years old, I worked for $100 a week. Mm. I supported my wife and my child in an apartment. But I couldn't really live on $100 a week, so I had to go out and get a second job. I drove cab when I was 20 years old. And I figured I was never going to get rich using my back, so I had to go to school and get an education. And I started college when I was 21 years old, and I stayed in college until 1987, 17 years. And then this program, I started in 1980. When I went to school full-time, I still did my law studies. And I worked third shift nights. I worked third shift nights so I could go to school full-time days. I was a college professor for three years, 1977, 78, 79. I taught welding technology, metallurgy, and uh, blueprint reading through engineering. Blueprint. Blueprint, right. Oh, blueprint. You have to have a blueprint to build a building. You have to know what the symbols mean. You have to know how to, you have to know the coefficient of expansion of metals, gases, uh, concrete, glass, and uh, how they interface each other, how you mix them together, all those kind of things. Engineering courses, metallurgy courses. I took all that stuff. I was curious. He who controls metal controls the world. Everything's built out of metal. This building's got a superstructure of metal. There are many who believe that uh, borrowing all this money from the world banks only helps to keep us enslaved to external powers. What external power? Uh, the world banks, they file Everybody files families, bankruptcy. They just run the bill. Jobs. Okay. They build a hotel complex in, in Austin, Texas for $700 million. That means they got to get like $2,500 a night per room. That's ridiculous. Nobody's going to pay that. So as soon as the guy gets done building the building, he files bankruptcy. And the building is sold for cash at auction for $50 million. Now the guy can afford to rent the rooms out at $100 a night and fills the whole place up. <laughs> and who got stuck? All the, all the contractors got stuck. But the contractors who participated in that had borrowed their resources from, from the iron company, right? And so the contractors then had to file bankruptcy because they couldn't pay back the iron, the guy who produced the iron that they built into the structure in the first place. So everybody took a little piece of this bankruptcy going all the way back to the resources when he dug the ore out of the ground. The end result is they got this beautiful building where they can afford to get $100 a night and they paid for it in cash at a bankruptcy auction. Doesn't make it wrong. No, it's stealing. It's legal stealing. It goes on all the time and it has been throughout history. Four, three years ago, the house down the street from me sold for $139,000. Last year, I tried to buy it for 29000 and while I was here in Australia in October, it was sold at auction for 4900 bucks, cash. Mm. Damn. Yeah, that's right. And you buy a house for $4,900, and you get $900 a month rent for it. Pretty good at return, mm. wouldn't you say? 100% a year for the rest of your life, nice retirement paycheck. Do that on 10 houses. And you're living on a cruise ship for the rest of your life. <laughs> okay, thank you. There's no shortage of ways to make money. There's a shortage of ambition to get the money made. 
when uh, question hello again um, maybe I heard wrongly but uh, you named natives not only of this country but other countries as well as aborigines is it the way you pronounce it because you didn't say AB means no aborigine means no origine therefore That's I right. dropped the negative condition of state when I told the Origines back in June last year that your name is not an Aborigine, you're an Origine. Stop right. calling yourself a no original person. Well, 3,400 Origine tribes immediately adapted the word Origine and said, we're no longer Aborigines. The American Indian was the same way. That's what Indian means, no original contract. That's because they wrote everything in hieroglyphics. They didn't have writing, written contracts. So they called them Indians. And they went out and they killed the Indians because they didn't have contracts and stole the land, which is alien, trans invaded their, their territory. And the Americans, they did back in 1880, they gave the Indians blankets that were, uh, had smallpox on and chickenpox, and they genocided them through germ warfare. Yeah, and this, the same thing happened. The whaler guys came in with chicken pox and measles and mumps and typhus and uh, whooping cough and took out 98% of the Hawaiians, the Moris, and the Origines here in Australia. Now, call it, and that happened in the Philippine Islands and Fiji and every place else. The whole South, South Pacific was not immune to the, germ, the germs of Europe. When it shows up here, it destroyed everybody. Thank you. Maybe I, um, I heard things incorrectly, or maybe I'm making um, assumptions. Um, a couple of things that you've, you've said over the last two days um, don't sort of sit right with me. One of, one of them is my understanding of Rothschilds and the, the tremendous wealth that he has and the, the inequity in the world, the, the, the numbers of people who, who starve and die every day. Um, 1.5 billion people starve are going hungry every day and are illiterate. And, and the, other, the other thing also was um, in terms of those people who, who were trying to sue the American government for wrongful death, I guess, what, in the 9-11. Uh, and in both those instances, in the first instance, you, you mentioned that you have um, gone to Rothschilds and, and said to him, this is... Um, the way we sh we're going to structure things in terms of the, uh, the language and you're going to be more wealthy than you have been uh, if you follow this and also put uh, the situation with those other people, um, the wrongful death. I, I would have thought that that's, a, that's inequity in both instances um, and, and the, the not allowing those people the wrongful death when it was actually the government that instigated that whole process. Correct. I have a problem with that. Okay. The, the syntax is going to disrupt a whole lot of industries. It is going to make a whole lot of changes. There is going to be a lot of unfairness as this thing works its way through the system. People who don't know will become harvested. People that do know will be doing the harvesting. And the information is made public to everyone equally. The intelligence of a person that has a 200 IQ will more than likely harvest a person that has a 100 IQ. And they can't defend themselves because they don't have the technology to defend themselves, both in the form of contract nor tools. And this is the, the strong always conquer the weak. That's the life of nature. It's how nature weeds out the weak, just like in the animal. And the humans are no different. Humans are, the word human means monster. It means to feed upon its own kind. They're cannibals. And the, the man, the, the technology in syntax is the only way you're going to get fairness. And where I am being fair to one person, 
the other 3,800 people who hired attorneys that lied to their clients, that knew that Syntex was a lie, all got swept up in the same trap. But did any of those attorneys who knew how to read and write stop and fix it and correct their, their clients? Did their clients sue to be corrected? No, not one single one of them came forward to do it the correct way. They had cop, Mar Marantino's case was a, not Marantino, but uh, Mariana's case was public record. But because they didn't understand syntax, they didn't have the knowledge because they hadn't been to a seminar to use it in the first place. So it isn't, it isn't that it's unfair. People don't know they don't know. And when you don't know what you don't know, you find out what you do, what you do not know. And then you study until you get to a position where you know what you know so you can go out there and stop and correct it. And the only thing I can do is teach seminars like this here, make videotapes, put stuff up on the internet so that the world can study. Everybody has a different learning curve. You know, 50, uh, 50 years ago we didn't have television, which brings all this information. And even the information that we got from television was censored. Today you got internet. That is totally uncensored. Look at the difference of thousands of pro millions of programs you can look at on the internet for getting information. And there's a lot of things you don't agree with on the internet, but that's your choice to turn it off. It's the other people's choice to turn it on and study it. And you know what? Your country censors what comes through on the internet because I can't even get my own emails here. I can get some of my emails, but not all my emails because they don't want, they censor information that comes into your country. I go into a hotel, I got 10 sports channels and one news channel, and I know damn well that's not reality. How many have you, how many of you have seen actual footage of the 9-11 buildings collapsing and what happened there? Anybody want to see them? I got them on my laptop. I'll turn it on, you guys can watch it. This is classified footage. Shot by, the mili by military helicopters that circled the buildings as they were falling down, if you want. Mm -hmm. It's only a couple minute presentation sure. of pictures. Is that on those DVDs outside? No. I have, I have several different versions shot by several different individuals. Because I am who I am and I have a worldwide network, I get information sent to me continuously of classified footage from people who are there at the sites. I've been to the World Trade Center site myself. Went to New York and I personally looked at it and seen you know, the buildings around there and everything that happened. I was at the Pentagon the day after it got hit. I, made, uh, I had uh, one of my students when the Flight 93 was supposedly shot down or, or fell down out of the sky. They said an F-17 came down, shot the thing, and took off, went back up into the clouds. It was a military strike. And when they hit it, they hit it and they vaporized it because they've got the tools that will vaporize things, that will take aluminum and steel and carbon fiber and reduce it to a single atom of smoke through electromagnetic pulse. Just like the World Trade Center came down as a big giant pile of dust. So they got toys out there you don't even know about. Enough said about that. <laughs> on the, on the, the situation with the World Trade Center, I'll have to agree to disagree. Um, I still can't see any validity and not letting those people, they're, they're suffering just because they didn't know. And, and I still haven't had any clarification on uh, Rothschild. Oh, okay, Rothschild. Uh, when I met Rothschild, I said, are you really worth that much money? He says, well, I'm responsible for management. He says, but I only got a couple of million dollars of my own money. I says, well, does all that money improve your life? He says, well, these are the clothes I wore today. I have a meal, I eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I sleep in a bed at night. He says, whether I've got a million dollars in the bank or I've got a trillion dollars in the bank, it doesn't change my day-to-day -day living. I can't touch the money because it's all committed through contracts. 
it's, been, it's being used. It isn't where you have a big pile of money to fill this room to the top. How fast can you spend things? People don't even realize what a billion dollars is. You know how big a semi-trailer is? If you filled it for $100 bills, that would be a billion dollars. What are you going to do, carry around 40 tons of paper? It's not realistic. You look, you look at Bill Gates, the Google Brothers, or, or, or Warren Buffett. 40 to $60 billion each one of these guys are worth. And they give it away. Doesn't make them any better. They, get to, they even eat at McDonald's. They don't care. It's just a bunch of numbers you put out here, and they still work every day, same as anybody else. They probably work harder than any of you do for your paycheck every day. Doesn't change a darn thing. I'm financially independent. Numbers you put out here, and they still work every day, same as anybody else. They probably work harder than any of you do for your paycheck every day. Doesn't change a darn thing. I'm financially independent. I go out and I work every day, 20 hours a day, whether I get paid or not. Isn't going to change my life one bit. I go to the casino and I gamble. Whether I make money or lose money isn't going to change my, my day one bit. I'm still going to eat, sleep, and teach. So it's just a lot of numbers that sit out here in cyberspace. In the entire year, I bet you you don't carry 1% of your actual cash in your pocket that you are in possession of in any given year. <coughs> and all the rest of it is a bunch of numbers that float around between banks and credit unions and, and MasterCard and paying bills and buying food and it's all done with a magnetic strip. It's just a bunch of numbers that floats around out there. And that's the same thing with Rothschild. It's just all electronic numbers that go here and there. It's bookkeeping. That he's not using it. How do you know? You don't know. That's just it. You're told one thing. Some of it is good. Some of it is evil. So much of some of it goes to scientific projects. You know, the, all your military governments worldwide have black ops, which they don't account. There's no accountability. Just like the movie Charlie uh, Wilson's War. Some of you have seen the movie with Tom Hanks. Good movie. It's a true story, too, by the way. Misappropriations. <laughs> it's called. And they use, and that's how the Afghans defeated the Russians. And never once was there any implication that we were involved with it, because it all happens behind the scenes. There's a whole world of things that happen out here that we don't know about. No more than you know about what goes on inside your own body, or how your brain works, or how all your organisms in your body keep you alive every day. You don't sit there and worry about it at night, it just is. We're only, we're only the sum of our knowledge that we can actually put our finger on, and we only can talk one word at a time. We can't absorb all the knowledge in the world simultaneously. And my, me, I'm a guy, you ask me a question, and I'll download like a computer. Same thing with that computer there. You ask it a question, it'll give you an answer. And if that computer doesn't have its capacity, you'll log it onto the Internet, and I will go out and get the answer for you. Or you can go down... Before I had computers, I had to go down to the Milwaukee Public Library and sit there 40 hours a week reading books, the old-fashioned way, do research. And then when the computers came out, it exponentialized my ability to learn because it, it gave me information instantly. And it wasn't that I was reading black and white, and if I didn't have enough light, my eye couldn't, couldn't read as fast is an illuminated screen that could scroll down. I didn't have to turn pages. It, it read at the speed I could comprehend things at. And you get faster and faster and faster, and the smarter you get, the faster you get. And then you learn about endorphins and how to make your mind not work at 10%, but 20% or 30%. And you become a, you, you become a, a computer yourself of being able to absorb information at an exponential level. And you get smarter and smarter as you get older. But then we all live in the bell curve. We start with diapers. We end in diapers. <laughs> right? So we're only, we, we, we hit our peak at about 40. And then after that, some of us are, are good up to about 60. But then after that, 
we start losing a little bit every day. Like they say, the first thing to go is the brain. <laughs> question. Uh, my question's um, more of an invitation, really. Um, I've got a few stamps here. I've oh yeah, he's got he's got the uh, navigator stamps. He's got about two, three hundred of them over here. If anybody wants navigator stamps. If wants to see what they look like, there's been a lot of talk about these these stamps. He's got all kinds of dollar stamps with the gold seals on. He collects them. So if anybody wants to buy stamps from him, he's the guy to see. Oh. And if you're, a coin, if you're a stamp collector, you know anything about this? If you've got full sheets that are virtually like this, they're worth a lot more than independent stamps. And stamps are really good value, especially gold stamps. These kind of things like this here are uh, collector's items. You can put them away, and when you're 65 years old, you can go out and sell them on eBay. That's the unique thing about today is, your, uh, is the eBay opens the entire world to you for advertising. So if you guys need stamps, this guy will sell them to you. And a lot cheaper than you'll get them on eBay and you can't buy whole sheets on eBay. Are they the sort of stamps that we need to produce documents? For? Those would be for gold certified documents if you have something like that that you want to do. In other words, claims of the life we use the Red Fox stamps on because of the uh, because those are your life documents. Uh, I use the Red Fox stamps for federal lawsuits that I file, and I only put one on the original that goes into the file. All, everybody else gets the Rockefeller stamps, which is the Federal Reserve, and those are copies. But I still pay for the, the value of sending them out to the individuals. But the one that's held in the courthouse has the gold stamp. Now, to Break the continuance of evidence of the value of this. What the governments are doing is photocopying them and then destroying the paper so that there's no paper record and they just keep it on video. So if it ever comes down to show us the evidence, oh, the tape got erased or the file got deleted so they can cover up the lie because this technology exposes all the lies they're doing. So you always make two originals, one for yourself and one for the court. Okay? With the gold stamp. Yeah. I always do backups. Yes? Um, you say the courts and everything, they're trying to cover up all that sort of side of things, but one day there's going to be a shift when everyone's going to be using this language. How far into the future do you see that? I see it 2012, April 6, 2012. That's two years from now. And I see that it's going to be a nine-month sh transition shift, and on 12-21-2012, it'll be official globally. And based on the fact that in 10 years, I've gone from a website where I was just getting a few hundred hits a day to uh, 40 to 50,000 new people every day and 400 million people on my website right now. By 2012, I should have 51% of the world's population that have knowledge and have a voting capacity to to vote in with knowledge syntax, the correct syntax, and governments will have to change. And I've made this statement at all the seminars, and I think the government is hearing me because of the amount of activity that's taking place, and the amount of military personnel, all new military personnel. I'm constantly getting hits from military organizations, judicial sites, uh, where the courthouses, universities, uh, when I was over in Auckland, I did two presentations at the University of uh, uh, the Maury University for all the deans. And then one of the deans stood up and said, but can we trust that you just told us the truth? And six of the other deans had been studying my technology for over two years and said, we've tried to defeat it. It is, what, it is a truthful statement that he's just showed us today, and we will endorse and assist the rest of you deans in understanding this at the Maury University. So they want to bring in the syntax and teach it to all Maury's that go to the Maury University. Because you know that's the only way they're going to defeat a fiction which has invaded their country for 173 years. And they, April, 12, uh, April 25, 25. Oh, 
there's two there's two dates. 4 6 2012 is the Mayans and 1221 2012 is the Egyptians. And they both claim that that's the end. And Pandora is destroyer of worlds. Destroyer is a pronoun of an adverb modifies the verb world. I destroy the verb world. This technology destroys the verb world. Yeah. So we're getting sort of towards the end of the day. And people have gone through a lot this weekend with the, with the technology and looking at what's what. And it would be good to be able to have a conversation of, about what a change would maybe look like and what sort of structures may be in place as, as far as the community of people is concerned. Some of the things that I've been talking to people about or the ideas that I have, that I have had, uh, and, and I tell you right now that none of my ideas are original. Uh, everything that I have comes from other, other sources. And, and I tell you right now that none of my ideas are original. Uh, everything that I have comes from others, other sources. Mm -hmm. um, and it occurs to me that the only way we're going to get anywhere with, is with a sense of community, is with people joining together, combining the knowledge and formulating our paperwork and our structures together. And part of that is by forming a society um, using quantum documents with a quantum constitution um, to where then we can, we can stand as a separate entity to the fiction that is there and that we can then uh, approach the governments, that sort of thing, and if need be, we can go offshore if, if they decide that they're not going to listen. But we do need uh, knowledge and we need people with their documentation. In other words, correct? The, the, the argument you're making here is how do we get this program forward? The people, a group of people cannot file a class action against your government to make a change. You can, however, go to the election board with an idea of what change is. Then go door to door and educate the general public and get signatures on a referendum to be placed on the ballot, which is you have your spring elections and your fall elections. And twice a year, most communities have elections to pass specific laws and elect new people to govern, you know, like uh, uh, aldermen, uh, congressmen, senators, judges, and there's specific ideas whether to make le a smoking legal or not, to make marijuana legal or not, to control different controlled substances, uh, to pass a law saying how high a building can be in a given community, if we're going to expand the airport, if we're going to uh, put an expressway through and go ahead and buy up all these houses. There's going to be all kinds of different rules and regulations. Well, it's no different if you want to bring in a new law or bring, change a constitution to a government. You have to go door to door. It's required by that you have a specific number of signatures or autographs on a referendum supplied to the election board to have that placed on the ballot. On the ballot then, when all the people go to the polls, you can take out and pay for advertising on TV, just like when the president runs or anybody runs for public office, they have an advertising budget, and they educate the people. So when you go to the polls, you know what you're talking about. And it's the same thing with getting this program through. If the people are willing to donate money or you have fund drives to raise money so that you can advertise Syntex on open television or TV or on, on uh, radio or the internet to create awareness of the syntax and the, and the condition of language and then have it voted in. And once it's voted in, then the government will have to change because it's the will of the people or 51% are going to make changes. You just spontaneously can't change things. So you've got in Hawaii, you've got a society of people. And I think when I was speaking to you some time ago, it was around 4,000. I believe it's up to 6,000 people now. About 6,000 people now, yeah. And so, that's only taken one year to get there. So with what they're doing, they're, they effectively have their own society. They've established themselves as being um, lawful and setting standards that are higher than standards that the government have as far as uh, registration of motor vehicles uh, with safety. And In other words, public safety is number one, and then everything else can be built below that, yes. So now, because they were sovereign to Hawaii, they've got the superior claim to the land through the DNA links to the land. That's the reason why they can do that. It's um, the same reason here why you guys can do it, and the same reason the Maoris can do it in, in New Zealand. 
Now, in that situation, is that the, only the original people that can do it, or is it anybody that was born here? You were born here. Everybody who was born here is now party to that organized position. Now, through that structure of that society, and through a, um, an agreement on values and how you're going to conduct yourself, that would be one way to create a presence in the community and then to, then to spread um, and to have an organised structure where people can see that it's not something similar to anarchy. Because right, you don't want anarchy. You have a organised contract, organised structure of fairness to everyone. So what we would be doing is more than just complaining about what is wrong, we would be acknowledging what is wrong but bringing the solution to what is wrong so that people can see what the alternative is. Correct. Did I complain about anything today at the seminar? I gave you solutions. Solutions through syntax. We know what's wrong. We've lived in this wrong world our whole life. The only thing this program does is shows you an alternative way of thinking to improve yourself. That's it. We didn't say the government was bad. You guys still get your three hots in a cot. You like driving on your roads. Your cars run really nice. You got safety equipment everywhere. Uh, nobody's sick. There's no anarchy in the in the streets. You're not. You don't have to worry about diseases. You got hospitals and pharmacies to, to give you medicine. I mean, all the different things that give you all the luxuries of life: TVs, computers, electricity, w running water, sewer, take a hot shower, so carpeting. I mean, it's really nice. You're not living on dirt floors in a hut someplace. So if we're to develop our own society and we work in quantum, it then gives us the opportunity to provide access to some of the technologies that have been suppressed by challenging the documents that are in place to keep those technologies suppressed. If there's a negative technology, yes. If you want to improve, again, get your, get your people together and get laws passed. Yeah. by election. Even the World Court said, what you're doing, Dave, is right, but until you get people to vote on it, what we did in Hawaii. The Hawaiians were only recognized because the Hawaiians got together and they voted for the Constitution. They voted to have a charter that they could say, we are under Robert's Rules of Order as a corporation. We make decisions as a corporate entity of 20 people and then when we make it, finally make a decision, we take it back to the people to vote on. They're doing everything they're supposed to, but they use quantum language instead of adverb, verb. Just like the and so, all at my seminars, just right, well, while David's writing away, you've got the opportunity to continue your learning. Um, we have webcasts where we teach, teach syntax. Oops. And we always have access to David as well. Uh, the best thing that I can recommend for you to get um, familiar with the, with the quantum and with the syntax is if you get the DVDs that are available with David and just watch them. Don't try to sort of study and remember like you did at school. Just listen. Because as you do, you gradually pick up more and more pieces. It just becomes part of what you're, what you're aware of and time is the best thing that you can utilise. Oh, you got Ben right. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I thought mine was Ben. <laughs> well, the point is I can write frontwards and backwards with both hands, both ways, or both directions simultaneously. So I'd like to thank David very much for making himself available to us. And I, I thank you all, and I expect you all to email, email me your questions and your, uh, any other problems you have, if there's challenges along the way. Uh, and remember, anybody gets in your face about anything, call me, I got a solution for it.
We thank you for watching this video and ask you to spread the news. Put this video on your social network or link to it so that you can be part of the anonymous movement. Together we are strong. Together we are anonymous.